Chapter Fifteen of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula, by Bram Stoker, Chapter Fifteen, read by Dennis Sayers, Robert Smith, Doctor Seward's Diary, continued. For a while, sheer anger mastered me. It was as if he had, during her life, struck Lucy on the face. I smote the table hard, and rose up as I said to him, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said. Madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Oh, my friend, why think you did I go so far round? Why take so long to tell so simple a thing? Was it because I hate you, and have hated you all my life? Was it because I wished to give you pain? Was it that I wanted now so late revenge for that time? when you saved my life, and from a fearful death. Ah, no. Forgive me, said I. He went on, my friend. It was because I wished to be gentle in the breaking to you, for I know you have loved that so sweet lady. But even yet I do not expect you to believe. It is so hard to accept at once any abstract truth, that we may doubt such to be possible when we have always believed the no of it. It is more hard still to accept so sad a concrete truth, and of such a one as Miss Lucy. Tonight I go to prove it. Dare you come with me? This staggered me. A man does not like to prove such a truth. Byron accepted from the category jealousy, and proved the very truth he most abhorred. He saw my hesitation and spoke. The logic is simple. No madman's logic this time, jumping from tussock to tussock in a misty bog. If it not be true, then proof will be relief. At worst, it will not harm. If it be true, ah, there is the dread. Yet every dread should help my cause, for in it is some need of belief. Come, I tell you what I propose. First, that we go off now and see that child in the hospital. Dr. Vincent, of the North Hospital, where the papers say the child is, is a friend of mine, and I think of yours since you were in class at Amsterdam. He will let two scientists see his case, if he will not let two friends. We shall tell him nothing, but only that we wish to learn. And then... And... Then he took a key from his pocket and held it up. And then we spend the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies. This is the key that locked the tomb. I had it from the coffin man to give to Arthur. My heart sank within me, for I felt that there was some fearful ordeal before us. I could do nothing, however, so... I plucked up what heart I could, and said that we had better hasten, as the afternoon was passing. We found the child awake. It had had a sleep, and taken some food, and altogether was going on well. Dr. Vincent took the bandage from its throat, and showed us the punctures. There was no mistaking the similarity to those which had been on Lucy's throat, they were smaller, and the edges looked fresher, 
that was all. We asked Vincent to what he attributed them, and he replied that it must have been a bite of some animal, perhaps a rat, but for his own part he was inclined to think it was one of the bats which are so numerous on the northern heights of London. Out of so many harmless ones, he said, there may be some wild specimen from the south of a more malignant species. Some sailor may have brought one home, and it managed to escape, or even from the zoological gardens a young one may have got loose, or one be bred there from a vampire. These things do occur, you know. Only ten days ago a wolf got out, and was, I believe, traced up in this direction. For a week after, the children were playing nothing but Red Riding Hood on the heath, and in every alley in the place, until this blofer lady, Scare, came along. Since then it has been quite a gala time with them. Even this poor little mite, when he woke up today, asked the nurse if he might go away. When she asked him why he wanted to go, he said he wanted to play with the blofer lady. I hope, said Van Helsing, that when you are sending the child home, you will caution its parents to keep strict watch over it. These fancies to stray are most dangerous, and if the child were to remain out another night, it would probably be fatal. But in any case, I suppose you will not let it away for some days. Certainly not. Not for a week at least. Longer, if the wound is not healed. Our visit to the hospital took more time than we had reckoned on, and the sun had dipped before we came out. When Van Helsing saw how dark it was, he said, There is not hurry. It is more late than I thought. Come, let us seek somewhere that we may eat, and then we shall go on our way. We dined at Jack Straw's Castle along with a little crowd of bicyclists and others who were genially noisy. About ten o'clock we started from the inn. It was then very dark, and the scattered lamps made the darkness greater when we were once outside their individual radius. The professor had evidently noted the road we were to go, for he went on unhesitatingly, but, as for me, I was in quite a mix-up as to locality. As we went further, we met fewer and fewer people, till at last we were somewhat surprised when we met even the patrol of horse police going their usual suburban round. At last we reached the wall of the churchyard, which we climbed over, with some little difficulty, for it was very dark, and the whole place seemed so strange to us. We found the Westenra tomb. The professor took the key, opened the creaky door, and standing back politely, but quite unconsciously, motioned me to precede him. There was a delicious irony in the offer, in the courtliness of giving preference on such a ghastly occasion. My companion followed me quickly and cautiously drew the door to, after carefully ascertaining that the lock was a falling and not a spring one. In the latter case, we should have been in a bad plight. Then he fumbled in his bag, and taking out a matchbox and a piece of candle, proceeded to make a light. The tomb in the daytime and when wreathed with fresh flowers, had looked grim and gruesome enough. But now, some days afterwards, when the flowers hung lank and dead, their whites turning to rust and their greens to browns, when the spider and the beetle had resumed their 
accustomed dominance, when the time-discolored stone and dust-encrusted mortar and rusty dank iron and tarnished brass and clouded silver plating gave back the feeble glimmer of a candle, the effect was more miserable and sordid than could have been imagined. It conveyed irresistibly the idea that life animal life, was not the only thing which could pass away. Van Helsing went about his work systematically, holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates, and so holding it that the sperm dropped in white patches which congealed as they touched the metal. He made assurance of Lucy's coffin. Another search in his bag and he took out a turn-screw. "'What are you going to do?' I asked. "'To open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced.' Straightway he began taking out the screws, and finally lifted off the lid, showing the casing of lead beneath. The sight was almost too much for me. It seemed to be as much an affront to the dead as it would have been to have stripped off her clothing in her sleep whilst living i actually took hold of his hand to stop him he only said you shall see and again fumbling in his bag took out a tiny fret saw striking the turnscrew through the lead with a swift downward stab which made me wince he made a small hole which was however big enough to admit the point of the saw i had expected a rush of gas from the weak old corpse we doctors who have had to study our dangers have to become accustomed to such things and i drew back towards the door but the professor never stopped for a moment. He sawed down a couple of feet along one side of the lead coffin, and then across, and down the other side. Taking the edge of the loose flange, he bent it back towards the foot of the coffin, and holding up the candle into the aperture, motioned to me to look. I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. It was certainly a surprise to me, and gave me a considerable shock, but Van Helsing was unmoved. He was now more sure than ever of his ground, and so emboldened to proceed in his task. "'Are you satisfied now, friend John?' he asked. I felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me, as I answered him, I am satisfied that Lucy's body is not in that coffin, but that only proves one thing. And what is that, friend John? That it is not there. That is good logic, he said, so far as it goes, but how do you, how can you, account for it not being there? Perhaps a body snatcher i suggested some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it i felt that i was speaking foully and yet it was the only real cause which i could suggest the professor sighed ah well he said we must have more proof come with me he put on the coffin lid again gathered up all his things and placed them in the bag blew out the light and placed the candle also in the bag we opened the door and went out behind us he closed the door and locked it he handed me the key saying will you keep it you had better be assured i laughed it was not a cheerful laugh I am bound to say, as I motioned him to keep it. <laughs> the key is nothing, I said. 
there are many duplicates, and anyhow, it is not difficult to pick a lock of this kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard, whilst he would watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and I saw his dark figure move until the intervening headstones and trees hid it from my sight. It was a lonely vigil. Just after I had taken my place, I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one, and two. I was chilled and unnerved and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand, and with myself for coming. I was too cold and too sleepy to be keenly observant, and not sleepy enough to betray my trust, so altogether I had a dreary, miserable time. Suddenly, as I turned around, I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between the two dark yew trees at the side of the churchyard, farthest from the tomb. At the same time, a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground, and hurriedly went towards it. Then I too moved, but I had to go round headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over graves. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off an early cock crew. A little ways off, beyond a line of scattered juniper trees, which marked the pathway to the church, a white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. The tomb itself was hidden by trees, and I could not see where the figure had disappeared. I heard the rustle of actual movement, where I had first seen the white figure, and, coming over, found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me, he held it out to me, and said, Are you satisfied now? No, I said, in a way that I felt was aggressive. Do you not see the child? Yes, it is a child, but who brought it here? And is it wounded? We shall see, said the professor, and with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleepy child. When we had got some little distance away, we went into a clump of trees, and struck a match, and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or a scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time, said the professor thankfully. We had now to decide what we were to do with the child, and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we should have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least we should have had to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. So finally we decided that we would take it to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, would leave it where he could not fail to find it. We would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway, we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed his lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment, and then we went away silently. By good chance we got a cab near the Spaniards, and drove to town. I cannot sleep, so I make this entry. Oh, but I must try to get a few hours' sleep, as Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I go with him, 
on another expedition. 27 September It was two o'clock before we found a suitable opportunity for our attempt. The funeral held at noon was all completed, and the last stragglers of the mourners had taken themselves lazily away, when, looking carefully from behind a clump of alder trees, we saw the sexton lock the gate after him. We knew that we were safe till morning, it did we desire it, but the professor told me that we should not want more than an hour at most. Again, I felt that horrid sense of the reality of things, in which any effort of imagination seemed out of place, and I realized distinctly the perils of the law which we were incurring in our unhallowed work. Besides, I felt it was also useless, outrageous as it was to open a leaden coffin to see if a woman dead nearly a week were really dead, it now seemed the height of folly to open the tomb again, when we knew, from the evidence of our own eyesight, that the coffin was empty. I shrugged my shoulders, however, and rested silent, for Van Helsing had a way of going on his own road, no matter who remonstrated. He took the key, opened the vault, and again, courteously, motioned me to proceed. The place was not so gruesome as last night, but, oh, how unutterably mean-looking when the sunshine streamed in. Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin, and I followed. He bent over and again forced back the leaden flange, and a shock of surprise and dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, seemingly, just as we had seen her, the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The lips were red, nay, redder, then before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. Is this a juggle? I said to him. Are you convinced? Now, said the professor in response, and as he spoke he put over his hand, and in a way that made me shudder, pulled back the dead lips, and showed the white teeth. See, he went on, they are even sharper than before. With this, and this, and he touched one of the canine teeth, and that below it, the little children can be bitten. Are you of belief now, friend John, once more, argumentative hostility woke within me. I could not accept such an overwhelming idea as he suggested. So, with an attempt to argue, of which I was even at the moment ashamed, I said, She may have been placed here since last night. Indeed, that is so. And by whom? I do not know. Someone has done it. And yet she has been dead one week. Most peoples in that time would not look so. I had no answer for this. So was silent. Van Helsing did not seem to notice my silence. At any rate, he showed neither chagrin nor triumph. He was looking intently at the face of the dead woman, raising the eyelids and looking at the eyes, 
and once more opening the lips and examining the teeth. Then he turned to me and said, Here there is one thing which is different from all recorded. Here is some dual life that is not as the common. She was bitten by the vampire when she was in a trance, sleepwalking. Oh, you start. You do not know that, friend John, but you shall know it later. And in trance could he best come to take more blood. In trance she dies, and in trance she is undead too. So it is that she differ from all other. Usually when the undead sleep at home, as he spoke he made a comprehensive sweep of his arm to designate what to a vampire was home, their face show what they are. But this is so sweet that was when she was not undead she go back to the nothings of the common dead. There is no malign there, see, and so it make hard that I must kill her in her sleep. This turned my blood cold, and it began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories. But if she were really dead, what was there of terror in the idea of killing her? He looked at me, and evidently saw the change in my face, for he almost said joyously, Ah, you believe now. I answered, Do not press me too hard all at once. I am willing to accept. How will you do this bloody work? I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. It made me shudder to think of so mutilating the body of the woman whom I had loved, and yet the feeling was not so strong as I had expected. I was, in fact, beginning to shudder at the presence of this being, this undead, as Van Helsing called it, and to loathe it. Is it possible that love is all subjective, or all objective? I waited a considerable time for Van Helsing to begin, but he stood as if wrapped in thought. Presently he closed the catch of his bag with a snap, and said, I have been thinking, and have made up my mind as to what is best. If I did simply follow my inclining, I would do now, at this moment, what is to be done. But there are other things to follow, and things that are thousand times more difficult in that them we do not know. This is simple. She have yet no life taken, though that is of time, and to act now would be to take danger from her for ever. But then we may have to want Arthur, and how shall we tell him of this? If you who saw the wounds on Lucy's throat, and saw the wounds so similar on the child's at the hospitals, if you who saw the coffin empty last night, and full to-day, with a woman who have not changed only to be more rose and more beautiful in a whole week after she die. If you know of this, and know of the white figure last night that brought the child to the churchyard, 
and yet of your own senses you did not believe. How, then, can I expect Arthur, who know none of these things, to believe? He doubted me when I took him from her kiss when she was dying. I know he has forgiven me because, in some mistaken idea, I have done things that prevent him say good-bye as he ought, and he may think that in some more mistaken idea this woman was buried alive and that in most mistake of all we have killed her he will then argue back that it is we mistaken ones that have killed her by our ideas and so he will be much unhappy always yet he never can be sure and that is the worst of all and he will sometimes think that she he loved was buried alive and that will paint his dreams with horrors of what she must have suffered and again he will think that we may be right and that his beloved was after all an undead no, I told him once, and since then I learned much. Now, since I know it is all true, a hundred thousand times more do I know that he must pass through the bitter waters to reach this sweet. He, poor fellow, must have one hour that will make the very face of heaven grow, black to him then we can act for good all round and send him peace my mind is made up let us go you return home for to-night to your asylum and see that all be well as for me i shall spend the night here in this churchyard in my own way Tomorrow night you will come to me to the Barclay Hotel at ten of the clock. I shall send for Arthur to come too, and also that so fine young man of America that gave his blood. Later we shall all have work to do. I come with you so far as Piccadilly, and there dine, for I must be back here before the sun set. So we locked the tomb, and came away, and got over the wall of the churchyard, which was not much of a task, and drove back to Piccadilly. Note left by Van Helsing in his portmanteau. Berkeley Hotel, directed to John Seward, M.D., not delivered. 27 September Friend John, I write this in case anything should happen. I go alone to watch in that churchyard. It pleases me that the undead Miss Lucy shall not leave to-night, that so on the morrow night she may be more eager. Therefore I shall fix some things she like not, garlic and a crucifix, and so seal up the door of the tomb. She is young as undead, and will heed. Moreover, these are only to prevent her coming out. They may not prevail on her wanting to get in, for then the undead is desperate, and must find the line of least resistance, whatsoever it may be. I shall be at hand all the night from sunset till after sunrise, and if there be aught that may be learned, I shall learn it. For Miss Lucy, or from her, I have no fear. But that other to whom is there that she is undead, he have not the power to seek her tomb and find shelter. He is cunning, as I know from Mr. Jonathan, and from the way that all along he hath fooled us when he played with us for Miss Lucy's life, and we lost. And in many ways the undead are strong. He have always the strength in his hand of twenty men. Even we four who gave our strength to Miss Lucy, it also is all to him. Besides, he can summon his wolf, and I know not what. So, if it be that he came thither on this night, 
he shall find me, but none other shall until it be too late. But it may be that he will not attempt the place. There is no reason why he should. His hunting ground is more full of game than the churchyard where the undead woman sleeps and the one old man watch. Therefore I write this in case. Take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, and read them, and then find this great undead, and cut off his head, and burn his heart, or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. If it be so, farewell. Van Helsing Dr. Seward's Diary, 28th September It is wonderful what a good night's sleep will do for one. Yesterday I was almost willing to accept Van Helsing's monstrous ideas, but now they seem to start out lurid before me as outrages on common sense. I have no doubt that he believes it all. I wonder if his mind can have become in any way unhinged. Surely there must be some rational explanation of all these mysterious things. Is it possible that the professor can have done it himself? He is so abnormally clever that if he went off his head, he would carry out his intent with regard to some fixed idea in a wonderful way. I am loath to think it and indeed it would be almost as great a marvel as the other to find that Van Helsing was mad. But anyhow, I shall watch him carefully. I may get some light on the mystery. 29 September Last night, at a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us all what he wanted us to do, but especially addressing himself to Arthur, as if all our wills were centered in his. He began by saying that he hoped we would all come with him, too. For, he said, there is a grave duty to be done here. You were doubtless surprised at my letter. This query was directly addressed to Lord Galdami. I was. It rather upset me for a bit. There has been so much trouble around my house of late that I could do without any more. I have been curious, too, as to what you mean. Quincy and I talked it over, but the more we talked, the more puzzled we got. Till now I can say, for myself, that I'm about up a tree as to any meaning about anything. Me too, said Quincy Morris, laconically. Oh, said the professor, then you are nearer the beginning, both of you, than friend john here who has to go a long way back before he can even get so far as to begin it was evident that he recognized my return to my old doubting frame of mind without my saying a word then turning to the other two he said with intense gravity I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask, and when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then, how much. Therefore, may I ask you promise me in the dark, so that afterwards, though you may be angry with me for a time, I must not disguise from myself the possibility that such may be. You shall not blame yourselves for anything. That's frank, anyhow, 
broke in Quincy. I'll answer for the professor. I don't quite see his drift, but I swear he's honest, and that's good enough for me. I thank you, sir, said Van Helsing proudly. I have done myself the honor of counting you one trusting friend, and such endorsement is dear to me. He held out a hand, which Quincy took. Then Arthur spoke out. Dr. Van Helsing, I don't quite like to buy a pig and a poke, as they say in Scotland, and if it be anything in which my honor as a gentleman or my faith as a Christian is concerned, I cannot make such a promise. If you can assure me that what you intend does not violate either of these two, then I give my consent at once, though for the life of me I cannot understand what you are driving at. I accept your limitation, said Van Helsing, and all I ask of you is that if you feel it necessary to condemn any act of mine, you will first consider it well and be satisfied that it does not violate your reservations. Agreed, said Arthur. That is only fair. And now that the poor parley are over, may I ask what it is we are to do I want you to come with me, and to come in secret to the churchyard at Kingstead. Arthur's face fell, as he said, in an amazed sort of way. Where poor Lucy is buried? The professor bowed. Arthur went on, and when there... To enter the tomb. Arthur stood up. Professor, are you in earnest, or is it some monstrous joke? Pardon me. I see that you are in earnest. He sat down again, but I could see that he sat firmly and proudly as one who is on his dignity. There was silence until he asked again, And when in the tomb? To open the coffin. This is too much, he said angrily, rising again. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this, this desecration of the grave, of one who he fairly choked with indignation the professor looked pityingly at him if i could spare you one pang my poor friend he said god knows i would but this night our feet must tread in thorny paths or later and for ever the feet you loved must walk in paths of flame arthur looked up with set white face and said take care sir take care would it not be well to hear what i have to say said van helsing and then you will at least know the limit of my purpose. Shall I go on? That's fair enough, broke in Morris. After a pause, Van Helsing went on, evidently with an effort. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Yes then there can be no wrong to her. But 
if she not be dead arthur jumped to his feet good god he cried what do you mean has there been any mistake has she been buried alive he groaned in anguish that not even hope could soften i did not say she was alive my child i did not think of it i go no further than to say that she might be undead undead not alive what do you mean is this all a nightmare or what is it there are mysteries which men can only guess at which age by age they may solve only in part believe me we are now on the verge of one but i have not done may i cut off the head of dead miss lucy heavens and earth no cried arthur in a storm of passion not for the wide world will i consent to any mutilation of her dead body dr van helsing you try me too far what have i done to you that you should torture me so what did that poor sweet girl do that you should want to cast such dishonor on her grave are you mad that you speak of such things or am i mad to listen to them don't dare think more of such a desecration i shall not give my consent to anything you do i have a duty to do in protecting her grave from outrage and by god i shall do it van helsing rose up from where he had all the time been seated and said gravely and sternly my lord godalming i too have a duty to do a duty to others a duty to you a duty to the dead and by god i shall do it all i ask you now is that you come with me that you look and listen and if when later i make the same request you do not be more eager for its fulfillment even than i am then i shall do my duty whatever it may seem to me and then to follow your lordship's wishes i shall hold myself at your disposal to render an account to you when and where you will his voice broke a little and he went on with a voice full of pity but i beseech you do not go forth in anger with me in a long life of acts which were often not pleasant to do and which sometimes did wring my heart i have never had so heavy a task as now believe me that if the time comes for you to change your mind towards me one look from you will wipe away all this so sad hour for i would do what a man can to save you from sorrow just think for why should i give myself so much labor and so much of sorrow i have come here from my own land to do what i can of good at the first to please my friend john and then to help a sweet young lady whom too i come to love for her I am ashamed to say so much, but I say it in kindness. 
I gave what you gave, the blood of my veins. I gave it, who was not like you her lover, but only her physician and her friend. I gave her my nights and days, before death, after death, and if my death can do her good even now, when she is the dead undead, she shall have it freely. He said this with a very grave, sweet pride, and Arthur was much affected by it. He took the old man's hand and said in a broken voice, Oh, it is hard to think of it, and I cannot understand. But at least I shall go with you and wait. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter sixteen. Read by Dennis Sayers. Dr. Seward's Diary. Continued. It was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark, with occasional gleams of moonlight between the dents of the heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. We all kept somehow close together, with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, for I feared the proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him, but he bore himself well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceeding was in some way a counteractant to his grief. The professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us, for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering first himself. The rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern, and pointed to a coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitatingly. Van Helsing said to me, "'You were here with me yesterday. Was the body of Miss Lucy in that coffin?' "'It was.' The professor turned to the rest, saying, "'You hear?' and yet there is no one who does not believe with me. He took his screwdriver, and again took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on, very pale but silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. He evidently did not know that there was a leaden coffin, or at any rate had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, the blood rushed to his face for an instant, but as quickly fell away again, so that he remained of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For several minutes no one spoke a word. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, I answered for you. Your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask such a thing ordinarily. I wouldn't so dishonor you as to imply a doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond any honor or dishonor. Is this your doing? I swear to you by all that I hold sacred that I have not removed or touched her. What happened was this. 
Two nights ago my friend Seward and I came here, with good purpose, believe me. I opened that coffin, which was then sealed up, and we found it as it is now, empty. We then waited, and saw something white come through the trees. The next day we came here in daytime, and she lay there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night we were just in time. One more so small child was missing, and we find it, thank God, unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all night till the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was most probable that it was because I had laid over the clamps of those doors garlic, which the undead cannot bear, and other things which they shun. Last night there was no exodus, so to-night, before the sundown, I took away my garlic and other things, and so it is we find this coffin empty. But bear with me so far there is much that is strange wait you with me outside unseen and unheard and things much stranger are yet to be so here he shut the dark slide of his lantern now to the outside he opened the door and we filed out he coming last and locking the door behind him. Oh, but it seemed fresh and pure in the night air, after the terror of that vault. How sweet it was to see the clouds race by, and the passing gleams of the moonlight between the scudding clouds crossing and passing, like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air, that had no taint of death in decay. How humanizing to see the red lighting of the sky beyond the hill, and to hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent, and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose and the inner meaning of the mystery, I was myself tolerably patient, and half inclined again to throw aside doubt and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic in the way of a man who accepts all things, and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery, with hazard of all he has at stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good-sized plug of tobacco, and began to chew. As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a definite way. First he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin, wafer-like biscuit, which was carefully rolled up in a white napkin. Next he took out a double handful of some whitish stuff, like dough or putty. He crumbled the wafer up fine, and worked it into the mass between his hands. This he then took, and, rolling it into thin strips, began to lay them into the crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled at this, and, being close, asked him what it was that he was doing. Arthur and Quincy drew near also, as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb so that the undead may not enter. And is that stuff you have there going to do it? It is. What is that which you are using? This time the question was by Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered, The host. I brought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most skeptical of us, 
and we felt individually that in the presence of such earnest purpose as the professor's, a purpose which could thus use the, to him, most sacred things, it was impossible to distrust. In respectful silence we took the places assigned to us close round the tomb, but hidden from the sight of any one approaching. I pitied the others, especially Arthur. I had myself been apprenticed by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had up to an hour ago repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did tombs look so ghastly white. Never did cypress or yew or juniper so seem the embodiment of funeral gloom. Never did tree or grass wave or rustle so ominously. Never did bough creak so mysteriously, and never did the far-away howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. There was a long spell of silence, big, aching, void, and then from the professor a keen he pointed, and far down the avenue of yews we saw a white figure advance, a dim white figure, which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell upon the masses of driving clouds, and showed, in startling prominence, a dark-haired woman, dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause, and a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire and dreams. We were starting forward, but the professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind a yew-tree, kept us back. And then, as we looked, the white figure moved forwards again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur, as we recognized the features of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra, but Yet how changed! The sweetness was turned to adamantine, heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Van Helsing stepped out, and obedient to his gesture, we all advanced too. The four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her own death robe. We shuddered with horror. I could see by the tremulous light that even Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed. Arthur was next to me, and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I call the thing that was before us Lucy, because it bore her shape, saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl, such as a cat gives when taken unawares. Then her eyes ranged over us, Lucy's eyes in form and color, but Lucy's eyes unclean and full of hell-fire, instead of the pure, gentle orbs we knew. At the moment the remnant of my love passed into hate and loathing. Had she then to be killed, I could have done it with savage delight. As she looked, her eyes blazed with unholy light, and the face became wreathed 
with a voluptuous smile. Oh, God, how it made me shudder to see it. With a careless motion, she flung to the ground, callous as a devil, the child that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry, and lay there moaning. There was a cold bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur. When she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back and hid his face in his hands. Still she advanced, however, and with a languorous, voluptuous grace, said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others, and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come, and we can rest together. Come, my husband, come. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, something of the tinkling of glass when struck, which rang through the brains even of us who heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them, when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his little golden crucifix. She recoiled from it, and, with a sudden, distorted face, full of rage, dashed past him, as if to enter the tomb. When, within a foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned, and her face was shown in the clear burst of moonlight, and by the lamp, which had now no quiver from Van Helsing's nerves. Never did I see such baffled malice on a face, and never, I trust, shall such ever be seen again by mortal eyes. The beautiful color became livid, the eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hell-fire, the brows were wrinkled as though the folds of flesh were the coils of Medusa's snakes, and the lovely, blood-stained mouth grew to an open square, as in the passion masts of the Greeks and Japanese. If ever a face meant death, if looks could kill, we saw it at that moment. And so for full half a minute, which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, my friend. Am I to proceed in my work? Do as you will, friend. Do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more and he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him, and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down. Coming close to the tomb, he began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblem which he had placed there. We all looked with horrified amazement, as we saw when he stood back, the woman, with a corporeal body as real as that moment as our own, passed through the interstice, where scarce a knife-blade could have gone. We all felt a glad sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, "'Come now, my friends,' We can do no more till to-morrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall all come before long after that. 
the friends of the dead shall be gone by two, and when the sexton locks the gate, we shall remain. Then there is more to do, but not like this of to-night. As for this little one, he is not much harmed, and by to-morrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as on the other night, and then to home. Coming close to Arthur, he said, My friend Arthur, you have had a sore trial, but after, when you look back, you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child. By this time to-morrow you will, please God, have passed them, and have drunk of the sweet waters. We do not mourn over much. Till then, I shall not ask you to forgive me. Arthur and Quincy came home with me, and we tried to cheer each other on the way. We had left behind the child in safety, and were tired. So we all slept with more or less reality of sleep. 29 September Night a little before twelve o'clock, we three, Arthur, Quincy, Morris, and myself, called for the professor. It was odd to notice that, by common consent, we had all put on black clothes. Of course, Arthur wore black, for he was in deep mourning, but the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the graveyard by half-past one, and strolled about keeping out of official observation, so that when the grave-diggers had completed their task, and the sexton, under the belief that every one had gone, had locked the gate, we had the place all to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little black bag, had with him a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was manifestly of fair weight. When we were alone, and had heard the last of the footsteps die out up the road, we silently, and as if by ordered intention, followed the professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern, which he lit, and also two wax candles, which, when lighted, he stuck by melting their own ends on the other coffins, so that they might give light sufficient to work by. When he again lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur, trembling like an aspen, and saw that the corpse lay there in all its death beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could even see Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But... Wait a while, and you shall see her as she was and is. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained voluptuous mouth, which made one shudder to see, the whole carnal and unspirited appearance, something like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Van Helsing, with his usual methodicalness, began taking the various contents from his bag and placing them ready for use. First he took out a soldering iron and some plumbing solder, and then small oil lamp, which gave out, when lit in a corner of the tomb, gas, which burned at a fierce heat with a blue flame. Then his operating knives, which he placed to hand, and last, a round wooden stake, 
some two and a half or three inches thick, and about three feet long. One end of it was hardened by charring in the fire, and was sharpened to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking the lumps. To me, a doctor's preparations for work of any kind are stimulating and bracing, but the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quincy was to cause them a sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage, and remained silent and quiet. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the lore and experience of the ancients, and of all those who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, there comes, with the change, the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims, and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the praying of the undead becomes themselves undead, and prey on their kind. And so the circle goes on ever widening, like as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. Friend, Arthur, if you had met that kiss which you know of before poor Lucy die, or again last night when you open your arms to her, you would, in time, when you had died, become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe, and would for all time make more of those undeads that so have filled us with horror. The career of this so unhappy dear lady is but just begun. Those children whose blood she sucked are not as yet so much the worse, but if she lives on undead, more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them they come to her, and so she draw their blood with that so wicked mouth. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of the throats disappear, and they go back to their play, unknowing ever of what has been. But of the most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free. Instead of working wickedness by night, and growing more debased in the assimilating of it by day, she shall take her place with the other angels, so that, my friend, it will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing, but there is none amongst us who has a better right. Will it be no joy to think of hereafter, in the silence of the night when sleep is not, it was my hand that sent her to the stars, it was the hand of him that loved her best, the hand that of all she would herself have chosen, had it been to her to choose. Tell me, if there be such a one amongst us. We all looked at Arthur. He saw, too, what we all did, the infinite kindness which suggested that his should be the hand which would restore Lucy to us as a holy and not an unholy memory. He stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled, and his face was as pale as snow. My true friend, from the bottom of my broken heart, I thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. 
Van Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage, and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal, be not deceived in that, but it will be only a short time, and you will then rejoice more than your pain was great. From this grim tomb you will emerge as though you tread on air, but you must not falter when once you have begun. Only think that we, your true friends, are round you, and that we pray for you all the time. Go on, Arthur said hoarsely. Tell me what I am to do. Take the stake in your left hand, ready to place it to the point over the heart, and the hammer in your right. Then, when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here the book, and the others shall follow. Strike, in God's name, that so all may be well with the dead that we love, and that the undead pass away. Arthur took the stake and the hammer, and when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled, nor even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missal and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked I could see its dent and the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the opened red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp white teeth clamped together till the lips were cut, and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. He looked like a figure of Thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up around it. His face was set, and high duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage, so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and the teeth seemed to champ, and the face to quiver. Finally it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead, and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him, and had he not been forced to his task by more than human considerations, he could never have gone through with it. For a few minutes we were so taken up with him that we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one to the other of us. We gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose, for he had been seated on the ground, and came and looked too, and then a glad, strange light broke over his face, and dispelled altogether the gloom of horror that lay upon it. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded and grown to hate, that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to the one best entitled to it. But Lucy, as we had seen her in life, with her face of unequalled sweetness and purity, true that there were there, as we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste. But these were all dear to us, for they marked her truth to what we knew. 
one and all we felt that the holy calm that lay like sunshine over the wasted face and form was only an earthly token and symbol of the calm that was to reign for ever. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said to him, And now, Arthur, my friend, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he took the old man's hand in his, and raising it to his lips, pressed it, and said, Forgiven, God bless you that you have given my dear one her soul again, and me peace. He put his hands on the professor's shoulder, and laying his head on his breast, cried for a while, silently, whilst we stood unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, And now, my child, you may kiss her, kiss her dead lips, if you will, as she would have you to, if for her to choose. For she is not a grinning devil now, not any more a foul thing for all eternity. No longer she is the devil's undead. She is God's true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb. The professor and I sawed the top off the stake, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We soldered up the leaden coffin, screwed on the coffin lid, and gathering up our belongings, came away. When the professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside the air was sweet, the sun shone, and the birds sang, and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. There was gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on one account, and we were glad, though it was with a tempered joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves. But there remains a greater task, to find out the author of all this our sorrow, and to stamp him out. I have clues which we can follow, but it is a long task, and a difficult one, and there is danger in it and pain. Shall you not all help me? We have learned to believe, all of us, is it not so? And since so, do we not see our duty? Yes, and do we not promise to go on to the bitter end? Each in turn we took his hand, and the promise was made. Then said the professor, as we moved off, Two nights hence you shall meet with me, and dine together at seven of the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two that you know not as yet, and I shall be ready to all our work show, and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult you about, and you can help me. Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, but shall return to-morrow night, and then begins our great quest. But first I shall have much to say, so that you may know what to do, and to dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other anew, for this is a terrible task before us, and once our feet are on the ploughshare, we must not draw back. End of chapter 16
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 17. Read by Dennis Sayers. Elizabeth Clett. M.B. Dr. Seward's Diary Continued. When we arrived at the Barclay Hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. Am coming up by train. Jonathan at Whitby. Important news. Mina Harker. The professor was delighted. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina, he said. Pearl among women. She arrived, but I cannot stay. She must go to your house, friend John. You must meet her at the station. Telegraph her en route, so that she may be prepared. When the wire was dispatched, he had a cup of tea. Over it he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker when abroad, and gave me a typewritten copy of it, as also of Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. Take these, he said, and study them well. When I have returned, you will be master of all the facts, and we can then better enter on our inquisition. Keep them safe, for there is in them much of treasure. You will need all your faith, even you who have had such an experience as that of today. What is here told? He laid his hand heavily and gravely on the packet of papers as he spoke. May be the beginning of the end to you and me, and many another, or it may sound the knell of the undead who walk the earth. Read all, I pray you, with the open mind, and if you can add in any way to the story here told, do so for it is all important. You have kept a diary of all these so strange things. Is it not so? Yes, then we shall go through all these together when we meet. He then made ready for his departure, and shortly drove off to Liverpool Street. I took my way to Paddington, where I arrived about fifteen minutes before the train came in. The crowd melted away, after the bustling fashion common to arrival platforms, and I was beginning to feel uneasy, lest I might miss my guest, when a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl stepped up to me, and after a quick glance said, Dr. Seward, is it not? Ah, and you are Mrs. Harker, I answered at once, whereupon she held out her hand. I knew you from the description of poor dear Lucy, but she stopped suddenly, and a quick blush overspread her face. The blush that rose to my own cheeks somehow set us both at ease, for it was a tacit answer to her own. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we took the underground to Fenchurch Street, after I had sent a wire to my housekeeper to have a sitting-room and a bedroom prepared at once for Mrs. Harker. In due time we arrived. She knew, of course, that the place was a lunatic asylum, but I could see that she was unable to repress a shudder when we entered. She told me that, if she might, she would come presently to my study, as she had much to say. So here I am finishing my entry in my phonograph diary, whilst I await her. As yet I have not had the chance of looking at the papers which Van Helsing left with me, though they lie open before me. I must get her interested in something so that I may have an opportunity of reading them. She does not know how precious time is, or what a task we have in hand. 
I must be careful not to frighten her. Here she is. Mina Harker's Journal 29th September After I had tidied myself, I went down to Dr. Seward's study. At the door I paused a moment, for I thought I heard him talking with some one. As, however, he had pressed me to be quick, I knocked at the door, and on his calling out, Come in, I entered. To my intense surprise there was no one with him. He was quite alone, and on the table opposite him was what I knew at once from the description to be a phonograph. I had never seen one, and was much interested. "'I hope I did not keep you waiting,' I said, but I stayed at the door as I heard you talking, and thought there was someone with you. "'Oh,' he replied with a smile, "'I was only entering my diary.' "'Your diary?' I asked him in surprise. "'Yes,' he answered. "'I keep it in this.' As he spoke, he laid his hand on the phonograph. I felt quite excited over it, and blurted out, "'Why, this beats even shorthand! May I hear it say something?' "'Certainly,' he replied with alacrity, and stood up to put it in train for speaking. Then he paused, and a troubled look overspread his face. "'The fact is,' he began awkwardly, "'I only keep my diary in it, and as it is entirely, almost entirely, about my cases, it may be awkward. That is, I mean—' He stopped, and I tried to help him out of his embarrassment. "'You helped to attend dear Lucy at the end. Let me hear how she died. For all that I know of her, I shall be very grateful. She was very, very dear to me.' To my surprise, he answered with a horror-struck look in his face, "'Tell you of her death! Not for the wide world!' "'Why not?' I asked, for some grave, terrible feeling was coming over me. Again he paused, and I could see that he was trying to invent an excuse. At length he stammered out, "'You see, I do not know how to pick out any particular part of the diary.' Even while he was speaking, an idea dawned upon him, and he said with unconscious simplicity, in a different voice, and with the naivete of a child, "'That's quite true, upon my honour. Honest Indian!' I could not but smile, at which he grimaced. "'I gave myself away that time,' he said. "'But do you know that, although I have kept the diary for months past, it never once struck me how I was going to find any particular part of it, in case I wanted to look it up?' By this time my mind was made up that the diary of a doctor who attended Lucy might have something to add to the sum of our knowledge of that terrible being, and I said boldly, "'Then, Dr. Seward, you had better let me copy it out for you on my typewriter.' He grew to a positively deathly pallor as he said, "'No, no, no, for all the world! I wouldn't let you know that terrible story!' Then it was terrible. My intuition was right. For a moment, I thought, and as my eyes ranged the room, unconsciously looking for something or some opportunity to aid me, they lit on a great batch of typewriting on the table. His eyes caught the look in mine, and without his thinking followed their direction. As they saw the parcel, he realized my meaning. "'You do not know me,' I said. "'When you have read those papers, my own diary, and my husband's also, which I have typed, you will know me better. I have not faltered in giving every thought of my own heart in this cause. But of course you do not know me yet, and I must not expect you to trust me so far." He is certainly a man of noble nature. Poor dear Lucy was right about him. He stood up and opened a large drawer, in which were ranged in order a number of hollow cylinders of metal covered with dark wax, and said, "'You are quite right. I did not trust you because I did not know you. But I know you now and let me say that I should have known you long ago. I know that Lucy told you of me. She told me of you, too. May I make the only atonement in my power? Take the cylinders and hear them. The first half-dozen of them are personal to me, and they will not horrify you. Then you will know me better. Dinner will by then be ready. In the meantime I shall read over some of these documents, and shall be better able to understand certain things." He carried the phonograph himself up to my sitting-room and adjusted it for me. Now I shall learn something pleasant, I am sure, for it will tell me the other side of a true love episode of which I know one side already. Dr. Seward's Diary 29 September I was so absorbed in that wonderful diary of Jonathan Harker, and that other of his wife, that I let the time run on without thinking. Mrs. Harker was not down when the maid came to announce dinner, so I said, she is possibly tired. Let dinner wait an hour. And I went on with my work. 
I had just finished Mrs. Harker's diary when she came in. She looked sweetly pretty, but very sad, and her eyes were flushed with crying. This somehow moved me much. Of late I have had cause for tears, God knows. But the relief of them was denied me, and now the sight of those sweet eyes, brightened by recent tears, went straight to my heart. So I said as gently as I could, I greatly fear I have distressed you. Oh, no, not distressed me, she replied, but I have been more touched than I can say by your grief. This is a wonderful machine, but it is cruelly true. It told me, in its very tones, the anguish of your heart. It was like a soul crying out to Almighty God. No one must hear them spoken ever again. See, I have tried to be useful. I have copied out the words on my typewriter, and none other need now hear your heart beat as I did. No one need ever know, shall ever know, I said in a low voice. She laid her hand on mine and said very gravely, Ah! Uh, but they must. Must? But why? I asked. Because it is a part of the terrible story, a part of poor Lucy's death, and all that led to it. Because in the struggle which we have before us to rid the earth of this terrible monster, we must have all the knowledge and all the help which we can get. I think that the cylinders which you gave me contained more than you intended me to know. But I can see that there are in your record many lights to this dark mystery. You will let me help, will you not? I know all up to a certain point, and I see already, though your diary only took me to 7 September, how poor Lucy was beset and how her terrible doom was being wrought out. Jonathan and I have been working day and night since Professor Van Helsing saw us. He has gone to Whitby to get more information, and he will be here tomorrow to help us. We need have no secrets amongst us. Working together, and with absolute trust, we can surely be stronger than if some of us were in the dark. She looked at me so appealingly, and at the same time manifested such courage and resolution in her bearing, that I gave in at once to her wishes. You shall, I said, do as you like in the matter. God forgive me if I do wrong. There are terrible things yet to learn of, but if you have so far travelled on the road to poor Lucy's death, you will not be content, I know, to remain in the dark. Nay, the end, the very end, may give you a gleam of peace. Come, there is dinner. We must keep one another strong for what is before us. We have a cruel and dreadful task. When you have eaten, you shall learn the rest and I shall answer any questions you ask, if there be anything which you do not understand, though it was apparent to us who were present. Mina Harker's Journal 29th September After dinner I came with Dr. Seward to his study. He brought back the phonograph from my room, and I took a chair, and arranged the phonograph so that I could touch it without getting up, and showed me how to stop it in case I should want to pause. Then he very thoughtfully took a chair with his back to me, so that I might be as free as possible, and began to read. I put the forked metal to my ears, and listened. When the terrible story of Lucy's death and all that followed was done, I lay back in my chair, powerless. Fortunately I am not of a fainting disposition. 
When Dr. Seward saw me, he jumped up with a horrified exclamation, and hurriedly taking a case-bottle from the cupboard, gave me some brandy, which in a few minutes somewhat restored me. My brain was all in a whirl, and only that there came through all the multitude of horrors the holy ray of light that my dear Lucy was at last at peace, I do not think I could have borne it without making a scene. It is all so wild and mysterious, and strange, that if I had not known Jonathan's experience in Transylvania I could not have believed. As it was, I didn't know what to believe, and so got out of my difficulty by attending to something else. I took the cover off my typewriter and said to Dr. Seward, "'Let me write this all out now. We must be ready for Dr. Van Helsing when he comes. I have sent a telegram to Jonathan to come on here when he arrives in London from Whitby. In this matter dates are everything, and I think that if we get all of our material ready, and have every item put in chronological order, we shall have done much. You tell me that Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris are coming too. Let us be able to tell them when they come." He accordingly set the phonograph at a slow pace, and I began to typewrite from the beginning of the seventeenth cylinder. I used manifold, and so took three copies of the diary, just as I had done with the rest. It was late when I got through, but Dr. Seward went about his work of going his round of the patients. When he had finished, he came back and sat near me, reading, so that I did not feel too lonely whilst I worked. How good and thoughtful he is! The world seems full of good men, even if there are monsters in it. Before I left him, I remembered what Jonathan put in his diary of the professor's perturbation at reading something in an evening paper at the station at Exeter. So seeing that Dr. Seward keeps his newspapers, I borrowed the files of the Westminster Gazette and the Pall Mall Gazette, and took them to my room. I remember how much the Daily Graph and the Whitby Gazette, of which I had made cuttings, had helped us to understand the terrible events at Whitby when Count Dracula landed. So I shall look through the evening paper since then and perhaps I shall get some new light. I am not sleepy, and the work will help to keep me quiet. Dr. Seward's Diary 30 September Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. He got his wife's wire just before starting. He is uncommonly clever, if one can judge from his face, and full of energy. If this journal be true, and judging by one's own wonderful experiences it must be, he is also a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. After reading his account, I was prepared to meet a good specimen of manhood, but hardly the quiet, business-like gentleman who came here to-day later. After lunch, Harker and his wife went back to their own room, and, as I passed a while ago, I heard the click of the typewriter. They are hard at it. Mrs. Harker says that they are knitting together in chronological order every scrap of evidence they have. Harker has got the letters between the consigny of the boxes at Whitby and the carriers in London who took charge of them. He is now reading his wife's transcript of my diary. I wonder what they make out of it. Here it is. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows we had enough clues from the conduct of the patient Renfield. The bundle of letters relating to the purchase of the house were with the transcript. Oh, if we had only had them earlier, we might have saved poor Lucy. Oh, stop! That way madness lies. Harker has gone back and is again collecting material. He says that by dinner-time they will be able to show a whole connected narrative he thinks that in the meantime I should see Renfield, as hitherto he has been a sort of index to the coming and going of the Count. I hardly see this yet, but when I get at the dates I suppose I shall. What a good thing that Mrs. Harker put my cylinders into type. We never could have found the dates otherwise. I found Renfield sitting placidly in his room— <clears throat> 
with his hands folded, smiling benignly. At the moment he seemed as sane as any one I ever saw. I sat down and talked with him on a lot of subjects, all of which he treated naturally. He then, of his own accord, spoke of going home, a subject he has never mentioned to my knowledge during his sojourn here. In fact, he spoke quite confidently of getting his discharge at once. I believe that, had I not had the chat with Harker, and read the letters and the dates of his outbursts, I should have been prepared to sign for him, after a brief time of observation. As it is, I am darkly suspicious. All those outbreaks were in some way linked with the proximity of the Count. What then does this absolute content mean? Can it be that his instinct is satisfied as to the vampire's ultimate triumph. Stay, he is himself Zophagus, and in his wild ravings, outside the chapel door of the deserted house, he always spoke of Master. This all seems confirmation of our idea. However, after a while I came away. My friend is just a little too sane at present to make it safe to probe him too deep with questions he might begin to think and then so i came away i mistrust these quiet moods of his so i have given the attendant a hint to look after him and to have a straight waistcoat ready in case of need Jonathan Harker's Journal 29 September, in train to London When I received Mr. Billington's courteous message that he would give me any information in his power, I thought it best to go down to Whitby and make, on the spot, such inquiries as I wanted. It was now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the Counts to its place in London. Later we may be able to deal with it. Billington, Jr., a nice lad, met me at the station and brought me to his father's house, where they had decided that I must spend the night. They are hospitable, with true Yorkshire hospitality. Give a guest everything and leave him to do as he likes. They all knew that I was busy and that my stay was short, and Mr. Billington had ready in his office all the papers concerning the consignment of boxes. It gave me almost a turn to see again one of the letters which I had seen on the Count's table before I knew of his diabolical plans. Everything had been carefully thought out and done systematically and with precision. He seemed to have been prepared for every obstacle which might be placed by accident in the way of his intentions being carried out. To use an Americanism, he had taken no chances, and the absolute accuracy with which his instructions were fulfilled was simply the logical result of his care. I saw the invoice and took note of it. Fifty cases of common earth to be used for experimental purposes. Also the copy of the letter to Carter Patterson in their reply. Of both these I got copies. This was all the information Mr. Billington could give me, so I went down to the port and saw the coast guards, the customs officers, and the harbour-master, who kindly put me in communication with the men who had actually received the boxes. Their tally was exact with the list, and they had nothing to add to the simple description, fifty cases of common earth, except that the boxes were main and mortal heavy, and that shifting them was dry work. One of them added that it was hard lines, that there wasn't any gentleman, such as like yourself, squire to show some sort of appreciation of their efforts in a liquid form. Another put me in a rider that the thirst then generated was such that even the time which had elapsed had not completely allayed it. Needless to add, I took care before leaving to lift, forever and adequately, this source of reproach. 30 September The station-master was good enough to give me a line to his old companion, the station-master, at King's Cross, so that, 
When I arrived there in the morning I was able to ask him about the arrival of the boxes. He, too, put me at once in communication with the proper officials, and I saw that their tally was correct with the original invoice. The opportunities of acquiring an abnormal thirst had been here limited. A noble use of them, however, had been made, and again I was compelled to deal with the result in ex post facto manner. From thence I went to Carter Patterson's central office, where I met with the utmost courtesy. They looked up the transaction in their day-book and letter-book, and at once telephoned to their King's Cross office for more details. By good fortune the men who did the teaming were waiting for work, and the official at once sent them over, sending also by one of them the way-bill and all the papers connected with the delivery of the boxes at Carfax. Here again I found the tally agreeing exactly. The carrier's men were able to supplement the paucity of the written word with a few more details. These were, I shortly found, connected almost solely with the dusty nature of the job and the consequent thirst engendered in the operators. On my affording an opportunity, through the medium of the currency of the realm, of the allaying at a later period this beneficial evil, one of the men remarked, "'That ere house, governor, is the rummiest I ever was in. Blimey! But it ain't been touched as a hundred years. There was dust that thick in the place you might have slept on it without hurting of your bones. And the place was that neglected that you might have smelled old Jerusalem in it. But the old chapel, <laughs> that took the kike, that did. Me and my mate, we thought we'd never get out quick enough. Nor I wouldn't take less nor a quid a moment to stay there out of dark. Having been in the house, I could well believe him, but if he knew what I know, he would, I think, have raised his terms. Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all those boxes which arrived at Whitby from Varna in the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at Carfax. There should be fifty of them there, unless any have since been removed, as from Dr. Seward's diary, I fear later mina and i have worked all day and we have put all the papers into order mina harker's journal thirtieth september i am so glad that i hardly know how to contain myself it is i suppose the reaction from the haunting fear which i have had that this terrible affair and the reopening of his old wound might act detrimentally on jonathan i saw him leave for whitby with as brave a face as could but i was sick with apprehension the effort has, however, done him good. He was never so resolute, never so strong, never so full of volcanic energy as at present. It is just as that dear good Professor Van Helsing said, he is true grit, and he improves under strain that would kill a weaker nature. He came back full of life and hope and determination. We have got everything in order for to-night. I feel myself quite wild with excitement. I suppose one ought to pity anything so hunted as the Count. That is just it. The thing is not human, not even a beast. To read Dr. Seward's account of poor Lucy's death and what followed is enough to dry up the springs of pity in one's heart. Later. Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris arrived earlier than we expected. Dr. Seward was out on business and had taken Jonathan with him, so I had to see them. It was to me a painful meeting, for it brought back all poor dear Lucy's hopes of only a few months ago. Of course they had heard Lucy speak of me, and it seemed that Dr. Van Helsing, too, had been quite blowing my trumpet, as Mr. Morris expressed it. Poor fellows! Neither of them is aware that I know all about the proposals they made to Lucy. They did not quite know what to say or do, as they were ignorant of the amount of my knowledge. So they had to keep on neutral subjects. However, I thought the matter over, and came to the conclusion that the best thing I could do would be to post them on affairs right up to date. I knew from Dr. Seward's diary that they had been at Lucy's death, her real death, and that I need not fear to betray any secret before the time. So I told them as well as I could, that I had read all the papers and diaries, and that my husband and I, having typewritten them, had just finished putting them in order. I gave them each a copy to read in the library. When Lord Godalming got his and turned it over, it does make a pretty good pile. He said, "'Did you write all this, Mrs. Harker?' I nodded, and he went on. I don't quite see the drift of it, 
But you people are all so good and kind, and have been working so earnestly and so energetically, that all I can do is to accept your ideas blindfold and try to help you. I have had one lesson already in accepting facts that should make a man humble to the last hour of his life. Besides, I know you loved my Lucy." Here he turned away and covered his face with his hands. I could hear the tears in his voice. Mr. Morris, with instinctive delicacy, just laid a hand for a moment on his shoulder, and then walked quietly out of the room. I suppose there is something in a woman's nature that makes a man free to break down before her, and express his feelings on the tender or emotional side, without feeling it derogatory to his manhood. For when Lord Godalming found himself alone with me, he sat down on the sofa and gave way utterly and openly. I sat down beside him and took his hand. I hope he didn't think it forward of me, and that if he ever thinks of it afterwards he never will have such a thought. There I wrong him. I know he never will. He is too true a gentleman. I said to him, for I could see that his heart was breaking, I loved dear Lucy, and I know what she was to you, and what you were to her. She and I were like sisters, and now she is gone. Will you not let me be like a sister to you in your trouble? I know what sorrows you have had, though I cannot measure the depth of them. If sympathy and pity can help in your affliction, won't you let me be of some little service, for Lucy's sake?" In an instant the poor dear fellow was overwhelmed with grief. It seemed to me that all that he had been of late suffering in silence found a vent at once. He grew quite hysterical, and raising his open hands beat his palms together in a perfect agony of grief. He stood up, and then sat down again, and the tears rained down his cheeks. I felt an infinite pity for him, and opened my arms unthinkingly. With a sob he laid his head on my shoulder, and cried like a wearied child, whilst he shook with emotion. We women have something of the mother in us that makes us rise above smaller matters, when the mother's spirit is invoked. I felt this big, sorrowing man's head resting on me, as though it were that of a baby that some day may lie on my bosom, and I stroked his hair as though he were my own child. I never thought at the time how strange it all was. After a little bit his sobs ceased, and he raised himself with an apology, though he made no disguise of his emotion. He told me that, for days and nights past, weary days and sleepless nights, he had been unable to speak with any one, as a man must speak in his time of sorrow. There was no woman whose sympathy could be given to him, or with whom, owing to the terrible circumstance with which his sorrow was surrounded, he could speak freely. "'I know now how I have suffered,' he said, as he dried his eyes, "'but I do not know even yet, and none other can ever know, how much your sweet sympathy has been to me to-day. I shall know better in time, and believe me that, though I am not ungrateful now, my gratitude will grow with my understanding. You will let me be like a brother, will you not, for all our lives, for dear Lucy's sake?" "'For dear Lucy's sake,' I said, as we clasped hands. "'Aye, and for your own sake,' he added. For if a man's esteem and gratitude are ever worth the winning, you have won mine to-day. If ever the future should bring you to a time when you need a man's help, Believe me, you will not call in vain. God grant that no such time may ever come to you to break the sunshine of your life, but if it should ever come, promise me that you will let me know." He was so earnest, and his sorrow was so fresh, that I felt it would comfort him, so I said, I promise. As I came along the corridor, I saw Mr. Morris looking out of a window. He turned as he heard my footsteps. "'How is art?' he said. Then noticing my red eyes, he went on, "Ah." I see you have been comforting him. Poor old fellow! He needs it. No one but a woman can help a man when he is in trouble of the heart, and he had no one to comfort him." He bore his own trouble so bravely that my heart bled for him. I saw the manuscript in his hand, and I knew that when he read it he would realize how much I knew. So I said to him, I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend, and will you come to me for comfort if you need it? You will know later why I speak. He saw that I was in earnest, and stooping took my hand and raising it to his lips, kissed it. It seemed but poor comfort to so brave and unselfish a soul, and impulsively I bent over and kissed him. The tears rose in his eyes, and there was a momentary choking in his throat. He said quite calmly, "'Little girl, you will never forget that true-hearted kindness, so long as ever you live.' Then he went into the study to his friend. "'Little girl!' the very words he had used to Lucy, and oh, 
but he proved himself a friend. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Dracula This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 18 Read by Dennis Sayers Elizabeth Clett Dr. Seward's Diary 30 September I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived, but had already studied the manuscript of the various diaries and letters, while Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men, of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea, and I can honestly say that for the first time since I have lived in it, this old house seemed like home. When we had finished, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favor? I want to see your patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty that I could not refuse her, and there was no possible reason why I should, so I took her with me. When I went into the room, I told the man that a lady would like to see him, to which he simply answered, Why? She is going through the house and wants to see every one in it, I answered. Oh, very well, he said. Let her come in, by all means, but just wait a minute till I tidy up the place. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared, or was jealous of, some interference. When he had got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, Let the lady come in, and sat down on the edge of his bed with his head down, but with his eyelids raised so that he could see her as she entered. For a moment I thought he might have some homicidal intent. I remembered how quiet he had been just before he attacked me in my own study, and I took care to stand where I could seize him at once, if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness, which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is one of the qualities mad people most respect. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. "'Good evening, Mr. Renfield,' said she. "'You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you.' He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave way to one of wonder, which merged in doubt. Then, to my intense astonishment, he said, You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? You can't be, you know, for she's dead. Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, Oh, no, I have a husband of my own, to whom I was married before I ever saw Dr. Seward, or he me. I am Mrs. Harker. Then, what are you doing here? My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. Then, don't stay. But why not? I thought that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker any more than it was to me, so I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? His reply was simply contemptuous, given in a pause in which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question! I don't see that at all, Mr. Renfield, said Mrs. Harker, at once 
championing me. He replied to her with as much courtesy and respect as he had shown contempt to me. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is so loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in a mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates lean towards the errors of non causa and ignoratio elenche. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I had ever met with, talking elemental philosophy, and with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wondered if it was Miss Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory, if this new phase was spontaneous, or in any way due to her unconscious influence, she must have some rare gift or power. We continued to talk for some time, and seeing that he was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly, as she began, to lead him to his favourite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why, I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed, and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that by consuming a multitude of live things, no matter how low in the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times I held the belief so strongly that I actually tried to take human life. The doctor here will bear me out that on one occasion I tried to kill him for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life, though indeed the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarized the truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, doctor? I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew what to either think or say. It was hard to imagine that I had seen him eat up his spiders and flies, not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, so I told Mrs. Harker that it was time to leave. She came at once, after saying pleasantly to Mr. Renfield, Good-bye, and I hope I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself. To which, to my astonishment, he replied, Good-bye, my dear. I pray, God, I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Art seemed more cheerful than he has been since Lucy first took ill, and Quincy is more like his own bright self than he has been for many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with the eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once and rushed up to me, saying, Ah, friend John, how goes all? Well, so, I have been busy, for I come here to stay if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell. Madam Mina is with you? Yes, 
and her so fine husband, and Arthur and my friend Quincy, they are with you too. Good. As I drove to the house, I told him of what had passed, and of how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Harker's suggestion, at which the professor interrupted me. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina! She has man's brain, a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, and a woman's heart. The good God fashioned her for a purpose, believe me, when he made that so good combination. Friend John, up to now fortune has made that woman of help to us. After to-night she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. It is not good that she run a risk so great. We men are determined, nay, are we not pledged to destroy this monster? But it is no part for a woman. Even if she be not harmed, her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer, both in waking from her nerves, and in sleep from her dreams. And besides, she is young woman, and not so long married. There may be other things to think of some time, if not now. You tell me she has wrote all, then she must consult with us, but to-morrow she say good-bye to this work, and we go alone. I heartily agreed with him, and then I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed, and a great concern seemed to come on him. Go! Oh, that we had known it before, he said, for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. However, the milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that, but go on our way to the end. Then he fell into a silence that lasted till we entered my own gateway. Before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs. Harker, I am told, Madam Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all things that have been up to this moment. Not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, but up to this morning. But why not up to now? We have seen hitherto how good light all the little things have made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told is the worst for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking a paper from her pockets, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this, and tell me if it must go in? It is my record of to-day. I, too, have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial, but there is little in this except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely, and handed it back, saying, It need not go in if you do not wish it, but I pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you more, and all us your friends more honour you, as well as more esteem and love. She took it back with another blush, and a bright smile. And so, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner, and before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock. The rest of us have already read everything, so when we meet in the study we shall all be informed as to facts, and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Mina Harker's Journal 30th September When we met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of board or committee. 
Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right, and asked me to act as secretary. Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next to the Professor, and Dr. Seward in the centre. The Professor said, "'I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers?' We all expressed assent, and he went on. "'Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertained for me. So we then can discuss how we shall act, and can take our measure according. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. I admit that at the first I was sceptic. Were it not that through long years I have trained myself to keep an open mind, I could not have believed until such time as that fact thunder on my ear. See, see, I prove, I prove! Alas! had I known at first what I know now, nay, had I even guess at him, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who did love her. But that is gone, and we must so work that other poor souls perish not whilst we can save. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting once. He is only stronger, and being stronger have yet more power to work evil. This vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal, for his cunning be the growth of ages. He have still the aids of necromancy, which is, as his etymology imply, the divination by the dead, and all the dead that he can come nigh to are for him at command. He is brute, and more than brute. He is devil and callous, and the heart of him is not. He can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the rat, the owl, the bat, the moth, the fox, and the wolf. He can grow and become small, and he can at times vanish and come unknown. How, then, are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his where, and having found it, how can we destroy? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake, and there may be consequence to make the brave shudder. For if we fail in this our fight, he must surely win, and then where end we? Life is nothing, I heed him not, but to fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him, that we henceforward become foul things of the night like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and the souls of those we love best. To us for ever are the gates of heaven shut, for who shall open them to us again? We go on for all time, a board by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the side of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case must we shrink? For me I say no, but then I am old, and life with his sunshine, his fair places, his song of birds, his music and his love lie far behind. You others are young. Some have seen sorrow, but there are fair days yet in store. What say you?" Whilst he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared, oh, so much, that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him, when I saw his hand stretch out. But it was life to me to feel its touch so strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. It does not even need a woman's love to hear its music. When the professor had done speaking, my husband looked in my eyes, and I in his. There was no need for speaking between us. "'I answer for Mina and myself,' he said. "'Count me in, professor,' said Mr. Quincy Morris, laconically as usual. "'I am with you,' said Lord Godalming. For Lucy's sake, if for no other reason." Dr. Seward simply nodded. The professor stood up, and after laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand on either side. I took his right hand, and Lord Godalming his left. Jonathan held my right with his left, and stretched across to Mr. Morris. So as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. I felt my heart icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We resumed our places, and Dr. Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely, and in as business-like a way, as any other transaction of life. "'Well, you know what we have to contend against. But we two are not without strength. We have on our side power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have sources of science. We are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. 
In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered, and we are free to use them. We have self-devotion in a cause and an end to achieve which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now, let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict, and how the individual cannot. In fine, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and of this one in particular. All we have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much when the matter is one of life and death, nay, of more than either life or death. Yet must we be satisfied, in the first place because we have to be, no other means is at our control, and secondly, because after all these things, tradition and superstition are everything. Does not the belief in vampires rest for others, though not alas for us, on them? A year ago, which of us would have received such a possibility, in the midst of our scientific, sceptical, matter-of-fact nineteenth century? We even scouted a belief that we saw justified under our very eyes. Take it, then, that the vampire, and the belief in his limitations and his cure, rest for the moment on the same base. For, let me tell you, he is known everywhere that man have been. In old Greece, in old Rome, he flourish in Germany all over in France, in India, even in the Shurma Seas, and in China, so far from us in all ways, there even is he, and the peoples for him at this day. He have followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, the devil-begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, the Magyar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon, and let me tell you that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen in our own so unhappy experience. The vampire live on, and cannot die by mere passing of the time. He can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Even more, we have seen amongst us that he can grow even younger, that his vital faculties grow strenuous, and seem as though they refresh themselves when his special pabulum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did not ever see him eat, never. He throws no shadow. He make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observe. He has the strength of many of his hand. Witness again Jonathan when he shut the door against the wolves, and when he help him from the diligence too. He can transform himself to wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby, when he tear open the dog. He can be as bat, as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby, and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house, and as my friend Quincy saw him at the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create. That noble ship's captain proved him of this. But, from what we know, the distance he can make this mist is limited, and it can only be round himself. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle of Dracula. He become so small we ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hair's breadth spate at the tomb's door. He can, when once he find his way, come out from anything or into anything, no matter how close it be bound or even fused up with fire, solder, you call it. He can see in the dark, no small power this, in a world which is one half shut from the light. Ah, but hear me through. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. Nay, he is even more prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some of nature's laws. Why, we know not. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be some one of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, as does that of all evil things, at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom. If he be not at the place whither he is bound, he can only change himself at noon or at exact sunrise or sunset. These things we are told, and in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as he will within his limit, when he have his earth home, his coffin home, his hell home, the place unhallowed as we saw when he went to the grave of the suicide at Whitby, still at other time he can only change when the time come. It is said, too, that he can only pass running water at the slack, or the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of and as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now when we resolve. To them he is nothing, but in their presence he take his place far off and silent with respect. There are others too which I shall tell you of, lest in our seeking we may need them. The branch of wild rose on his coffin keep him that he move not from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him, so that he may be true dead. And as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, 
or the cut-off head that giveth rest, we have seen it with our eyes. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him, if we obey what we know. But he is clever. I have asked my friend Arminius, of Budapest University, to make his record, and from all the means that are, he tell me of what he has been. He must, indeed, have been that Voivoda Dracula who won his name against the Turk, over the great river on the very frontier of Turkeyland. If it be so, then he was no common man. For in that time, and for centuries after, he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain and that iron resolution went with him to his grave, and are even now arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race, though now and again were scions who were held by the Coevals to have dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Scholomance, amongst the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar is his due. In the records there are words such as Stregoica, witch, Ordog, and Pukul, Satan, and Hell, and in one manuscript this very Dracula is spoken of as Wampir, which we all understand too well. There have been from the loins of this very one great man, and good women, and their graves make sacred the earth where alone this foulness can dwell. For it is not the least of its terrors that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good. In soil barren of holy memories it cannot rest." Whilst they were talking, Mr. Morris was looking steadily at the window, and he now got up quietly, and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and then the professor went on. "'And now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carfax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. It seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain in the house beyond that wall where we look to-day, or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must trace—" Here we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside the house came the sound of a pistol-shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet, which ricocheting from the top of the embrasure struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet. Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did so, we heard Mr. Morris's voice without. "'Sorry. I fear I have alarmed you. I shall come in and tell you about it.' A minute later he came in and said, "'It was an idiotic thing of me to do, and I ask your pardon, Mrs. Harker, most sincerely. I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is that whilst the professor was talking there came a big bat and sat on the window-sill. I have got such a horror of the damned brutes from recent events that I cannot stand them, and I went out to have a shot, as I have been doing late of evenings, whenever I have seen one. You used to laugh at me for it then, Art." "'Did you hit it?' asked Dr. Van Helsing. "'I don't know. I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood.' Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. "'We must trace each of these boxes and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair. Or we must, so to speak, sterilize the earth, so that no more he can seek safety in it. Thus, in the end, we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset, and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. And now for you, Madam Mina, this night is the end, until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such a risk. When we part to-night, you no more must question. We shall tell you all in good time. We are men and are able to bear. But you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in the danger, such as we are." All the men, even Jonathan, seemed relieved. But it did not seem to me good that they should brave danger, and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety, through care of me. But their minds were made up, and though it were a bitter pill for me to swallow, I could say nothing, save to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. As there is no time to lose, I vote we have a look at his house right now. Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part may save another victim." I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close, but I did not say anything, for I had a greater fear that if I appeared as a drag or a hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of their counsels altogether. They have now gone off to Carfax, with means to get into the house. Manlike, they had told me to go to bed and sleep. 
as if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger. I shall lie down and pretend to sleep, lest Jonathan have added anxiety about me when he returns. Dr. Seward's Diary 1 October 4 a.m. Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say that I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. I don't know, but what, if you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits. I knew the man would not have said this without some cause. So I said, All right, I'll go now. And I asked the others to wait a few minutes for me, as I had to go and see my patient. Take me with you, friend John, said the professor. His case in your diary interested me much, and it had bearing, too, now and again on our case. I should much like to see him, and especial when his mind is disturbed. May I come also? asked Lord Galdamine. Me, too, said Quincy Morris. May I come? said Harker. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I had ever met with in a lunatic, and he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail with others entirely sane. We all five went into the room, but none of the others, at first, said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. Then he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery and deduced his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. They will perhaps not mind sitting in judgment on my case. By the way, you have not introduced me. I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum did not strike me at the moment, and, besides, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner, so much of the habit of equality, that I at once made the introduction. Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing, Mr. Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr. Jonathan Harker, Mr. Renfield. He shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming, I had the honor of seconding your father at the Wyndham. I grieve to know, by your holding the title, that he is no more. He was a man loved and honored by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of a burnt rum punch, much patronized on Derby Night. Mr. Morris, you should be proud of your great state. Its reception into the Union was a precedent which may have far-reaching effects hereafter, when the Pole and the Tropics may hold allegiance to the Stars and Stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement, when the Monroe Doctrine takes its true place, as a political fable. What shall any man say of his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionized therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You, gentlemen, who by nationality, by heredity, or by the possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world. 
I take to witness that I am as sane as at least the majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties, and I am sure that you, Dr. Seward, humanitarian and medical jurist, as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered as under exceptional circumstances. He made this last appeal with a courtly air of conviction, which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered. For my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored, and I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity, and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I thought it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement, for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes. This did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, But I fear, Dr. Seward, that you hardly apprehend my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. Time presses, and in our implied agreement with the old scythe man, it is of the essence of the contract. I am sure it is only necessary to put before so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward so simple, yet so momentous a wish to ensure its fulfillment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing the negative in my face, turned to the others, and scrutinized them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on, is it possible that I have erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly, but at the same time, as I felt, brutally. There was a considerable pause, and then he said slowly, Then, I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession, boon, privilege, what you will. I am content to implore, in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I am not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones, sound and unselfish, and spring from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, sir, into my heart, you would approve to the full the sentiments which animate me. Nay, more, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friends. Again, he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another phase of his madness, and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of utmost intensity, his bushy eyebrows almost meeting with the fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield, in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as of one addressing an equal. Can you not tell frankly your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that, if you will satisfy even me, a stranger, without prejudice, 
and with the habit of keeping an opened mind, Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk, and on his own responsibility, the privilege you seek. He shook his head sadly, and with a look of poignant regret on his face. The professor went on. Come, sir, bethink yourself. You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree, since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. If you will not help us in our effort to choose the wisest course, how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? Be wise, and help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He still shook his head as he said, Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete, and if I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment. But I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave, so I went towards the door, simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door, a new change came over the patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared that he was about to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless, for he held up his two hands imploringly and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotion was militating against him by restoring us more to our old relations, he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes, so I became a little more fixed in my manner, if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. I had previously seen something of the same constantly growing excitement in him when he had to make some request, of which, at the time, he had thought much, such as, for instance, as when he wanted a cat, and I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. My expectation was not realized, for when he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on his knees, and held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication, and poured forth a torrent of entreaty, with the tears rolling down his cheeks, and his whole face and form expressive of the deepest emotion. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward, oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Send me away how you will and where you will. Send keepers with me with whips and chains. Let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacled and leg-ironed, even to jail. But let me go out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I am speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. You don't know whom you wrong, or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me! I may not tell. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, by your love that is lost, by your hope that lives, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that 
I am sane and earnest now, that I am no lunatic in a mad fit, but a sane man fighting for his soul. Oh, hear me, hear me, let me go, let me go, let me go. I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit. So I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly, no more of this. We have had quite enough already. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intently for several moments. Then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasions, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, last of our party, he said to me in a quiet, well-bred voice, you will, I trust, Dr. Stewart, do me the justice to bear in mind, later on, that I did what I could to convince you tonight. End of chapter 18《5 a.m. I went with the party to the search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Mina so absolutely strong and well. I am so glad that she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. Somehow it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all, but now that her work is done and it is due to her energy and brains and foresight that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells, she may well feel that her part is finished, and that she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, all a little upset by the scene with Mr. Renfield. When we came away from his room, we were silent till we got back to the study. Then Mr. Morris said to Dr. Seward, "'Say, Jack, if that man wasn't attempting a bluff, he's about the sadist lunatic I ever saw.' I'm not sure, but I believe that he had some serious purpose, and if he had, it was pretty rough on him not to get a chance. Lord Godalming and I were silent. But Dr. Van Helsing added, Friend John, you know more lunatics than I do, and I'm glad of it, for I fear that if it had been me to decide, I would before that last hysterical outburst have given him free. But we live and learn and in our present task we must take no chance, as my friend Quincy would say, all is best as they are. Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. I don't know but that I agree with you. If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him, but he seems so mixed up with the Count in an indexy sort of way that I am afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he— prayed with almost equal fervour for a cat, and then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master, and he may want to get out to help him in some diabolical way. That horrid thing has the wolves and the rats and his own kind to help him, so I suppose he isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly did seem earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best." These things in conjunction with the wild work we have in hand help to unnerve a man. The professor stepped over, and laying his hand on his shoulder, said in a grave, kindly way, Friend John, have no fear. 
we are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case we can only do as we deem best what else have we to hope for except the pity of the good god lord godalming had slipped away for a few minutes but now he returned he held up a little silver whistle as he remarked that old place may be full of rats and if so i've got an antidote on call having passed the wall we took our way to the house taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight shone out when we got to the porch the professor opened his bag and took out a lot of things which he laid on the steps sorting them into four little groups evidently one for each then he spoke my friends we are going into a terrible danger and we need arms of many kinds our enemy is not merely spiritual remember that he has the strength of twenty men and that though our necks or our windpipes are of the common kind and therefore breakable or crushable his are not amenable to mere strength a stronger man or a body of men more strong in all than him can at certain times hold him but they cannot hurt him as we can be hurt by him we must therefore guard ourselves from his touch keep this near your heart as he spoke he lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me i being nearest to him put these flowers round your neck here he handed me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms for other enemies more mundane this revolver and this knife and for aid in all so small electric lamps which you can fasten to your breast and for all and above all at the last this which we must not desecrate needless this was a portion of sacred wafer which he put in an envelope and handed to me each of the others was similarly equipped now he said friend john where are the skeleton keys if so that we can open the door we need not break house by the window as before at miss lucy's dr seward tried one or two skeleton keys his mechanical dexterity as a surgeon standing him in good stead presently he got one to suit after a little play back and forward the bolt yielded and with a rusty clang shot back we pressed on the door the rusty hinges creaked and it slowly opened it was startlingly like the image conveyed to me in dr seward's diary of the opening of miss westenra's tomb i fancy that the same idea seemed to strike the others for with one accord they shrank back the professor was the first to move forward and stepped into the open door in manus tuas domine he said crossing himself as he passed over the threshold we closed the door behind us lest when we should have lit our lamps we should possibly attract attention from the road the professor carefully tried the lock lest we might not be able to open it from within should we be in a hurry making our exit. Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded on our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell in all sorts of odd forms, as the rays crossed each other or the opacity of our bodies through great shadows. I could not for my life get away from the feeling that there was someone else amongst us. I suppose it was the recollection so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings of that terrible experience in transylvania i think the feeling was common to us all for i noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every shadow just as i felt myself doing the whole place was thick with dust the floor was seemingly inches deep except where there were recent footsteps in which on holding down my lamp i could see marks of hobnails where the dust was cracked the walls were fluffy and heavy with dust and in the corners were masses of spiders webs whereon the dust had gathered till they looked like old tattered rags as the weight had torn them partly down on the table in the hall was a great bunch of keys with a time yellowed label on each these had been used several times for on the table were several similar rents in the blanket of dust similar to that exposed when the professor lifted them he turned to me and said you know this place jonathan 
you have copied maps of it, and you know it at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel? I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it, so I led the way, and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low, arched oaken door, ribbed with iron bands. This is the spot, said the professor, as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house, copied from the file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door a faint malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gaps, but none of us ever expected such an odour as we encountered. None of the others had met the Count at all at close quarters, and when I had seen him he was either in the fasting stage of his existence in his rooms, or when he was bloated with fresh blood in a ruined building opened the air, but here the place was small and close, and the long disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell, as of some dry miasma, which came through the fouler air. But as to the odour itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills of mortality, and with the pungent acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. Faugh! Oh, it sickens me to think of it. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end, but this was no ordinary case, and the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us a strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent on the first nauseous whiff, we one and all set about our work as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, the first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. We must then examine every hole and corner and cranny and see if we cannot get some clue as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky, and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. Once I got a fright, for seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door into the dark passage beyond. I looked too, and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the high lights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for, as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows, and resumed his inquiry. I turned my lamp in the direction and stepped into the passage. There was no sign of any one, and as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind, but only the solid walls of the passage, there could be no hiding place even for him. I took it that fear had helped imagination and said nothing. A few minutes later I saw Morris step suddenly back from a corner which he was examining. We all followed his movements with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us, and we saw a whole mass of phosphorescence which twinkled like stars. We all instinctively drew back. The whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we all stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency. Rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, and which I had seen myself, he turned the key in the lock, drew the huge bolts, and swung the door open. Then, taking his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and after about a minute three terriers came dashing round the corner of the house. Unconsciously we had all moved towards the door, and as we moved I noticed that the dust had been much disturbed. 
the boxes which had been taken out had been brought this way but even in the minute that had elapsed the number of the rats had vastly increased they seemed to swarm over the place all at once till the lamplight shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering baleful eyes made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies the dogs dashed on but at the threshold suddenly stopped and snarled and then simultaneously lifting their noses began to howl in a most lugubrious fashion the rats were multiplying in thousands and we moved out lord godalming lifted one of the dogs and carrying him in placed him on the floor the instant his feet touched the ground he seemed to recover his courage and rushed at his natural enemies they fled before him so fast that before he had shaken the life out of a score the other dogs who had by now been lifted in the same manner had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished with their going it seemed as if some evil presence had departed for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts at their prostrate foes and turned them over and tossed them in the air with vicious shakes we all seemed to find our spirits rise whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere by the opening of the chapel door or the relief which we experienced by finding ourselves in the open i know not but most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution we closed the outer door and barred and locked it and bringing the dogs with us began our search of the house we found nothing throughout except dust in extraordinary proportions and all untouched save for my own footsteps when i had made my first visit never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness and even when we returned to the chapel they frisked about as though they had been rabbit hunting in a summer wood the morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front dr van helsing had taken the key of the hall door from the bunch and locked the door in orthodox fashion putting the key into his pocket when he had done so far he said our night has been eminently successful no harm has come to us such as i feared might be and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing more than all do i rejoice that this our first and perhaps our most difficult and dangerous step has been accomplished without the bringing therein to our most sweet madam mina or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget one lesson too we have learned if it be allowable to argue a particulari that the brute beasts which are to the count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spiritual power for look these rats that would come to his call just as from his castle top he summoned the wolves to your going and to that poor mother's cry though they come to him they run pell-mell from the so little dogs of my friend arthur we have other matters before us other dangers other fears and that monster he has not used his power over the brute world for the only or the last time to-night so be it that he has gone elsewhere good it has given us opportunity to cry check in some ways in this chess game which we play for the sake of human souls and now let us go home the dawn is close at hand and we have reason to be content with our first night's work it may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow if full of peril but we must go on and from no danger shall we shrink the house was silent when we got back save for some poor creature who was screaming away in one of the distant wards and a low moaning sound from renfield's room the poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself after the manner of the insane with needless thoughts of pain I came tiptoe into our own room, and found Mina asleep, breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it. She looks paler than usual. I hope the meeting tonight has not upset her. I am truly thankful that she is to be left out of our future work, 
and even of our deliberations. It is too great a strain for a woman to bear. I did not think so at first, but I know better now. Therefore I am glad that it is settled. There may be things which would frighten her to hear, and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell her if once she suspected that there was any concealment. Henceforth our work is to be a sealed book to her, till at least such time as we can tell her that all is finished, and the earth free from a monster of the nether world. I dare say it will be difficult to keep silence after such confidence as ours, but I must be resolute, and to-morrow I shall keep dark over to-night's doings, and shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened. I rest on the sofa, so as not to disturb her. 1 October Later I suppose it was natural that we should have all overslept ourselves, for the day was a busy one, and the night had no rest at all. Even Mina must have felt its exhaustion, for though I slept till the sun was high, I was awake before her, and had to call two or three times before she awoke. Indeed, she was so sound asleep that for a few seconds she did not recognize me, but looked at me with a sort of blank terror, as one looks who has been waked out of a bad dream. She complained a little of being tired, and I let her rest till later in the day. We now know of twenty-one boxes having been removed, and if it be that several were taken to any of these removals, we may be able to trace them all. Such will, of course, immensely simplify our labour, and the sooner the matter is attended to the better. I shall look up Thomas Snelling to-day. Dr. Seward's Diary 1. October It was towards noon when I was awakened by the professor walking into my room. He was more jolly and cheerful than usual, and it is quite evident that last night's work has helped to take some of the brooding weight off his mind. After going over the adventure of the night, he suddenly said, Your patient interests me much. May it be that with you I visit him this morning, or if that you are to occupy, I can go alone, if it may be. It is a new experience to me to find a lunatic who taught philosophy, and reason so sound. I had some work to do which pressed, so I told him that if he would go alone I would be glad, as then I should not have to keep him waiting. So I called an attendant, and gave him the necessary instructions. Before the professor left the room, I cautioned him against getting any false impression from my patient. But, he answered, I want him to talk of himself, and of his delusion as to consuming live things. He said to Madame Mina, as I see in your diary of yesterday, that he had once had such a belief. Why do you smile, friend John? Excuse me, I said, but the answer is here. I laid my hand on the typewritten matter. When our sane and learned lunatic made that very statement of how he used to consume life, his mouth was, actually, nauseous with the flies and spiders which he had eaten just before Mrs. Harker entered the room. Van Helsing smiled in turn. Good, he said. Your memory is true, friend John. I should have remembered. And yet it is this very obliquity of thought and memory which makes mental disease such a fascinating study. Perhaps I may gain more knowledge out of the folly of this madman than I shall from the teaching of the most wise. Who knows? I went on with my work, and before long was through that in hand. It seemed that the time had been very short indeed, but there was Van Helsing back in the study. Do I interrupt? he asked politely, as he stood at the door. Not at all, I answered. Come in. My work is finished, and I am free. 
I can go with you now, if you like. It is needless. I have seen him. Well, I fear that he does not appraise me at much. Our interview was short. When I entered his room, he was sitting on a stool in the center, with his elbows on his knees, and his face was the picture of sullen discontent. I spoke to him as cheerfully as I could, and with such a measure of respect as I could assume. He made no reply whatever. "'Don't you know me?' I asked. His answer was not reassuring. "'I know you well enough. You are the old fool Van Helsing. I wish you would take yourself and your idiotic brain theories somewhere else. Damn all thick-headed Dutchmen! Not a word more, would he say, but sat in his implacable sullenness, as indifferent to me as though I had not been in the room at all. Thus departed for this time my chance of much learning from this so clever lunatic, so I shall go, if I may, and cheer myself with a few happy words with that sweet soul, Madame Mina. Friend John, it does rejoice me unspeakable that she is no more to be pained, no more to be worried with our terrible things, though we shall much miss her help. It is better so. I agree with you with all my heart, I answered earnestly, for I did not want him to weaken in this matter. Mrs. Harker is better out of it. Things are quite bad enough for us, all men of the world, and who have been in many tight places in our time. But it is no place for a woman, and if she had remained in touch with the affair, it would in time infallibly have wrecked her. So Van Helsing was gone to confer with Mrs. Harker and Harker. Quincy and Art are all out following up the clues as to the earth boxes. I shall finish my round of work, and we shall meet to-night. Mina Harker's Journal 1st October It is strange to me to be kept in the dark as I am to-day, after Jonathan's full confidence for so many years, to see him manifestly avoid certain matters, and those the most vital of all. This morning I slept late after the fatigues of yesterday, and though Jonathan was late too, he was the earlier. He spoke to me before he went out, never more sweetly or tenderly, but he never mentioned a word of what had happened in the visit to the Count's house, and yet he must have known how terribly anxious I was. Poor dear fellow! I suppose it must have distressed him even more than it did me. They all agreed that it was best that I should not be drawn further into this awful work, and I acquiesced. But to think that he keeps anything from me! Now I am crying like a silly fool, when I know it comes from my husband's great love, and from the good, good wishes of those other strong men. That has done me good. Well, some day Jonathan will tell me all. And lest it should ever be that he should think for a moment that I kept anything from him, I still keep my journal as usual. Then, if he has feared of my trust, I shall show it to him, with every thought of my heart put down for his dear eyes to read. I feel strangely sad and low-spirited to-day. I suppose it is the reaction from the terrible excitement. Last night I went to bed when the men had gone, simply because they told me to. I didn't feel sleepy, and I did feel full of devouring anxiety. I kept thinking over everything that has been ever since Jonathan came to see me in London, and it all seems like a horrible tragedy, with fate pressing on relentlessly to some destined end. Everything that one does seems, no matter how right it may be, to bring on the very thing which is most to be deplored. If I hadn't gone to Whitby, perhaps poor dear Lucy would be with us now. She hadn't taken to visiting the churchyard till I came, and if she hadn't come there in the daytime with me she wouldn't have walked in her sleep, and if she hadn't gone there at night in her sleep the monster couldn't have destroyed her as he did. Oh, why did I ever go to Whitby? <laughs> There now, crying again. I wonder what has come over me to-day. I must hide it from Jonathan, for if he knew that I had been crying twice in one morning, I, who never cried on my own account, and whom he has never caused to shed a tear, 
The poor dear fellow would fret his heart out. I shall put a bold face on, and if I do feel weepy he shall never see it. I suppose it is just one of the lessons that we poor women have to learn." I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs, and a lot of queer sounds, like praying on a very tumultuous scale, from Mr. Renfield's room, which is somewhere under this. And then there was silence over everything, silence so profound that it startled me, and I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent, the black shadows thrown by the moonlight seeming full of a silent mystery of their own. Not a thing seemed to be stirring, but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate, so that a thin streak of white mist that crept with almost imperceptible slowness across the grass towards the house seemed to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I think that the digression of my thoughts must have done me good, for when I got back to bed I found a lethargy creeping over me. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got out and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading, and was now close up to the house, so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it was stealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognize in his tone some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was the sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed, and pulled the clothes over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy, at least so I thought. But I must have fallen asleep, for except dreams I do not remember anything until the morning when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and a little time to realize where I was, and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, and was almost typical of the way that waking thoughts become merged in, or continued in, dreams. I thought that I was asleep, and waiting for Jonathan to come back. I was very anxious about him, and I was powerless to act. My feet and my hands and my brain were weighted, so that nothing could proceed at the usual pace. And so I slept uneasily, and thought. Then it began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dark and cold. I put back the clothes from my face, and found to my surprise that it was dim all around. The gaslight which I had left lit for Jonathan, but turned down, came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker, and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I had shut the window before I had come to bed. I would have got out to make certain on the point, but some leaden lethargy seemed to chain my limbs and even my will. I lay still and endured, that was all. I closed my eyes, but could see still through my eyelids. It is wonderful what tricks our dreams play us, and how conveniently we can imagine. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in, for I could see it like smoke or with the white energy of boiling water pouring in, not through the window, but through the joinings of the door. It got thicker and thicker, till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see the light of the gas shining like a red eye. Things began to whirl through my brain just as the cloudy column was now whirling in the room, and through it all came the scriptural words, A pillar of cloud by day, and of fire by night. Was it indeed such spiritual guidance that was coming to me in my sleep? But the pillar was composed of both the day and the night guiding, for the fire was in the red eye, which at the thought got a new fascination for me, till as I looked, the fire divided, and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes, such as Lucy told me of in her momentary mental wandering, when on the cliff the dying sunlight struck the windows of St. Mary's Church. Suddenly, the horror burst upon me that it was thus that Jonathan had seen those awful women growing into reality through the whirling mist in the moonlight, and in my dream I must have fainted, for all became black darkness. The last conscious effort which imagination made was to show me a livid white face bending over me out of the mist. I must be careful of such dreams, for they would unseat one's reason if there were too much of them. I would get Dr. Van Helsing or Dr. Seward to prescribe something for me which would make me sleep, only that I fear to alarm them. Such a dream at the present time would become woven into their fears for me. To-night I shall strive hard to sleep naturally. If I do not, I shall to-morrow night get them to give me a dose of chloral, that cannot hurt me for once, and it will give me a good night's sleep. Last night tired me more than if I had not slept at all. 
Second October, ten p.m. Last night I slept, but did not dream. I must have slept soundly, for I was not waked by Jonathan coming to bed. But the sleep has not refreshed me, for to-day I feel terribly weak and spiritless. I spent all yesterday trying to read, or lying down dozing. In the afternoon Mr. Renfield asked if he might see me. Poor man! He was very gentle, and when I came away he kissed my hand and bade God bless me. Some way it affected me much. I am crying when I think of him. This is a new weakness of which I must be careful. Jonathan would be miserable if he knew I had been crying. He and the others were out till dinner-time, and they all came in tired. I did what I could to brighten them up, and I suppose that the effort did me good, for I forgot how tired I was. After dinner they sent me to bed, and all went off to smoke together, as they said, but I knew that they wanted to tell each other of what had occurred to each during the day. I could see from Jonathan's manner that he had something important to communicate. I was not so sleepy as I should have been, so before they went I asked Dr. Seward to give me a little opiate of some kind, as I had not slept well the night before. He very kindly made me up a sleeping draught, which he gave to me, telling me that it would do me no harm, as it was very mild. I have taken it, and am waiting for sleep, which still keeps aloof. I hope I have not done wrong, for as sleep begins to flirt with me, a new fear comes. That I may have been foolish in thus depriving myself of the power of waking, I might want it. Here comes sleep. Good night. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter Twenty. Read by M. B. Dennis Sayers. Robert Barton. Jonathan Harker's Journal. One October evening i found thomas snelling in his house at bethnal green but unhappily he was not in a condition to remember anything <laughs> the very prospect of beer which my expected coming had opened to him had proved too much and he had begun too early on his expected debauch i learned however from his wife who seemed a decent poor soul that he was only the assistant of smollett who of the two mates was the responsible person so I drove to Walworth, and found Mr. Joseph Smollett at home and in his shirt-sleeves, taking a late tea out of a saucer. He is a decent, intelligent fellow, distinctly a good, reliable type of workman, and with a headpiece of his own. He remembered all about the incident of the boxes, and from a wonderful dog-eared notebook which he produced from some mysterious receptacle about the seat of his trousers, and which had hieroglyphical entries in thick, half-obliterated pencil, he gave me the destinations of the boxes. There were, he said, six in the cartload which he took from Carfax, and left at 197 Chicksand Street, Mile End, Newtown and another six which he deposited at Jamaica Lane, Bermondsey. If, then, the Count meant to scatter these ghastly refuges of his over London, these places were chosen as the first of delivery, so that later he might distribute more fully. The systematic manner in which this was done made me think that he could not mean to confine himself to two sides of London. He was now fixed on the far east of the northern shore, on the east of the southern shore, and on the south. The north and west were surely never meant to be left out of his diabolical scheme, let alone the city itself, and the very heart of fashionable London in the south-west and west. I went back to Smollett, and asked him if he could tell us if any other boxes had been taken from Carfax. He replied, Well, Governor, you've traded me very handsome. I had given him half a sovereign and I'll tell you all I know. I heard a man by the name of Bloxham say four nights ago in the Air and Hounds in Pincher's Alley, as how he and his mate had had a rare dusty job in an old house at Purfleet. I'm thinking that maybe Sam Bloxham could tell you summat. I asked if he could tell me where to find him. I told him that if he could get me the address, 
it would be worth another half-sovereign to him. So he gulped down the rest of his tea and stood up, saying that he was going to begin the search then and there. At the door he stopped and said, Look here, Governor, there ain't no use in me a keeping you here. I may find Sam soon or I mayn't, but anyhow he ain't like to be in a way to tell you much tonight. Sam is a rare one when he starts on the booze. If you can give me an envelope with a stamp on it and put your address on it, I'll find out where Sam is to be found and post it here tonight. But you'd better be up soon after him in the morning. Never mind the booze the night afore. This was all practical. So one of the children went off with a penny to buy an envelope and a sheet of paper, and to keep the change. When she came back, I addressed the envelope and stamped it, and when Smollett had again faithfully promised to post the address when found, I took my way to home. We are on the track, anyhow. I am tired tonight, and I want to sleep. Mina is fast asleep, and looks a little too pale. Her eyes look as though she had been crying. Poor dear, I've no doubt it frets her to be kept in the dark, and it may make her doubly anxious about me and the others. But it is best as it is. It is better to be disappointed and worried in such a way now than to have her nerve broken. The doctors were quite right to insist on her being kept out of this dreadful business. I must be firm for on me this particular burden of silence must rest. I shall not ever enter on the subject with her under any circumstances. Indeed, it may not be a hard task, after all, for she herself has become reticent on the subject, and has not spoken of the Count or his doings ever since we told her of our decision. 2 October, Evening A long and trying and exciting day. By the first post I got my directed envelope, with a dirty scrap of paper enclosed, on which was written with a carpenter's pencil in a sprawling hand, Sam Bloxham, Corcoran's, Four Potters Court, Bartle Street, Warworth, ask for the depite. I got the letter in bed, and rose without waking Mina. She looked heavy and sleepy and pale, and far from well. I determined not to wake her, but that when I should return from this new search I would arrange for her going back to Exeter. I think she would be happier in her own home, with her daily tasks to interest her, than in being here, amongst us, and in ignorance. I only saw Dr. Seward for a moment, and told him where I was off to, promising to come back and tell the rest so soon as I should have found out anything. I drove to Warworth and found, with some difficulty, Potter's Court. Mr. Smollett's spelling misled me, as I asked for Potter's Court instead of Potter's Court. However, when I had found the court, I had no difficulty in discovering Corcoran's lodging-house. When I asked the man who came to the door for the depite, he shook his head and said, I don't know him. There ain't no such a person here. I never heard of him in all my bloomin' days. Don't believe there ain't nobody of that kind livin' here or anywheres. I took out Smollett's letter, and as I read it, it seemed to me that the lesson of the spelling of the name of the court might guide me. What are you? I asked. I'm the deputy, he answered. I saw at once that I was on the right track. Phonetic spelling had again misled me. A half-crown tip put the deputy's knowledge at my disposal, and I learned that Mr. Bloxham, who had slept off the remains of his beer on the previous night at Corcoran's, had left for his work at Poplar at five o'clock that morning. He would not tell me where the place of work was situated, but I had a vague idea that it was some kind of no-fangled warus, and with this slender clue I had to start for Poplar. It was twelve o'clock before I got any satisfactory hint of such a building, and this I got at a coffee-shop, where some workmen were having their dinner. One of them suggested that there was being erected at Cross Angel Street a new cold storage building, and as this suited the condition of a new-fangled warehouse, I at once drove to it. An interview with a surly gatekeeper and a surlier foreman, both of whom were appeased with the coin of the realm, put me on the track of Bloxham. 
He was sent for on my suggestion that I was willing to pay his day's wages to his foreman for the privilege of asking him a few questions on a private matter. He was a smart enough fellow, though rough of speech and bearing. When I had promised to pay for his information and given him an earnest, he told me that he had made two journeys between Carfax and a house in Piccadilly, and had taken from this house to the latter nine great boxes, main heavy ones, with a horse and cart hired by him for this purpose. I asked him if he could tell me the number of the house in Piccadilly, to which he replied, "'Well, Governor, I forgets the number, but it was only a few doll from a big white church or something of the kind not long built. It was a dusty old house, too, though nothing to the dustiness of the house we took the bloomin' boxes from. How did you get in if both houses were empty?' There was the old party what engaged me and waiting in the house at Purfleet. He helped me to lift the boxes and put them in the dray. Curse me, he was the strongest trap I ever struck, and him a old feller, with a white moustache, one that thin you would think he couldn't throw a shatter. How this phrase thrilled through me. Why, he took up his end of the boxes like there was pounds of tea and me a puffin' and a blowin' afore I could up and by any anyhow, and I'm no chicken neither. How did you get into the house at Piccadilly? I asked. He was there too. He must have started off and got there for me, for when I rung of the bell he came and opened the door hisself and helped me carry the boxes into the hall. The whole nine? I asked. Yes, there was five in the first load and four in the second. It was main dry work, and I'd don't so well remember how I got home. I interrupted him. Were the boxes left in the hall? Yes, it was a big hall, and there was nothing else in it. I made one more attempt to further matters. You didn't have any key? Never used no key nor nothing. The old gent, he opened the door hisself and shut it again when I drove off. I don't remember the last time, but that was the beer. And you can't remember the number of the house? No, sir, but you didn't have no difficulty about that. It's a high un with a stone front with a bow on it, and I steps up to the door. I know them steps haven't had to carry the boxes up with three loafers what come around to earn a copper. The old gent gave em shillings, and they, seeing they got so much, they wanted more. But he took one of them by the shoulder and was like to throw em down the steps till the lot of them went away cussing. I thought with this description I could find the house. So, having paid my friend for his information, started off for Piccadilly. I had gained a new painful experience. The Count could, it was evident, handle the earth boxes himself. If so, time was precious, for now that he had achieved a certain amount of distribution, he could, by choosing his own time, complete the task unobserved. At Piccadilly Circus I discharged my cab and walked westward. Beyond the junior constitutional I came across the house described, and was satisfied that this was the next of the layers arranged by Dracula. The house looked as though it had been long untenanted. The windows were encrusted with dust, and the shutters were up. All the framework was black with time, and from the iron the paint had mostly scaled away. It was evident that up to lately there had been a large notice-board in front of the balcony. It had, however, been roughly torn away, the uprights which had supported it still remaining. Behind the rails of the balcony I saw that there were some loose boards whose raw edges looked white. I would have given a good deal to have been able to see the notice-board intact, as it would, perhaps, have given some clue to the ownership of the house. I remembered my experience of the investigation and purchase of Carfax, and I could not but feel that if I could find the former owner there might be some means discovered of gaining access to the house. There was, at present, nothing to be learned from the Piccadilly side, and nothing could be done, so I went around to the back to see if anything could be gathered from this quarter. The mews were active, the Piccadilly houses being mostly in occupation. I asked one or two of the grooms and helpers whom I saw around if they could tell me anything about the empty house. One of them said, 
that he had heard it had lately been taken, but he couldn't say from whom. He told me, however, that up to very lately there had been a notice-board of for sale up, and that perhaps Mitchell, Sons, and Candy, the house-agents, could tell me something, as he thought he remembered seeing the name of that firm on the board. I did not wish to seem too eager, or to let my informant know or guess too much, so thanking him in the usual manner, I strolled away. It was now growing dusk, and the autumn night was closing in, so I did not lose any time. Having learned the address of Mitchell, Sons, and Candy, from a directory at the Barclay, I was soon at their office in Sackville Street. The gentleman who saw me was particularly suave in manner, but uncommunicative in equal proportion. Having once told me that the Piccadilly house, which throughout our interview he called a mansion, was sold, he considered my business as concluded. When I asked who had purchased it, he opened his eyes a thought wider, and paused a few seconds before replying, "'It is sold, sir. Pardon me,' I said with equal politeness, "'but I have a special reason for wishing to know who purchased it.' Again he paused longer, and raised his eyebrows still more. "'It is sold, sir,' was again his laconic reply. "'Surely,' I said, "'you do not mind letting me know so much?' "'But I do mind,' he answered. "'The affairs of their clients are absolutely safe "'in the hands of Mitchell, Sons, and Candy.' "'This was manifestly a prig of the first water, "'and there was no use arguing with him. "'I thought I had best meet him on his own ground, "'so I said, "'Your clients, sir, are happy in having so resolute a guardian of their confidence. I am myself a professional man. Here I handed him my card. In this instance I am not prompted by curiosity. I act on the part of Lord Godalming, who wishes to know something of the property which was, he understood, lately for sale. These words put a different complexion on affairs. He said, "'I would like to oblige you, if I could, Mr. Harker, "'and especially would I like to oblige his lordship. "'We once carried out a small matter of renting some chambers for him "'when he was the Honourable Arthur Homewood. "'If you will let me have his lordship's address, "'I will consult the house on the subject, "'and will, in any case, communicate with his lordship by tonight's post. "'It will be a pleasure if we can so far deviate from our rules "'as to give the required information to his lordship. "'I wanted to secure a friend and not to make an enemy, "'so I thanked him, gave the address at Dr. Seward's, and came away. "'It was now dark, and I was tired and hungry. "'I got a cup of tea at the aerated bread company, "'and came down to Purfleet by the next train.' I found all the others at home. Mina was looking tired and pale, but she made a gallant effort to be bright and cheerful. It wrung my heart to think that I had had to keep anything from her, and so caused her inquietude. Thank God this will be the last night of her looking on at our conferences and feeling the sting of our not showing our confidence. It took all my courage to hold to the wise resolution of keeping her out of our grim task. She seems somehow more reconciled, or else the very subject seems to have become repugnant to her, for when any accidental allusion is made she actually shudders. I am glad we made our resolution in time, as with such a feeling as this our growing knowledge would be torture to her. I could not tell the others of the day's discovery till we were alone, so after dinner, followed by a little music to save appearances, even amongst ourselves, I took Mina to her room and left her to go to bed. The dear girl was more affectionate with me than ever, and clung to me as though she would detain me, but there was much to be talked of, and I came away. Thank God the ceasing of telling things has made no difference between us. When I came down again, I found the others all gathered round the fire in the study. In the train I had written my diary so far, 
and simply read it off to them as the best means of letting them get abreast of my own information. When I had finished, Van Helsing said, This has been a great day's work, friend Jonathan. Doubtless we are on the track of the missing boxes. If we find them all in that house, then our work is near the end, but if there be something missing, we must search until we find them. Then shall we make our final coup, and hunt the wretch to his real death. We all sat a while, and all at once Mr. Morris spoke. Say, how are we going to get into that house? We got into the other, answered Lord Godalming quickly. But, Art, this is different. We broke house at Carfax, but we had night in a walled park to protect us. It will be a mighty different thing to commit burglary in Piccadilly, either by day or night. I confess I don't see how we are going to get in unless that agency duck can find us a key of some sort. Lord Godalming's brows contracted, and he stood up and walked about the room. By and by he stopped and said, turning from one to another of us, Quincy's head is level. This burglary business is getting serious. We got off once all right, but we now have a rare job on hand, unless we can find the Count's key basket. As nothing could well be done before morning, and as it would be at least advisable to wait till Lord Godalming should hear from Mitchell's, we decided not to take any active step before breakfast time. For a good while we sat and smoked, discussing the matter in its various lights and bearings. I took the opportunity of bringing this diary right up to the moment. I am very sleepy and shall go to bed. Just a line. Mina sleeps soundly, and her breathing is regular. Her forehead is puckered up into little wrinkles, as though she thinks even in her sleep. She is still too pale, but she does not look so haggard as she did this morning. Tomorrow will, I hope, mend all this. She will be herself at home in Exeter. Oh, but I am sleepy. Dr. Seward's Diary 1. October. I am puzzled afresh about Renfield. His moods change so rapidly that I find it difficult to keep touch of them, and as they always mean something more than his own well-being, they form a more than interesting study. This morning, when I went to see him after his repulse of Van Helsing, his manner was that of a man commanding destiny. He was, in fact, commanding destiny subjectively. He did not really care for any of the things of mere earth. He was in the clouds, and looked down on all the weaknesses and wants of us poor mortals. I thought I would improve the occasion and learn something, so I asked him, what about the flies these times? He smiled on me in quite a superior sort of way, such a smile as would have become the face of Malvolio, as he answered me. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic faculties. The ancients did well when they typified the soul as a butterfly. I thought I would push his analogy to its utmost logically, so I said quickly, Oh, so it is a soul you are after now, is it? His madness foiled his reason, and a puzzled look spread over his face as, shaking his head, with a decision which I had but seldom seen in him. He said, Oh, no, no, oh, no, I want no souls. Life is all I want. Here he brightened up. I am pretty indifferent about it at present. Life is all right. I have all I want. You must get a new patient, doctor, if you wish to study zoophagy. This puzzled me a little, so I drew him on. Then you command life. You are a god, I suppose? He smiled with an ineffably benign superiority. Oh, no, far be it from me to arrogate to myself the attributes of the deity. I am not even concerned in his especially spiritual doings. 
if I may state my intellectual position, I am, so far as concerns things purely terrestrial, somewhat in the position which Enoch occupied spiritually. This was a poser to me. I could not, at the moment, recall Enoch's appositeness, so I had to ask a simple question, though I felt that by doing so I was lowering myself in the eyes of the lunatic. And why with Enoch? Because he walked with God. I could not see the analogy, but did not like to admit it, so I harked back to what he had denied. So, you don't care about life, and you don't want souls. Why not? I put my question quickly and somewhat sternly, on purpose to disconcert him. The effort succeeded. For an instant he unconsciously relapsed into his old servile manner, bent low before me, and actually fawned upon me as he replied, I don't want any souls, indeed. Indeed, I don't. I couldn't use them if I had them. They would be no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them, or... He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face, like a wind sweeps on the surface of the water. And, Doctor, as to life, what is it after all? When you've got all you require, and you know that you will never want, that is all. I have friends, good friends, like you, Dr. Seward. This was said with a leer of inexpressible cunning. I know that I shall never lack the means of life. I think that through the cloudiness of his insanity he saw some antagonism in me, for he at once fell back on the last refuge of such as he, a dogged silence. After a short time, I saw that, for the present, it was useless to speak to him. He was sulky, and so I came away. Later in the day, he sent for me. Ordinarily, I would not have gone without special reason, but just at present, I am so interested in him that I would gladly make an effort. Besides, I am glad to have anything to help pass the time. Harker is out, following up clues, and so are Lord Galdaming and Quincy. Van Helsing sits in my study, poring over the record prepared by the Harkers. He seems to think that by accurate knowledge of all details, he will light up on some clue. He does not wish to be disturbed in the work without cause. I would have taken him with me to see the patient, only I thought that after his last repulse he might not care to go again. There was also another reason. Renfield might not speak so freely before a third person as when he and I were alone. I found him sitting in the middle of the floor on his stool, a pose which is generally indicative of some mental energy on his part. When I came in, he said at once, as though the question had been waiting on his lips, What about souls? It was evident, then, that my surmise had been correct. Unconscious cerebration was doing its work, even with the lunatic. I determined to have the matter out. What about them yourself? I asked. He did not reply for a moment, but looked all around him, and up and down, as though he expected to find some inspiration for an answer. I don't want any souls, he said in a feeble, apologetic way. The matter seemed preying on his mind, and so I determined to use it, to be cruel only to be kind. So I said, you like life, and you want life? Oh, yes, but that is all right. You needn't worry about that. But, I asked, how are we to get the life without getting the soul also. This seemed to puzzle him, so I followed it up. A nice time you'll have some time when you're flying out here, with the souls of thousands of flies and spiders and birds and cats buzzing and twittering and moaning all around you. 
you've got their lives, you know, and you must put up with their souls. Something seemed to affect his imagination, for he put his fingers to his ears and shut his eyes, screwing them up tightly just as a small boy does when his face is being soaped. There was something pathetic in it that touched me. It also gave me a lesson, for it seemed that before me was a child. Only a child, though the features were worn and the stubble on the jaws was white. It was evident that he was undergoing some process of mental disturbance, and knowing how his past moods had interpreted things seemingly foreign to himself, I thought that I would enter into his mind as well as I could, and go with him. The first step was to restore confidence, so I asked him, speaking pretty loud so that he would hear me through his closed ears, would you like some sugar to get your flies around again? He seemed to wake up all at once, and shook his head. With a laugh he replied, Not much. Flies are poor things, after all. After a pause he added, But I don't want their souls buzzing round me all the same. Or spiders, I went on. Blow, spiders! What's the use of spiders? There isn't anything in them to eat, or... He stopped suddenly, as though reminded of a forbidden topic. So, so, I thought to myself, this is the second time he has suddenly stopped at the word drink. What does it mean? Renfield seemed himself aware of having made a lapse, for he hurried on as though to distract my attention from it. I don't take any stock at all in such matters. Rats and mice and such small deer, as Shakespeare has it, chicken feed of the larder, they might be called. I'm past all that sort of nonsense. You might as well ask a man to eat molecules with a pair of chopsticks as to try to interest me about the less carnivora when I know of what is before me. I see, I said. You want big things that you can make your teeth meet in. How would you like to breakfast on an elephant? What ridiculous nonsense you are talking! He was getting too wide awake, so I thought I would press him hard. I wonder, I said reflectively, what an elephant's soul is like. The effect I desired was obtained, for he at once fell from his high horse and became a child again. I don't want an elephant's soul or any soul at all, he said. For a few moments he sat despondently. Suddenly he jumped to his feet, with his eyes blazing and all the signs of intense cerebral excitement. To hell with you and your souls, he shouted. Why do you plague me about souls? Haven't I got enough to worry and pain to distract me already without thinking of souls? He looked so hostile that I thought he was in for another homicidal fit, so I blew my whistle. The instant, however, that I did so, he became calm and said apologetically, Forgive me, doctor. I forgot myself. You do not need any help. I am so worried in my mind that I am apt to be irritable. If you only knew the problem I have to face, and that I am working out, you would pity and tolerate and pardon me. Pray do not put me in a straight waistcoat. I want to think, and I cannot think freely when my body is confined. I am sure you will understand. He had, evidently, self-control, so when the attendants came, I told them not to mind, and they withdrew. Renfield watched them go. When the door was closed, he said with considerable dignity and sweetness, Dr. Seward, you have been very considerate towards me. Believe me that I am very, very grateful to you. I thought it well to leave him in this mood, and so I came away. There is certainly something to ponder over in this man's state, 
several points seem to make what the American interviewer calls a story, if one could only get them in proper order. Here they are. Will not mention drinking. Fears the thought of being burdened with the soul of anything. Has no dread of wanting life in the future. Despises the meaner forms of life altogether, though he dreads being haunted by their souls. Logically, all these things point one way. He has assurance of some kind that he will acquire some higher life. He dreads the consequence, the burden of a soul. Then it is a human life he looks to. And the assurance? Merciful God, the Count has been to him, and there is some new scheme of terror afoot. Later, I went after my round to Van Helsing, and told him my suspicion. He grew very grave, and after thinking the matter over for a while, asked me to take him to Renfield. I did so. As we came to the door, we heard the lunatic within, singing gaily, as he used to do, in the time which now seems so long ago. When we entered, we saw with amazement that he had spread out his sugar as of old. The flies, lethargic with the autumn, were beginning to buzz into the room. We tried to make him talk of the subject of our previous conversation, but he would not attend. He went on with his singing, just as though we had not been present. He had got a scrap of paper, and was folding it into a notebook. We had to come away, as ignorant as we went in. His is a curious case indeed. We must watch him tonight. Letter Mitchell, Sons, and Candy to Lord Godalming 1 October My Lord, we are at all times only too happy to meet your wishes. We beg with regard to the desire of your lordship expressed by Mr. Harker on your behalf to supply the following information concerning the sale and purchase of number 347 Piccadilly. The original vendors are the executors of the late Mr. Archibald Winter Suffield. The purchaser is a foreign nobleman, Count de Ville, who effected the purchase himself, paying the purchase money in notes over the counter, if your lordship will pardon us using so vulgar an expression. Beyond this, we know nothing whatever of him. We are, my lord, your lordship's humble servants, Mitchell, Sons, and Candy. Dr. Seward's Diary 2 October I placed a man in the corridor last night, and told him to make an accurate note of any sound he might hear from Renfield's room, and gave him instructions that if there should be anything strange, he was to call me. After dinner, when we had all gathered round the fire in the study, Mrs. Harker having gone to bed, we discussed the attempts and discoveries of the day. Harker was the only one who had any result, and we are in great hopes that his clue may be an important one. Before going to bed, I went round to the patient's room and looked in through the observation trap. He was sleeping soundly. His heart rose and fell with regular respiration. This morning, the man on duty reported to me that, a little after midnight, he was restless and kept saying his prayers somewhat loudly. I asked him if that was all. He replied that it was all he heard. There was something about his manner so suspicious that I asked him point-blank if he had been asleep. He denied sleep, but admitted to having dozed for a while. It is too bad that men cannot be trusted unless they are watched. Today Harker is out following up his clue, and Art and Quincy are looking after horses. Godalming thinks it will be well to have horses always in readiness, for when we get the information which we seek, there will be no time to lose. We must sterilize all the imported earth between sunrise and sunset. We shall thus catch the Count at his weakest, 
and without a refuge to fly to. Van Helsing is off to the British Museum, looking up some authorities on ancient medicine. The old physicians took account of things which their followers do not accept, and the professor is searching for witch and demon cures which may be useful to us later. I sometimes think we must all be mad, and that we shall wake to sanity in straight waistcoats. Later. We have met again. We seem at last to be on the track, and our work of tomorrow may be the beginning of the end. I wonder if Renfield's quiet has anything to do with this. His moods have so followed the doings of the Count, that the coming destruction of the monster may be carried to him some subtle way. If we could only get some hint as to what passed in his mind between the time of my argument with him to-day and his resumption of fly-catching, it might afford us a valuable clue. He is now seemingly quiet for a spell. <coughs> is he? That wild yell seemed to come from his room. The attendant came bursting into my room and told me that Renfield had somehow met with an accident. He had heard him yell, and when he went to him, found him lying on his face on the floor, all covered with blood. I must go at once. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter Twenty One. Read by Dennis Sayers. Dr. Seward's Diary. Three October. Let me put down with exactness all that happened, as well as I can remember, since last I made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness I must proceed. When I came to Renfield's room, I found him lying on the floor on his left side, in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him, it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. There seemed none of the unity of purpose between the parts of the body which marks even lethargic sanity. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood originated. The attendant who was kneeling beside the body said to me as we turned him over, I think, sir, his back is broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralyzed. How such a thing could have happened puzzled the attendant beyond measure. He seemed quite bewildered, and his brows were gathered in as he said, I can't understand the two things. He could mark his face like that by beating his own head on the floor. I saw a young woman do it once at the Eversfield Asylum, before anyone could lay hands on her, and I suppose he might have broken his neck by falling out of bed if he got in an awkward link. But for the life of me, I can't imagine how the two things occurred. If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head, and if his head was like that before the fall out of bed, there would be marks of it. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing, and ask him to kindly come here at once. I want him without an instant's delay. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor, in his dressing-gown and slippers, appeared. When he saw Renfield on the ground, he looked keenly at him a moment, and then turned to me. I think he recognized my thought in my eyes, for he said very quietly, manifestly for the ears of the attendant, Ah, 
a sad accident. He will need very careful watching and much attention. I shall stay with you myself, but I shall first dress myself. If you will remain, I shall in a few minutes join you. The patient was now breathing stertorously, and it was easy to see that he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary celerity, bearing with him a surgical case. He had evidently been thinking, and had his mind made up, for almost before he looked at the patient, he whispered to me, "'Send the attendant away. We must be alone with him.' when he becomes conscious, after the operation. I said, I think that you will do now, Simmons. We have done all that we can at present. You had better go to your rounds, and Dr. Van Helsing will operate. Let me know instantly if there be anything unusual anywhere. The man withdrew, and we went into a strict examination of the patient. The wounds of the face were superficial. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull, extending right up through the motor area. The professor thought a moment and said, We must reduce the pressure and get back to normal conditions as far as can be. The rapidity of the suffusion shows the terrible nature of his injury. The whole motor area seems affected. The suffusion of the brain will increase quickly, so we must trephine at once, or it may be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping at the door. I went over and opened it, and found in the corridor without Arthur and Quincy in pajamas and slippers. The former spoke. I heard your man call up Dr. Van Helsing and tell him of an accident, so I woke Quincy, or rather called for him, as he was not asleep. Things are moving too quickly and too strangely for sound sleep for any of us these times. I've been thinking that tomorrow night we'll not see things as they have been. We'll have to look back and forward a little more than we have done. May we come in? I nodded and held the door open till they entered, then I closed it again. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient, and noted the horrible pool on the floor, he said softly, My God, what happened to him? Poor, poor devil. I told him briefly, and added that we expected he would recover consciousness after the operation, for a short time at all events. He went at once and sat down on the edge of the bed, with Gadalmin beside him. We all watched in patience. "'We shall wait,' said Van Helsing, "'just long enough to fix the best spot for trephining, "'so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood-clot, "'for it is evident that the hemorrhage is increasing.' The minutes during which we waited passed with fearful slowness. I had a horrible sinking in my heart, and from Van Helsing's face I gathered that he felt some fear or apprehension as to what was to come. I dreaded the words Renfield might speak. I was positively afraid to think. But the conviction of what was coming was on me, as I have read of men who have heard the death watch. The poor man's breathing came in uncertain gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, but then would follow a long, stertorous breath, and he would relapse into a more fixed insensibility. Inured as I was to sick beds and death, this suspense grew and grew upon me. I could almost hear the beating of my own heart, and the blood surging through my temples sounded like blows from a hammer. The silence finally became agonizing. I looked at my companions, one after another, and saw from their flushed faces and damp brows that they were enduring equal torture. There was a nervous suspense over us all, as though overhead 
some dread bell would peal out powerfully when we should least expect it. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed on mine. His face was sternly set as he spoke. There is no time to lose. His words may be worth many lives. I have been thinking so as I stood here. It may be there is a soul at stake. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word, he made the operation. For a few moments, the breathing continued to be stertorous. Then there came a breath so prolonged that it seemed as though it would tear open his chest. Suddenly, his eyes opened and became fixed in a wild, helpless stare. This was continued for a few moments. Then it was softened into a glad surprise, and from his lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively, and as he did so said, I'll be quiet, doctor. Tell them to take off the straight waistcoat. I have had a terrible dream, and it has left me so weak that I cannot move. What's wrong with my face? It feels all swollen, and it smarts dreadfully. He tried to turn his head, but even with the effort his eyes seemed to grow glassy again, so I gently put it back. Then Van Helsing said in a quiet, grave voice, Tell us your dream, Mr. Renfield. As he heard the voice, his face brightened through its mutilation, and he said, That is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is of you to be here. Give me some water. My lips are dry, and I shall try to tell you. I dreamed. He stopped and seemed fainting. I called quietly to Quincy. The brandy. It is in my study. Quick. He flew and returned with the glass, the decanter of brandy, and a carafe of water. We moistened the parched lips, and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor, injured brain had been working in the interval, for when he was quite conscious, he looked at me piercingly with an agonized confusion, which I shall never forget, and said, I must not deceive myself. It was no dream, but all a grim reality. Then his eyes roved round the room, as they caught sight of two figures sitting patiently on the edge of the bed, he went on, If I were not sure already, I would know from them. For an instant his eyes closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntarily, as though he were bringing all his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said, hurriedly and with more energy than he had yet displayed. Quick, doctor, quick, I'm dying. I feel that I have but a few minutes, and then I must go back to death. Or worse, wet my lips with brandy again. I have something that I must say before I die, or before my poor crushed brain dies, anyhow. Ugh, thank you. It was that night, after you left me, when I implored you to let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for I felt my tongue was tied. But I was as sane then, except in that way, as I am now. I was in an agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Then there came a sudden peace to me. My brain seemed to become cool again and I realized where I was. I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As he spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked, but his hand came out and met mine, and gripped it hard. He did not, however, betray himself. He nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Renfield proceeded. He came up to the window in the mist, as I had seen him often before, but 
he was solid then, not a ghost, and his eyes were fierce like a man's when angry. He was laughing with his red mouth. The sharp white teeth glinted in the moonlight when he turned to look back over the belt of trees to where the dogs were barking. I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to, just as he had wanted all along. Then he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? By making them happen, just as he used to send in the flies when the sun was shining, great big fat ones with steel and sapphire on their wings, and big moths in the night with skull and crossbones on their backs. Van Helsing nodded to him as he whispered to me unconsciously, the Acheronchia Atropos of the Sphinges, what you call the death's head moth. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, Rats, 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 hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one a life, and dogs to eat them, and cats too, all lives, all red blood, with years of life in it, and not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, for I wanted to see what he could do. Then the dogs howled away beyond the dark trees in his house. He beckoned me to the window. I got up and looked out, and he raised his hands, and seemed to call out, without using any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming on like the shape of a flame of fire, and then he moved the mist to the right and left, and I could see that there were thousands of rats, with their eyes blazing red, like his, only smaller. He held up his hand, and they all stopped, and I thought he seemed to be saying, All these lives will I give you, I and many more and greater, through countless ages, if you will fall down and worship me. And then a red cloud, like the color of blood, seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash and saying to him, Come in, Lord and Master. The rats were all gone, but he slid into the room through the sash, though it was only open an inch wide, just as the moon herself has often come in through the tiniest crack, and has stood before me in all her size and splendor. His voice was weaker, so I moistened his lips with the brandy again, and he continued, but it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in the interval for his story was further advanced. I was about to call him back to the point, but Van Helsing whispered to me, Let him go on. Do not interrupt him. He cannot go back, and maybe could not proceed at all if once he lost the thread of his thought. He proceeded. All day I waited to hear from him, but he did not send me anything, not even a blowfly, and when the moon got up, I was pretty angry with him. When he did slide in through the window, though it was shut, and did not even knock, I got mad with him. He sneered at me, and his white face looked out of the mist with his red eyes gleaming, and he went on as though he owned the whole place, and I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he went by me. I couldn't hold him. I thought that, somehow, Mrs. Harker had come into the room. The two men sitting on the bed stood up and came over, standing behind him, so that he could not see them, but where they could hear better. They were both silent, but the professor started and quivered. 
His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on without noticing. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like the tea, after the teapot has been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word. He went on. I didn't know that she was here till she spoke, and she didn't look the same. I don't care for the pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and hers all seemed to have run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered as I did, but we remained otherwise still. So when he came to-night I was ready for him. I saw the mist stealing in, and I grabbed it tight. I had heard that madmen have unnatural strength, and as I knew I was a madman, at times anyhow, I resolved to use my power. I, and he felt it too, for he had to come out of the mist to struggle with me. I held tight, and I thought I was going to win, for I didn't mean him to take any more of her life, till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me, and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter, and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We know the worst now, he said. He is here, and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Let us be armed, the same as we were the other night. But lose no time. There is not an instant to spare. There was no need to put our fear, nay, our conviction, into words. We shared them in common. We all hurried and took from our rooms the same things that we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met in the corridor, he pointed to them significantly as he said, They may never leave me, and they shall not, till this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friends. It is no common enemy that we deal with, alas. Alas, that dear Madame Mina should suffer. He stopped. His voice was breaking, and I do not know if rage or terror predominated in my own heart. Outside the Harker's door we paused. Art and Quincy held back, and the latter said, Should we disturb her? We must, said Van Helsing grimly. If the door be locked, I shall break it in. May it not frighten her terribly? is unusual to break into a lady's room. Van Helsing said solemnly, You are always right, but this is life and death. All chambers are alike to the doctor. And even were they not, they are all as one to me tonight. Friend John, when I turn the handle, if the door does not open, do you put your shoulder down and shove? And you too, my friends, now. He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash it burst open, and we almost fell headlong into the room. The professor did actually fall, and I saw across him as he gathered himself up from hands and knees. What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to 
stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed, beside the window, lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed, facing outward, was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her stood a tall, thin man, clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw, we all recognized the Count, in every way, even to the scar on his forehead. With his left hand he held both Mrs. Harker's hands, keeping them away with her arms at full tension. His right hand gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare chest, which was shown by his torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible resemblance to a child forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk, to compel it to drink. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered at the edge, and the white sharp teeth behind the full lips of the blood-dripping mouth clamped together like those of a wild beast, with a wrench which threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height, he turned and sprang at us. But by this time the professor had gained his feet, and was holding towards him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count suddenly stopped, just as poor Lucy had done outside the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further back he cowered, as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed, as a great black cloud sailed across the sky, and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapour. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, which, with the recoil from its bursting open, had swung back to its old position. Van Helsing, Art, and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath, and with it had given a scream so wild, so ear-piercing, so despairing, that it seems to me now that it will ring in my ears till my dying day. For a few seconds she lay in her helpless attitude and disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror. Then she put before her face her poor crushed hands, which bore on their whiteness the red mark of the Count's terrible grip, and from behind them came a low, desolate wail which made the terrible scream seem only the quick expression of an endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the coverlet gently over her body, whilst Art, after looking at her face for an instant despairingly, ran out of the room. Van Helsing whispered to me, Jonathan is in a stupor, such as we know the vampire can produce. We can do nothing with poor Madame Mina for a few moments till she recovers herself. I must wake him. He dipped the end of a towel in cold water, and with it began to flick him on the face, his wife all the while holding her face behind her hands and sobbing in a way that was heart-breaking to hear. 
I raised the blind and looked out of the window. There was much moonshine, and as I looked I could see Quincy Morris run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew-tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this. But at the instant I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness, and turned to the bed. On his face, as there might well be, was a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, and then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once, and he started up. His wife was aroused by the quick movement, and turned to him with her arms stretched out, as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them in again, and putting her elbows together, held her hands before her face, and shuddered till the bed beneath her shook. "'In God's name, what does this mean?' Harker cried out. "'Dr. Seward, Dr. Van Helsing, what is it? What has happened? What is wrong? Mina, dear, what is it? What does that blood mean? My God, my God, has it come to this?' and raising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together. Good God, help us! Help her! Oh, help her! With a quick movement, he jumped from bed, and began to pull on his clothes, all the man in him awake at the need for instant exertion. What has happened? Tell me all about it, he cried without pausing. Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina, I know. Oh, do something to save her. It cannot have gone too far yet. Guard her while I look for him. His wife, through her terror and horror and distress, saw some sure danger to him. Instantly forgetting her own grief, she seized hold of him and cried out, No, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me. I have suffered enough to-night. God knows, without the dread of his harming you. You must stay with me, stay with these friends who will watch over you. Her expression became frantic as she spoke, and he yielding to her, she pulled him down sitting on the bedside, and clung to him fiercely. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them both. The professor held up his golden crucifix, and said with wonderful calmness, do not fear, my dear. We are here, and whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for to-night, and we must be calm, and take counsel together. She shuddered and was silent, holding down her head on her husband's breast. When she raised it, his white night-robe was stained with blood where her lips had touched, and where the thin open wound in the neck had sent forth drops. The instant she saw it, she drew back, with a low wail, and whispered, amidst choking sobs, Unclean, <laughs> unclean, I must touch him or kiss him no more. Oh, that it should be that it is I who am now his worst enemy, and whom he may have most cause to fear. To this he spoke out resolutely. Nonsense, Mina. It is a shame to me to hear such a word. I would not hear it of you, and I shall not hear it from you. May God judge me by my deserts, and punish me with more bitter suffering than even this hour, if by any act or will of mine, anything, ever, come between us. He put out his arms and folded her to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked at us over her bowed head, with eyes that blinked damply above his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set as steel. After a while her sobs became less frequent and more faint, and then he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness 
which I felt tried his nervous power to the utmost. And now, Dr. Seward, tell me all about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all that has been. I told him exactly what had happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness, but his nostrils twitched, and his eyes blazed as I told how the ruthless hands of the Count had held his wife in that terrible and horrid position, with her mouth to the open wound in his breast. It interested me even at that moment to see that whilst the face of white set passion worked convulsively over the bowed head, the hands tenderly and lovingly stroked the ruffled hair. Just as I had finished, Quincy and Godalming knocked at the door. They entered in obedience to our summons. Van Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understood him to mean, if we were to take advantage of their coming, to divert, if possible, the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each other, and from themselves. So, on nodding acquiescence to him, he asked them what they had seen or done, to which Lord Galdamin answered, I could not see him anywhere in the passage, or in any of our rooms. I looked in the study, but though he had been there, he had gone. He had, however, he stopped suddenly, looking at the poor drooping figure on the bed. Van Helsing said gravely, Go on, friend Arthur. We want here no more concealments. Our hope now is in knowing all. Tell freely. So Art went on. He had been there, and though it could only have been for a few seconds, he made rare hay of the place. All the manuscript had been burned, and the blue flames were flickering amongst the white ashes. The cylinders of your phonograph, too, were thrown on the fire, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. Thank God there is the other copy in the safe. His face lit for a moment, but fell again as he went on. I ran downstairs then, but could see no sign of him. I looked into Renfield's room, but there was no trace there, except... Again he paused. Go on, said Harker hoarsely. So he bowed his head, and moistening his lips with his tongue, added, Except that the poor fellow is dead. Mrs. Harker raised her head, looking from one to the other of us. She said solemnly, God's will be done. I could not but feel that Art was keeping back something. But as I took it, that it was with a purpose, I said nothing. Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, And you, friend Quincy, have you any to tell? A little, he answered. It may be much eventually, but at present I can't say. I thought it well to know, if possible, where the Count would go when he left the house. I did not see him, but I saw a bat rise from Renfield's window and flap westward. I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfax, but he evidently sought some other lair. He will not be back to-night, for the sky is reddening in the east, and the dawn is close. We must work to-morrow. He said the latter through his shut teeth. For a space of perhaps a couple of minutes there was silence, and I could fancy that I could hear the sounds of our hearts beating. Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, And now, Madam Mina, poor dear, dear Madam Mina, tell us exactly what happened. God knows that I do not want that you be pained, but it is need that we know all. For now more than ever has all work to be done quick and sharp, and in deadly earnest. The day is close to us that must end all, if it may be so. 
and now is the chance that we may live and learn. The poor dear lady shivered, and I could see the tension of her nerves as she clasped her husband closer to her, and bent her head lower and lower still on his breast. Then she raised her head proudly, and held out one hand to Van Helsing, who took it in his, and after stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked in that of her husband, who held his other arm thrown round her protectingly. After a pause in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she began. I took the sleeping draught which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time it did not act. I seemed to have become more wakeful, and myriads of horrible fancies began to crowd in upon my mind, all of them connected with death and vampires, with blood and pain and trouble. Her husband involuntarily groaned as she turned to him and said lovingly, Do not fret, dear. You must be brave and strong, and help me through this horrible task, if you only knew what an effort it is to me to tell of this fearful thing at all, you would understand how much I need your help. Well, I saw I must try to help the medicine to its work with my will, if it was to do me any good, so I resolutely set myself to sleep. Sure enough, sleep must soon have come to me, for I remember no more. Jonathan coming in had not waked me, for he lay by my side when next I remember. There was in the room the same thin white mist that I had noticed before, but I forgot now, if you know of this. You will find it in my diary, which I shall show you later. I felt the same vague terror which had come to me before, and the same sense of some presence. I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly that it seemed as if it was he who had taken the sleeping draught, and not I. I tried, but I could not wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around terrified. Then, indeed, my heart sank within me, beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, or rather as if the mist had turned into his figure, for it had entirely disappeared, stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once from the description of the others, the waxen face, the high, aquiline nose, on which the light fell in a thin white line, the parted red lips, with the sharp white teeth showing between, and the red eyes that I had seemed to see in the sunset on the windows of St. Mary's Church at Whitby. I knew, too, the red scar on his forehead, where Jonathan had struck him, for an instant my heart stood still, and I would have screamed out, only that I was paralyzed. In the pause he spoke in a sort of keen, cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. Silence. If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eyes. I was appalled and was too bewildered to do or say anything. With a mocking smile he placed one hand upon my shoulder, and, holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so, First, a little refreshment to reward my exertions, you may as well be quiet. It is not the first time, or the second, that your veins have appeased my thirst. I was bewildered, and strangely enough I, I did not want to hinder him. 
I suppose it is a part of the horrible curse that such is when his touch is on his victim. And, oh, my God, my God, pity me. He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hand harder and looked at him pityingly as if he were the injured one and went on. I felt my strength fading away, and I was in a half swoon. How long this horrible thing lasted, I know not. But it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away. I saw it drip with the fresh blood. The remembrance seemed for a while to overpower her, and she drooped and would have sunk down, but for her husband's sustaining arm. With a great effort she recovered herself and went on. Then he spoke to me mockingly, and so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my design. You know now, and they know in part already, and will know in full. Before long, what it is to cross my path. They should have kept their energies for use closer to home. Whilst they played wits against me, against me who commanded nations, and intrigued for them, and fought for them hundreds of years before they were born, I was countermining them. And you, their best beloved one, are now to me flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, kin of my kin, my bountiful wine-press for a while, and shall be later on my companion and my helper. You shall be avenged in turn, for not one of them shall minister to your needs. But as yet you are not to be punished for what you have done. You have aided in thwarting me. Now you shall come to my call. When my brain says come to you, you shall cross land or sea to do my bidding. And to that end, this. With that, he pulled open his shirt, and with his long, sharp nails, opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt out, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound, so that I must either suffocate or swallow some to the... Oh, my God! Oh, my God! What have I done? What have I done to deserve such a fate? I, who have tried to walk in meekness, and righteousness all my days. God, pity me. Look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril, and in mercy pity those to whom she is dear. Then she began to rub her lips 
as though to cleanse them from pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken, and everything became more and more clear. Harker was still and quiet, but over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a gray look which deepened and deepened in the morning light till when the first red streak of the coming dawn shot up, the flesh stood darkly out against the whitening hair. We have arranged that one of us is to stay within call of the unhappy pair, till we can meet together and arrange about taking action. Of this I am sure, the sun rises today on no more miserable house in all the great round of its daily course. End of chapter 21《Chapter 22 of Dracula》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Dracula by Bram Stoker — Chapter 22 — Read by — M.B. — Jonathan Harker's Journal — 3. October — As I must do something or go mad. I write this diary. It is now six o'clock, and we are to meet in the study in half an hour and take something to eat, for Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward are agreed that if we do not eat we cannot work our best. Our best will be, God knows, required today. I must keep writing at every chance, for I dare not stop to think. All, big and little, must go down. Perhaps at the end the little things may teach us most. The teaching, big or little, could not have landed Mina or me anywhere worse than we are today. However, we must trust and hope. Poor Mina told me just now, with the tears running down her dear cheeks, that it is in trouble and trial that our faith is tested, that we must keep on trusting, and that God will aid us up to the end. The end! Oh, my God! What end? To work! To work! When Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward had come back from seeing Paul Renfield, we went gravely into what was to be done. First, Dr. Seward told us that when he and Dr. Van Helsing had gone down to the room below, they had found Renfield lying on the floor, all in a heap. His face was all bruised and crushed in, and the bones of the neck were broken. Dr. Seward asked the attendant who was on duty in the passage if he had heard anything. He said that he had been sitting down, he confessed to half dozing, when he heard loud voices in the room, and that Renfield had called out loudly several times, God! 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 After that there was a sound of falling, and when he entered the room he found him lying on the floor, face down, just as the doctors had seen him. Van Helsing asked if he had heard voices, or a voice, and he said he could not say. That at first it had seemed to him as if there were two, but as there was no one in the room, it could have only been one. He could swear to it, if required, that the word God was spoken by the patient. Dr. Seward said to us, when we were alone, that he did not wish to go into the matter. The question of an inquest had to be considered, and it would never do to put forward the truth, as no one would believe it. As it was, he thought, that on the attendant's evidence he could give a certificate of death by misadventure in falling from the bed. 
in case the coroner should demand it there would be a formal inquest necessarily to the same result when the question began to be discussed as to what should be our next step the very first thing we decided was that mina should be in full confidence that nothing of any sort no matter how painful should be kept from her she herself agreed as to its wisdom and it was painful to see her so brave and yet so sorrowful and in such a depth of despair there must be no concealment she said alas we have too much already and besides there is nothing in all the world that can give me more pain than i have already endured than i suffer now whatever may happen it must be of new hope or new courage to me van helsing was looking at her fixedly as she spoke and said suddenly but quietly but dear madam mina are you not afraid not for yourself, but for others from yourself, after what has happened. Her face grew set in its lines, but her eyes shone with the devotion of a martyr as she answered, Ah, no, for my mind is made up. To what? he asked gently, whilst we were all very still, for each in our own way we had a sort of vague idea of what she meant. Her answer came with direct simplicity, as though she was simply stating a fact. Because if I find in myself, and I shall watch keenly for it, a sign of harm to any that I love, I shall die. You would not kill yourself? he asked hoarsely. I would, if there were no friend who loved me, who would save me such a pain, and so desperate an effort. She looked at him meaningly as she spoke. He was sitting down, but now he rose and came close to her and put his hand on her head as he said solemnly, My child, there is such an one, if it were for your good. For myself I could hold it in my account with God to find such an euthanasia for you, even at this moment if it were best. Nay, were it safe. But my child, for a moment he seemed choked and a great sob rose in his throat. He gulped it down, and went on, There are some here who would stand between you and death. You must not die. You must not die by any hand, but least of all your own. Unlike the other who has fouled your sweet life, is true dead. You must not die. For if he is still with the quick undead, your death would make you even as he is. No, you must live. You must struggle and strive to live, though death would seem a boon unspeakable. You must fight death himself, though he come to you in pain or in joy. By the day or the night, in safety or in peril, on your living soul I charge you that you not die. Nay, nor think of death till this great evil be past. The poor dear grew white as death and shook and shivered, as I have seen a quicksand shake and shiver at the incoming of the tide. We were all silent. We could do nothing. At length she grew more calm, and turning to him said sweetly, but oh so sorrowfully, as she held out her hand, I promise you, my dear friend, that if God will let me live, I shall strive to do so, till, if it may be in his good time, this horror may have passed away from me. She was so good and brave that we all felt that our hearts were strengthened to work and endure for her, and we began to discuss what we were to do. I told her that she was to have all the papers in the safe and all the papers or diaries and phonographs we might hereafter use, and was to keep the record as she had done before. She was pleased with the prospect of anything to do if pleased could be used in connection with so grim an interest. As usual, Van Helsing had thought ahead of everyone else, and was prepared with an exact ordering of our work. It is perhaps well, he said, that at our meeting, after our visit to Carfax, we decided not to do anything with the earth boxes that lay there. Had we done so, 
the count must have guessed our purpose and would doubtless have taken measures in advance to frustrate such an effort with regard to the others but now he does not know our intentions nay more in all probability he does not know that such a power exists to us as can sterilize his lairs so that he cannot use them as of old we are now so much further advanced in our knowledge as to their disposition that when we have examined the house in piccadilly we may track the very last of them to-day then is ours and in it rests our hope the sun that rose on our sorrow this morning guards us in its course until it sets to-night that monster must retain whatever form he now has he is confined within the limitations of his earthly envelope he cannot melt into thin air nor disappear through cracks or chinks or crannies if he go through a doorway he must open the door like a mortal and so we have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them so we shall if we have not yet catch him and destroy him drive him to bay in some place where the catching and destroying shall be in time sure here i started up for i could not contain myself at the thought that the minutes and seconds so preciously laden with mina's life and happiness were flying from us since whilst we talked action was impossible but van helsing held up his hand warningly nay friend jonathan he said in this the quickest way home is the longest way so your proverbs say we shall act and act with desperate quick when the time has come but think in all probable the key of the situation is that house in piccadilly the count may have many houses which he has bought of them he will have deeds of purchase keys and other things he will have paper that he write on he will have his book of checks there are many belongings that he must have somewhere why not in this place so central so quiet where he come and go by the front or the back at all hours when in the very vast of the traffic there is none to notice we shall go there and search that house and when we learn what it holds then we do what our friend arthur call in his phrases of hunt stop the earths and so we run down our old fox so is it not then let us come at once i cried we are wasting the precious precious time the professor did not move but simply said and how are we going to get into that house in piccadilly anyway i cried we shall break in if need be and your police where will they be and what will they say i was staggered but i knew that if he wished to delay he had a good reason for it so i said as quietly as i could don't wait more than need be you know i am sure what torture i am in ah my child that i do and indeed there is no wish of me to add to your anguish but just think what can we do until all the world be at movement then will come our time i have thought and thought and it seems to me that the simplest way is the best of all now we wish to get into the house but we have no key is it not so i nodded now suppose that you were in truth the owner of that house and could not still get in and think there was to you no conscience of the housebreaker what would you do i should get a respectable locksmith and set him to work to pick the lock for me and your police they would interfere would they not oh no not if they knew the man was properly employed then he looked at me keenly as he spoke all that is in doubt is the conscience of the employer and the belief of your policeman as to whether or not that employer has a good conscience or a bad one your police must indeed be zealous men and clever oh so clever in reading the heart that they trouble themselves in such matter no no my friend jonathan you go take the lock off a hundred empty houses in this your london 
or of any city in the world and if you do it as such things are rightly done and at the time such things are rightly done no one will interfere i have read of a gentleman who owned a so fine house in london and when he went for months of summer to switzerland and lock up his house some burglar come and broke window at back and got in then he went and made open the shutters in front and walk out and in through the door before the very eyes of the police then he have an auction in that house and advertise it and put up big notice and when the day come he sell off by a great auctioneer all the goods of that other man who owned them then he go to a builder and he sell him that house making an agreement that he pull it down and take all away within a certain time and your police and other authority help him all they can and when that owner come back from his holiday in switzerland he finds only an empty hole where his house had been this was all done en règle and in our work we shall be en règle too we shall not go so early that the policemen who have then little to think of shall deem it strange but we shall go after ten o'clock when there are many about and such things would be done were we indeed owners of the house i could not but see how right he was and the terrible despair of mina's face became relaxed in the thought there was hope in such good counsel van helsing went on when once within that house we may find more clues at any rate some of us can remain there whilst the rest find the places where there be more earth boxes at bermondsey and mile end lord godalming stood up i can be of some use here he said i shall wire to my people to have horses and carriages where they will be most convenient look here old fellow said morris it is a capital idea to have all ready in case we want to go horsebacking but don't you think that one of your snappy carriages with its heraldic adornments in a byway of walworth or mile end would attract too much attention for our purpose it seems to me that we ought to take cabs when we go south or east and even leave them somewhere near the neighbourhood we are going to friend quincy is right said the professor his head is what you call in plain with the horizon it is a difficult thing that we go to do and we do not want no peoples to watch us if so it may mina took a growing interest in everything and i was rejoiced to see that the exigency of affairs was helping her to forget for a time the terrible experience of the night she was very very pale almost ghastly and so thin that her lips were drawn away showing her teeth in somewhat of prominence i did not mention this last lest it should give her needless pain but it made my blood run cold in my veins to think of what had occurred with poor lucy when the count had sucked her blood and yet there was no sign in the teeth growing sharper but the time as yet was short and there was time for fear when we came to the discussion of the sequence of our events and of the disposition of our forces there were new sources of doubt it was finally agreed that before starting for piccadilly we should destroy the count's lair close at hand in case he should find it out too soon we should thus be still ahead of him in our work of destruction and his presence in his purely material shape and at his weakest might give us some new clue as to the disposal of forces it was suggested by the professor that after our visit to carfax we should all enter the house in piccadilly that the two doctors and i should remain there whilst lord godalming and quincey found the lairs at warworth and mile end and destroyed them it was possible if not likely the professor urged that the count might appear in piccadilly during the day and that if so we might be able to cope with him then and there at any rate we might be able to follow him in force to this plan i strenuously objected and so far as my going was concerned for i said that i intended to stay and protect mina i thought that my mind was made up on the subject but mina would not listen to my objection she said that there might be some law matter in which i could be useful that amongst the count's papers might be some clue 
which I could understand out of my experience in Transylvania, and that, as it was, all the strength we could muster was required to cope with the Count's extraordinary power. I had to give in, for Mina's resolution was fixed. She said that it was the last hope for her that we should all work together. As for me, she said, I have no fear. Things have been as bad as they can be, and whatever may happen must have in it some element of hope or comfort. Go, my husband. God can, if he wishes it, guard me as well alone as with any one present. So I started up, crying out, Then in God's name let us come at once, for we are losing time. The Count may come to Piccadilly earlier than we think. Not so, said Van Helsing, holding up his hand. But why, I asked, do you forget, he said, with actually a smile, that last night he banqueted heavily and will sleep late? Did I forget? Shall I ever, can I ever, can any of us ever forget that terrible scene? Mina struggled hard to keep her brave countenance, but the pain overmastered her and she put her hands before her face and shuddered whilst she moaned. Van Helsing had not intended to recall her frightful experience. He had simply lost sight of her and her part in the affair in his intellectual effort. When it struck him what he had said, he was horrified at his thoughtlessness and tried to comfort her. "'Oh, Madame Mina,' he said, "'dear, dear Madame Mina, alas, that I of all who so reverence you should have said anything so forgetful. These stupid old lips of mine and this stupid old head do not deserve so, but you will forget it, will you not?' He bent low beside her as he spoke. She took his hand, and looking at him through her tears, said hoarsely, No, I shall not forget, for it is well that I remember, and with it I have so much in memory of you that is sweet that I take it all together. Now you must all be going. Breakfast is ready, and we must all eat that we may be strong. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. We tried to be cheerful and encourage each other, and Mina was the brightest and most cheerful of us. When it was over, Van Helsing stood up and said, Now, my dear friends, we must go forth to our terrible enterprise. Are we all armed as we were on that night when first we visited our enemy's lair, armed against ghostly as well as carnal attack? We all assured him. Then it is well. Now, Madame Mina, you are in any case quite safe here until the sunset, and before then we shall return, if— We shall return, but before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. I have myself, since you came down, prepared your chamber by the placing of things of which we know, so that he may not enter. Now let me guard yourself. On your forehead I touch this piece of sacred wafer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and— There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear. As he had placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared it. It had burned into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. My poor darling's brain had told her the significance of the fact as quickly as her nerves received the pain of it, and the two so overwhelmed her that her overwrought nature had its voice in that dreadful scream. But the words to her thought came quickly. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring on the air when there came the reaction, and she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement, pulling her beautiful hair over her face as the leper of old his mantle, she wailed out, Unclean! unclean even the almighty shuns my polluted flesh i must bear this mark of shame upon my forehead until the judgment day they all paused i had thrown myself beside her in the agony of helpless grief and putting my arms around her held her tight for a few minutes our sorrowful hearts beat together whilst the friends around us turned away their eyes that ran tears silently 
Then Van Helsing turned and said gravely, so gravely that I could not help feeling that he was in some way inspired and was stating things outside himself. It may be that you may have to bear that mark till God himself sees fit, as he most surely shall, on the judgment day, to redress all the wrongs of his earth and of his children that he placed thereon. And, oh, Madam Mina, my dear, my dear, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar, the sign of God's knowledge of what has been, shall pass away and leave your forehead so pure as the heart we know. For, so surely as we live, that scar shall pass away when God sees right to lift his burden that is hard upon us. Till then we bear our cross, as his Son did in obedience to his will. It may be that we are chosen instruments of his good pleasure, and that we ascend to his bidding as that other through stripes and shame, through tears and blood, through doubts and fear, and all that makes the difference between God and man. There was hope in his words, and comfort, and they made for resignation. Mina and I both felt so, and simultaneously we took each of the old man's hands, and bent over and kissed it. Then, without a word, we all knelt down together, and all holding hands swore to be true to each other. We men pledged ourselves to raise the veil of sorrow from the head of her whom, each in his own way, we loved and we prayed for help and guidance in the terrible task which lay before us. It was then time to start, so I said farewell to Mina, a parting which neither of us shall forget to our dying day, and we set out. To one thing I have made up my mind. If we find out that Mina must be a vampire in the end, then she shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I suppose it is thus that in old times one vampire meant many, just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth, so the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for their ghastly ranks. We entered Carfax without trouble, and found all things the same as on the first occasion. It was hard to believe that amongst so prosaic surroundings of neglect and dust and decay there was any ground for such fear as already we knew. Had not our minds been made up, and had there not been terrible memories to spur us on, we could hardly have proceeded with our task. We found no papers, or any sign of use in the house, and in the old chapel the great boxes looked just as we had seen them last. Dr. Van Helsing said to us solemnly as we stood before him, And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilize this earth, so sacred of holy memories, that he has brought from a far distant land for such fell use. He has chosen this earth because it has been holy. Thus we defeat him with his own weapon, for we make it more holy still. It was sanctified to such use of man. Now we sanctify it to God. As he spoke, he took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown open. The earth smelled musty and close, but we did not somehow seem to mind, for our attention was concentrated on the professor. Taking from his box a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it reverently on the earth, and then, shutting down the lid, began to screw it home, we aiding him as he worked. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them to all appearance. But in each was a portion of the host. When we closed the door behind us, the professor said solemnly, So much is already done. It may be that with all the others we can be so successful. Then the sunset of this evening may shine of Madame Mina's forehead, all white as ivory and with no stain. As we passed along the lawn on our way to the station to catch our train, we could see the front of the asylum. I looked eagerly, and in the window of my own room saw Mina. I waved my hand to her, and nodded to tell that our work there was successfully accomplished. She nodded in reply, to show that she understood. 
The last I saw, she was waving her hand in farewell. It was with a heavy heart that we sought the station and just caught the train, which was steaming in as we reached the platform. I have written this in the train. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. Just before we reached Fenchurch Street, Lord Godalming said to me, Quincy and I will find a locksmith. You had better not come with us in case there should be any difficulty, for under the circumstances it wouldn't seem so bad for us to break into an empty house. But you are a solicitor, and the Incorporated Law Society might tell you that you should have known better. I demurred as to my not sharing any danger, even of odium, but he went on, besides it will attract less attention if there are too many of us. My title will make it all right with the locksmith, and with any policeman that may come along. You had better go with Jack and the professor, and stay in the green park, somewhere in sight of the house, and when you see the door opened, and the smith has gone away, do you all come across. We shall be on the lookout for you, and shall let you in. The advice is good, said Van Helsing, so we said no more. Godalming and Morris hurried off in a cab, we following in another. At the corner of Arlington Street, our contingent got out and strolled into the green park. My heart beat as I saw the house on which so much of our hope was centred, looming up grim and silent in its deserted condition amongst its more lively and spruce-looking neighbours. We sat down on a bench within good view, and began to smoke cigars so as to attract as little attention as possible. The minutes seemed to pass with leaden feet as we waited for the coming of the others. At length we saw a four-wheeler drive up. Out of it, in leisurely fashion, got Lord Godalming and Morris, and down from the box descended a thick-set working man with his rush-woven basket of tools. Morris paid the cabman, who touched his hat and drove away. Together the two ascended the steps, and Lord Godalming pointed out what he wanted done. The workman took off his coat leisurely and hung it on one of the spikes of the rail, saying something to a policeman, who just then sauntered along. The policeman nodded acquiescence, and the man kneeling down placed his bag beside him. After searching through it, he took out a selection of tools which he proceeded to lay beside him in orderly fashion. Then he stood up, looked in the keyhole, blew into it, and turning to his employers, made some remark. Lord Godalming smiled, and the man lifted a good-sized bunch of keys. Selecting one of them, he began to probe the lock, as if feeling his way with it. After fumbling for a bit, he tried a second and then a third. All at once the door opened under a slight push from him and he and the two others entered the hall. We sat still. My own cigar burnt furiously, but Van Helsing's went cold altogether. We waited patiently as we saw the workman come out and bring his bag. Then he held the door partly open, steadying it with his knees, whilst he fitted a key to the lock. This he finally handed to Lord Godalming, who took out his purse and gave him something. The man touched his hat, took his bag, put on his coat, and departed. Not a soul took the slightest notice of the whole transaction. When the man had fairly gone, we three crossed the street and knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by Quincy Morris, beside whom stood Lord Godalming lighting a cigar. "'The place smells so vilely," said the latter as we came in. It did indeed smell vilely like the old chapel at Carfax, and with our previous experience it was plain to us that the Count had been using the place pretty freely. We moved to explore the house, all keeping together in case of attack, for we knew we had a strong and wily enemy to deal with, and as yet we did not know whether the Count might not be in the house. In the dining-room, which lay at the back of the hall, we found eight boxes of earth, eight boxes only out of the nine which we sought. Our work was not over, and would never be, 
until we should have found the missing box. First we opened the shutters of the window, which looked out across a narrow stone-flagged yard at the blank face of a stable, pointed to look like the front of a miniature horse. There were no windows in it, so we were not afraid of being overlooked. We did not lose any time in examining the chests. With the tools which we had brought with us we opened them, one by one, and treated them as we had treated those others in the old chapel. It was evident to us that the Count was not at present in the house, and we proceeded to search for any of his effects. After a cursory glance at the rest of the rooms, from basement to attic, we came to the conclusion that the dining-room contained any effects which might belong to the Count. And so we proceeded to minutely examine them. They lay in a sort of orderly disorder on the great dining-room table. There were the deeds of the Piccadilly house in a great bundle, deeds of the purchase of the houses at Mile End and Bermondsey, newspaper, envelopes, and pens and ink. All were covered up in thin wrapping paper to keep them from the dust. There were also a clothes brush, a brush and comb, and a jug and basin, the latter containing dirty water which was reddened as if with blood. Last of all was a heap of keys of all sorts and sizes, probably those belonging to the other houses. When we had examined this last find, Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris, taking accurate notes of the various addresses of the houses in the east and the south, took with them the keys in a great bunch, and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. The rest of us are, with what patience we can, waiting their return, or the coming of the Count. End of chapter 22《Chapter 23 of Dracula》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Dracula》by Bram Stoker《Chapter 23 Read by Dennis Sayers M.B. Dr. Seward's Diary 3 October the time seemed terribly long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Godalming and Quincy Morris. The professor tried to keep our minds active by using them all the time. I could see his beneficent purpose by the side glances which he threw from time to time at Harker. The poor fellow is overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night he was a frank, happy-looking man, with strong youthful face, full of energy, and with dark brown hair. Today he is a drawn, haggard old man, whose white hair matches well with the hollow burning eyes and grief-written lines of his face. His energy is still intact. In fact, he is like a living flame. This may yet be his salvation, for if all go well it may tide him over the despairing period. He will then, in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow! I thought my own trouble was bad enough, but his. The professor knows this well enough, and is doing his best to keep his mind active. What he has been saying was, under the circumstances, of absorbing interest. So well as I can remember, here it is. I have studied over and over again since they came into my hands all the papers relating to this monster, and the more I have studied, the greater seems the necessity to utterly stamp him out. All through there are signs of his advance, not only of his power, but of his knowledge of it, as I learn from the researches of my friend Arminius of Budapest. He was in life a most wonderful man, soldier, statesman, and alchemist, which latter was the highest development of the science knowledge of his time. He had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. 
he dared even to attend the scholomance, and there was no branch of knowledge of his time that he did not essay. Well, in him the brain power survived the physical death, although it would seem that memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind he has been, and is, only a child. But he is growing, and some things that were childish at first are now of man's stature. He is experimenting, and doing it well. And if it had not been that we have crossed his path, he would be yet, and he may be yet if we fail, the father or furtherer of a new order of beings, whose road must lead through death, not life. Harker groaned and said, And this is all arrayed against my darling. But how is he experimenting? The knowledge may help us to defeat him. He has all along, since his coming, been trying his power, slowly but surely. That big child brain of his is working. Well, for us it is as yet a child brain. For had he dared, at the first, to attempt certain things, he would long ago have been beyond our power. However, he means to succeed, and a man who has centuries before him can afford to wait, and to go slow. Festina lente may well be his motto. I fail to understand, said Harker wearily. Oh, do be more plain to me. Perhaps grief and trouble are dulling my brain. The professor laid his hand tenderly on his shoulder as he spoke. Ah, my child, I will be plain. Do you not see how, of late, this monster has been creeping into knowledge experimentally? How he has been making use of the zoophagus patient to effect his entry into friend John's home? For your vampire, though in all afterwards he can come when and how he will, must at the first make entry only when asked thereto by an inmate. But these are not his important experiments. Do we not see how, at the first, all those great boxes were moved by others? He knew not then, but that must be so. But all the time that so great child-brain of his was growing, and he began to consider whether he might not himself move the box, so he began to help. And then, when he found that this be all right, he tried to move them all alone. And so he progressed, and he scattered those graves of him, and none but he know where they are hidden. He may have intend to bury them deep in the ground, so that only he use them in the night, or at such time as he can change his form. They do him equal well, and none may know these are his hiding-place. But, my child, do not despair. This knowledge came to him just too late. Already all of his lairs but one be sterilized as for him and before the sunset this shall be so. Then he had no place where he can move and hide. I delayed this morning so that we might be sure. Is there not more at stake for us than for him? Then why not be more careful than him? By my clock it is one hour, and already, if all be well, friend Arthur and Quincy are on their way to us. Today is our day, and we must go sure, if slow, and lose no chance. See, there are five of us when those absent ones return. Whilst we were speaking, we were startled by a knock at the hall door, the double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. We all moved out to the hall with one impulse, and Van Helsing, holding up his hand to us to keep silence, stepped to the door and opened it. The boy handed in a dispatch. The professor closed the door again, and after looking at the direction, opened it and read aloud. Look out for D. 
he has just now. 12.45 come from Carfax hurriedly, and hastened towards the south. He seems to be going the round, and may want to see you. Mina. There was a pause, broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. Van Helsing turned to him quickly, and said, God will act in his own way in time. Do not fear, and do not rejoice as yet, for what we wish for at the moment may be our own undoings. I care for nothing now, he answered hotly, except to wipe out this brute from the face of creation. I would sell my soul to do it. Oh, hush, hush, my child, said Van Helsing. God does not purchase souls in this wise, and the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. But God is merciful and just, and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madam Mina. Think you how her pain would be doubled did she but hear your wild words. Do not fear any of us. We are all devoted to this cause, and to-day shall see the end. The time is coming for action. Today this vampire is limit to the powers of man, and till sunset he may not change. It will take him time to arrive here. See, it is twenty minutes past one, and there are yet some times before he can hither come, be he never so quick. What we must hope for is that my Lord Arthur and Quincy arrive first. After half an hour, after we had received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet, resolute knock at the hall door. It was just an ordinary knock, such as is given hourly by thousands of gentlemen, but it made the professor's heart and mine beat loudly. We looked at each other, and together moved out into the hall. We each held ready to use our various armaments, the spiritual in the left hand, the mortal in the right. Van Helsing pulled back the latch, and holding the door half open, stood back, having both hands ready for action. The gladness of our hearts must have shone upon our faces, when on the step, close to the door, we saw Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris. They came quickly in and closed the door behind them, the former saying, as they moved along the hall, "'It is all right. We found both places, six boxes in each, and we destroyed them all.' "'Destroyed?' asked the professor. "'For him. We were silent for a minute, and then Quincy said, "'There's nothing to do but to wait here. "'If, however, he doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we must start off, "'for it won't do to leave Mrs. Harker alone after sunset. "'He will be here before long now,' said Van Helsing, "'who had been consulting his pocket-book. "'Nota bene.' In Madam's telegram, he went south from Carfax. That means he went to cross the river, and he could only do so at slack of tide, which should be something before one o'clock. That he went south has a meaning for us. He is at yet only suspicious, and he went from Carfax first to the place where he would suspect interference least. You must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him. That he is not here already shows that he went to Mile End next. This took him some time, for he would then have to be carried over the river in some way. Believe me, my friends, we shall not have long to wait now. We should have ready some plan of attack, so that we may throw away no chance. Hush! There is no time now. Have all your arms. Be ready. He held up a warning hand as he spoke, for we all could hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. I could not but admire, even at such a moment, the way in which a dominant spirit asserted itself. In all our hunting parties and adventures in different parts of the world, Quincy Morris had always been the one to arrange the plan of action, and Arthur and I had been accustomed to obey him implicitly. Now 
the old habit seemed to be renewed instinctively. With a swift glance around the room, he at once laid out our plan of attack, and without speaking a word, with a gesture, placed us each in position. Van Helsing, Harker, and I were just behind the door, so that when it was opened, the professor could guard it, whilst we two stepped between the incomer and the door. Godalming and Quincy, in front, stood just out of sight, ready to move in front of the window. We waited, in a suspense that made the seconds pass with nightmare slowness. The slow, careful steps came along the hall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least, he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leaped into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who, with a quick movement, threw himself before the door, leading into the room in the front of the house. As the Count saw us, a horrible sort of snarl passed over his face, showing the eye-teeth long and pointed, but the evil smile as quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain. His expression again changed, as, with a single impulse, we all advanced upon him. It was a pity that we had not some better organized plan of attack, for even at the moment I wondered what we were to do. I did not myself know whether our lethal weapons would avail us anything. Harker evidently meant to try the matter, for he had ready his great cookery knife, and made a fierce and sudden cut at him. The blow was a powerful one. Only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him. A second less, and the trenchant blade had shorn through his heart. As it was, the point just cut the cloth of his coat, making a wide gap whence a bundle of banknotes and a stream of gold fell out. The expression of the Count's face was so hellish that for a moment I feared for Harker, though I saw him throw the terrible knife aloft again for another stroke. Instinctively I moved forward with a protective impulse, holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand. I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise that I saw the monster cower back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each of us. It would be impossible to describe the expression of hate and baffled malignity, of anger and hellish rage, which came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Harker's arm, ere his blow could fall, and grasping a handful of the money from the floor, dashed across the room, threw himself at the window. Amid the crash and glitter of the falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. Through the sound of the shivering glass I could hear the ting of the gold as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging. We ran over and saw him spring unhurt from the ground. He, rushing up the steps, crossed the flagged yard, and pushed open the stable door. There he turned and spoke to us. You think you baffle me, you with your pale faces all in a row, like sheep in a butcher's. You shall be sorry yet, each of you. You think you have left me without a place to rest, but... I have more. My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already, and through them you and others shall yet be mine, my creatures, to do my bidding, to be my jackals, when I want to feed. Bah! 
with a contemptuous sneer, he passed quickly through the door, and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. A door beyond opened and shut. The first of us to speak was the professor. Realizing the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved toward the hall. We have learnt something, much. Notwithstanding his brave words, he fears us. He fears time. He fears want. For if not, why he hurry so? His very tone betray him, or my ears deceive. Why take that money? You follow quick. You are hunters of the wild beast, and understand it so. For me, I make sure that nothing here may be of use to him, if so that he returns. As he spoke, he put the money remaining in his pocket, took the title deeds in the bundle as Harker had left them, and swept the remaining things into the open fireplace, where he set fire to them with the match. Godalming and Morris had rushed out into the yard, and Harker had lowered himself from the window to follow the Count. He had, however, bolted the stable door, and by the time they had forced it open, there was no sign of him. Van Helsing and I tried to make inquiry at the back of the house, but the mews was deserted, and no one had seen him depart. It was now late in the afternoon, and sunset was not far off. We had to recognize that our game was up. With heavy hearts we agreed with the professor when he said, Let us go back to Madame Mina. Poor, poor dear Madame Mina. All we can do just now is done, and we can there, at least, protect her. But we need not despair. There is but one more earth box and we must try to find it. When that is done, all may yet be well. I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could to comfort Harker. The poor fellow was quite broken down. Now and again he gave a low groan, which he could not suppress. He was thinking of his wife. With sad hearts we came back to the house where we found Mrs. Harker waiting us, with an appearance of cheerfulness which did honour to her bravery and unselfishness. When she saw our faces, her own became as pale as death. For a second or two, her eyes were closed as if she were in secret prayer. And then she said cheerfully, I can never thank you all enough. Oh, my poor darling! As she spoke, she took her husband's grey head in her hands and kissed it. Lay your poor head here and rest it. All will yet be well, dear. God will protect us, if he so will it, in his good intent. The poor fellow groaned. There was no place for words in his sublime misery. We had a sort of perfunctory supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. It was, perhaps, the mere animal heat of food to hungry people, for none of us had eaten anything since breakfast, or the sense of companionship which may have helped us. But, anyhow, we were all less miserable, and saw the morrow as not altogether without hope. True to our promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed, and although she grew snowy white at times, when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, and read at others when his devotion to her was manifested, she listened bravely and with calmness. When we came to the part where Harker had rushed at the Count so recklessly, she clung to her husband's arm, and held it tight as though her clinging could protect him from any harm that might come. She said nothing, however, till the narration was all done, and matters had been brought up to the present time. Then, without letting go her husband's hand, she stood up amongst us and spoke. Oh, that I could give any idea of the scene, of that sweet, sweet, good, good woman, in all the radiant beauty of her youth and animation, with the red scar on her forehead, of which she was conscious, and which we saw, with grinding of our teeth, 
remembering whence and how it came. Her loving kindness against our grim hate, her tender faith against all our fears and doubting, and we, knowing that so far as symbols went, she with all her goodness and purity and faith was outcast from God. Jonathan, she said, and the words sounded like music on her lips. It was so full of love and tenderness. Jonathan, dear, and you all my true, true friends, I want you to bear something in mind through all this dreadful time. I know that you must fight, that you must destroy, even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live for ever. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul, who has wrought all his misery, is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he too is destroyed in his worser part, that his better part may have spiritual immortality. You must be pitiful to him, too, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. As she spoke, I could see her husband's face darken and draw together, as though the passion in him were shriveling his being to its core. Instinctively the clasp of his wife's hand grew closer, till his knuckles looked white. She did not flinch from the pain, which I knew she must have suffered, but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever. As he stopped speaking, he leaped to his feet, almost tearing his hand from hers as he spoke. May God give him into my hand just for long enough to destroy that earthly life of him, which we are aiming at. If beyond it I could send his soul for ever and ever to burning hell, I would do it. Oh, hush! Oh, hush in the name of the good God! Don't say such things, Jonathan, my dear husband, or you will crush me with fear and horror. Just think, my dear, I have been thinking all this long, long day of it, that, perhaps, some day, I too may need such pity, and that some other, like you, and with equal cause for anger, may deny it to me. Oh, my husband, my husband, indeed, I would have spared you such a thought, had there been another way. But I pray that God may not have treasured your wild words, except as the heartbroken wail of a very loving and sorely stricken man. Oh, God, let these poor white hairs go in evidence of what he has suffered, who all his life has done no wrong, and on whom so many sorrows have come. We men were all in tears now. There was no resisting them, and we wept openly. She wept, too, to see that her sweet counsels had prevailed. Her husband flung himself on his knees beside her, and putting his arms round her, hid his face in the folds of her dress. Van Helsing beckoned to us, and we stole out of the room, leaving the two loving hearts alone with their God. Before they retired, the professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. She tried to school herself to the belief, and manifestly, for her husband's sake, tried to seem content. It was a brave struggle, and was, I think, and believe, not without its reward. Van Helsing had placed at hand a bell which either of them was to sound in case of any emergency. When they had retired, Quincy, Godalmin, and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. The first watch falls to Quincy, so the rest of us shall be off to bed as soon as we can. Godalming has already turned in, for his is the second watch. Now that my work is done, I, too, shall go to bed. Jonathan Harker's Journal 3 to 4 October, close to midnight. 
I thought yesterday would never end. There was over me a yearning for sleep, in some sort of blind belief that to wake would be to find things changed, and that any change must now be for the better. Before we parted we discussed what our next step was to be, but we could arrive at no result. All we knew was that one earth box remained, and that the Count alone knew where it was. If he chooses to lie hidden he may baffle us for years, and in the meantime the thought is too horrible. I dare not think of it even now. This I know, that if ever there was a woman who was all perfection, that one is my poor wronged darling. I loved her a thousand times more for her sweet pity of last night, a pity that made my own hate of the monster seem despicable. Surely God will not permit the world to be poorer by the loss of such a creature. This is hope to me. We are all drifting reefwards now, and faith is our only anchor. Thank God. Mina is sleeping, and sleeping without dreams. I fear what her dreams might be like, with such terrible memories to ground them in. She has not been so calm within my seeing since the sunset. Then, for a while, there came over her such a repose which was like spring after the blasts of March. I thought at the time that it was the softness of the red sunset on her face, but somehow now I think it has a deeper meaning. I am not sleepy myself, though I am weary, weary to death. However, I must try to sleep, for there is tomorrow to think of, and there is no rest for me until later. I must have fallen asleep, for I was awakened by Mina, who was sitting up in bed, with a startled look on her face. I could see easily, for we did not leave the room in darkness. She had placed a warning hand over my mouth and now she whispered in my ear, "'Hush! There is someone in the corridor.' I got up softly, and, crossing the room, gently opened the door. Just outside, stretched on a mattress, lay Mr. Morris, wide awake. He raised a warning hand for silence as he whispered to me, "'Hush! Go back to bed! It is all right. One of us will be here all night.' We don't mean to take any chances. His look and gesture forbade discussion, so I came back and told Mina. She sighed, and positively a shadow of a smile stole over her poor, pale face as she put her arms round me and said softly, Oh, thank God for good, brave men. With a sigh, she sank back again to sleep. I write this now as I am not sleepy though I must try again. 4. October. Morning. Once again, during the night, I was wakened by Mina. This time we had all had a good sleep, for the grey of the coming dawn was making the windows into sharp oblongs, and the gas flame was like a speck rather than a disk of light. She said to me hurriedly, "'Go, call the professor. I want to see him at once.' Why? I asked. I have an idea. I suppose it must have come in the night, and matured without my knowing it. He must hypnotize me before the dawn, and then I shall be able to speak. Go quick, dearest. The time is getting close. I went to the door. Dr. Seward was resting on the mattress, and, seeing me, he sprang to his feet. Is anything wrong? he asked in alarm. No, I replied, but Mina wants to see Dr. Van Helsing at once. I will go, he said, and hurried into the professor's room. Two or three minutes later, Van Helsing was in the room in his dressing gown, and Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming were with Dr. Seward at the door asking questions. When the professor saw Mina, a smile, a positive smile, ousted the anxiety of his face. He rubbed his hands as he said, "'Oh, my dear Madame Mina, this is indeed a change. See!' 
Friend Jonathan, we have got our dear Madam Mina as of old back to us today. Then, turning to her, he said cheerfully, And what am I to do for you? For at this hour you do not want me for anything. I want you to hypnotize me, she said. Do it before the dawn, for I feel that then I can speak and speak freely. Be quick, for the time is short. Without a word he motioned her to sit up in bed. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her, from over the top of her head, downward, with each hand in turn. Mina gazed at him fixedly for a few minutes, during which my own heart beat like a trip-hammer, for I felt that some crisis was at hand. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sat stock still. Only by the gentle heaving of her bosom could one know that she was alive. The professor made a few more passes, and then stopped, and I could see that his forehead was covered with great beads of perspiration. Mina opened her eyes, but she did not seem the same woman. There was a far-away look in her eyes, and her voice had a sad dreaminess which was new to me. Raising his hand to impose silence, the professor motioned to me to bring the others in. They came on tiptoe, closing the door behind them, and stood at the foot of the bed, looking on. Mina appeared not to see them. The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice speaking in a low, level tone, which would not break the current of her thoughts. Where are you? The answer came in a neutral way. I do not know. Sleep has no place it can call its own. For several minutes there was silence. Mina sat rigid, and the professor stood staring at her fixedly. The rest of us hardly dared to breathe. The room was growing lighter. Without taking his eyes from Mina's face, Dr. Van Helsing motioned to me to pull up the blind. I did so, and the day seemed just upon us. A red streak shot up, and a rosy light seemed to diffuse itself through the room. On the instant the professor spoke again. Where are you now? The answer came dreamily, but with intention. It were as though she were interpreting something. I have heard her use the same tone when reading her shorthand notes. I do not know. It is all strange to me. What can you see? I can see nothing. It is all dark. What do you hear? I could detect the strain in the professor's patient voice. The lapping of water. It is gurgling by, and little waves leap. I can hear them on the outside. Then you are on a ship? We all looked at each other, trying to glean something, each from the other. We were afraid to think. The answer came quick. Oh, yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men stamping overhead as they run about. There is the creaking of a chain, and the loud tinkle as the check of the capstan falls into the ratchet. What are you doing? I am still, oh, so still. It is like death. The voice faded away into a deep breath as of one sleeping, and the open eyes closed again. By this time the sun had risen, and we were all in the full light of day. Dr. Van Helsing placed his hands on Mina's shoulders, and laid her head down softly on her pillow. She lay like a sleeping child for a few moments, and then, with a long sigh, awoke and stared in wonder to see us all around her. "'Have I been talking in my sleep?' was all she said. She seemed, however, to know the situation without telling, though she was eager to know what she had said. 
the professor repeated the conversation, and she said, "'Then there is not a moment to lose. It may not be yet too late.' Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming started for the door, but the professor's calm voice called them back. "'That ship, wherever it was, was weighing anchor at the moment in your so great port of London. Which of them is it that you seek?' God be thanked that we have once again a clue, though whither it may lead us we know not. We have been blind somewhat, blind after the manner of men. Since we can look back we see what we might have been seeing forward, if we had been able to see what we might have seen. Alas, but that sentence is a puddle, is it not? We can know now what was in the Count's mind when he sees that money— though Jonathan's so fierce knife put him in the danger that even he dread. He meant escape. Hear me! Escape! He saw that, with but one earth-box left, and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox, this London was no place for him. He have take his last earth-box on board a ship, and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no! We follow him. Tally-ho, as friend Arthur would say when he put on his red frock. Our old fox is wily, oh, so wily, and we must follow with wile. I, too, am wily, and I think his mind in a little while. In meantime, we may rest and in peace, for there are between us which he do not want to pass, and which he could not if he would unless the ship were to touch the land, and then only at full or slack tide. See, and the sun is just rose, and all day to sunset is us. Let us take bath and dress, and have breakfast, which we all need, and which we can eat comfortably, since he be not in the same land with us. Mina looked at him appealingly as she asked, But why need we seek him further, when he is gone away from us? He took her hand and patted it as he replied, "'Ask me nothing as yet. When we have breakfast, then I answer all questions.' He would say no more, and we separated to dress. After breakfast, Mina repeated her question. He looked at her gravely for a minute, and then said sorrowfully, "'Because, my dear, dear Madam Mina, now more than ever must we find him.' even if we have to follow him to the jaws of hell. She grew paler as she asked faintly, Why? Because, he said solemnly, he can live for centuries, and you are but mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded since once he put that mark upon your throat. I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. End of chapter 23、Chapter、24 of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula. By Bram Stoker, Chapter Twenty Four, read by Robert Smith, M. B. Elizabeth Clett, Dennis Sayers, Doctor Seward's Phonograph Diary, spoken by Van Helsing. This to Jonathan Harker. You are to stay with your dear Madam Mina. We shall go to make our search, if I can call it so, for it is not search but knowing. And we seek confirmation only. But do you stay and take care of her today? This is your best and most holiest office. This day nothing can find him here. Let me tell you that so you will know what we four know already, for I have told them. He, our enemy, have gone away. He have gone back to his castle in Transylvania. I know it so well, as if a great hand of fire wrote it on the wall. He have prepared for this in some way. And that last earth box was ready to ship somewhere. 
For this he took the money, for this he hurry at the last, lest we catch him before the sun go down. It was his last hope, save that he might hide in the tomb that he think poor Miss Lucy, being, as he thought like him, keep open to him. But there was not of time. When that failed, he makes straight for his last resource, his last earthwork, I might say, did I wish double entente. He is clever, oh so clever. He know that his game here was finished, and so he decide he go back home. He find ship going by the route he came, and he go in it. We go off now to find what ship and whither bound. When we have discovered that, we come back and tell you all. Then we will comfort you and poor Madamida with new hope, for it will be hope when you think it over, that all is not lost. This very creature that we pursue, he take hundreds of years to get so far as London, and yet in one day, when we know of the disposal of him, we drive him out. He is finite, though he is powerful to do much harm and suffers not as we do. But we are strong, each in our purpose, and we are all more strong together. Take heart afresh, dear husband of Madame Mina. This battle is but begun, and in the end we shall win, so sure as that God sits on high to watch over his children. Therefore be of much comfort till we return. Van Helsing Jonathan Harker's Journal 4. October When I read to Mina Van Helsing's message in the phonograph, the poor girl brightened up considerably. Already the certainty that the Count is out of the country has given her comfort, and comfort is strength to her. For my own part, now that his horrible danger is not face to face with us, it seems almost impossible to believe in it. Even my own terrible experiences in Castle Dracula seem like a long-forgotten dream. Here, in the crisp autumn air, in the bright sunlight. Alas, how can I disbelieve? In the midst of my thought, my eye fell on the red scar on my poor darling's white forehead. Whilst that lasts, there can be no disbelief. Mina and I fear to be idle, so we have been over all the diaries again and again. Somehow, although the reality seem greater each time, the pain and the fear seem less. There is something of a guiding purpose manifest throughout, which is comforting. Mina says that perhaps we are the instruments of ultimate good. It may be. I shall try to think as she does. We have never spoken to each other yet of the future. It is better to wait till we see the professor and the others after their investigations. The day is running by more quickly than I ever thought a day could run for me again. It is now three o'clock. Mina Harker's Journal 5th October, 5 p.m. Our meeting for report. Present, Professor Van Helsing, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, Mr. Quincy Morris, Jonathan Harker, Mina Harker. Dr. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat and whither bound Count Dracula made his escape. As I knew that he wanted to get back to Transylvania, I felt sure that he must go by the Danube mouth, or by somewhere in the Black Sea, since by that way he come. It was a dreary blank that was before us. Omne ignotum pro magnifico, and so, with heavy hearts, we start to find what ships leave for the Black Sea last night. He was in sailing-ship, since Madame Mina tell of sails being set. These not so important as to go in your list of the shipping in the Times, and so we go, by suggestion of Lord Godalming, to your Lloyd's, where are note of all ships that sail, however so small. There we find that only one black sea-bound ship go out with the tide. She is the Tsarina Catherine, and she sail from Doolittle's Wharf for Varna, and thence to other ports, and up the Danube. So, said I, this is the ship whereon is the Count. So off we go to Doolittle's Wharf, and there we find a man in an office. From him we inquire of the goings of the Tsarina Catherine. He swear much, and he red face and loud of voice, but he good fellow all the same. 
and when Quincy give him something from his pocket, which crackle as he roll it up, and put it in so small a bag which he have hid deep in his clothing, he still better fellow, and humble servant to us. He come with us, and ask many men who are rough and hot. These be better fellows too, when they have been no more thirsty. They say much of blood, and bloom, and of others which I comprehend not, though I guess what they mean. But nevertheless they tell us all things which we want to know. They make known to us among them, how last afternoon at about five o'clock comes a man so hurry, a tall man, thin and pale, with high nose and teeth so white, and eyes that seem to be burning, that he be all in black, except that he have a hat of straw which suit not him all the time, that he scatter his money in making quick inquiry as to what ship sails for the Black Sea, and for where. Some took him to the office, and then to the ship, where he will not go aboard, but halt at shore-end of gangplank, and ask that the captain come to him. The captain come, when told that he will pay well, and though he swear much at the first, he agree to term. Then the thin man go, and some one tell him where horse and cart can be hired. He go there, and soon he come again, himself driving cart, on which a great box. This he himself lift down, though it takes several to put it on truck for the ship. He give much talk to captain as to how and where this box is to be placed. But the captain like it not, and swear at him in many tongues, and tell him that if he like he can come and see where it shall be. But he say no, that he come not yet, for that he have much to do. Whereupon the captain tell him that he had better be quick, with blood, for that his ship will leave the place, of blood, before the turn of the tide, with blood. Then the thin man smile, and say that of course he must go when he think fit, but he will be surprised if he go quite soon. The captain swear again, polyglot, and the thin man make him bow and thank him, and say that he will so far intrude in his kindness as to come aboard before the sailing. Finally the captain, more red than ever, and in more tongues, tell him that he doesn't want no Frenchman with bloom upon them, and also with blood, in his ship, with blood on her also. And so, after asking where he might purchase ship forms, he departed. No one knew where he went, or bloomin' well cared, as they said, for they had something else to think of, well, with blood again, for it soon became apparent to all that the Tsarina Catherine would not sail as was expected. A thin mist began to creep up from the river, and it grew, and grew, till soon a dense fog enveloped the ship and all around her. The captain swore polyglot, very polyglot, polyglot with bloom and blood, but he could do nothing. The water rose and rose, and he began to fear that he would lose the tide altogether. He was in no friendly mood when just at full tide the thin man came up the gangplank again and asked to see where his box had been stowed. Then the captain replied that he wished that he and his box, old and with much bloom and blood, were in hell. But the thin man did not be offend, and went down with the mate and saw where it was placed, and came up and stood a while on deck in fog. He must have come off by himself, for none notice him. Indeed, they thought not of him for soon the fog begin to melt away, and all was clear again. My friends of the thirst and the language that was of bloom and blood laughed, as they told how the captain's swears exceeded even his usual polyglot, and was more than ever full of picturesque, when on questioning other mariners, who were on movement up and down the river that hour, he found that few of them had seen any of fog at all, except where it lay round the wharf. However, the ship went out on the ebb tide, and was doubtless by morning far down the river mouth. She was then, when they told us, well out to sea. And so, my dear Madam Mina, it is that we have to rest for a time, for our enemy is on the sea, with the fog at his command, on his way to the Danube mouth. To sail a ship takes time, go she never so quick, and when we start to go on land more quick, and we will meet him there. Our best hope is to come on him when in the box between sunrise and sunset, for then he can make no struggle, and we may deal with him as we should. There are days for us in which we can make ready our plan. We know all about where he go, for we have seen the owner of the ship, who have shown us invoices and all papers that can be. The box we seek is to be landed in Varna, and to be given to an agent, one Ristix, who will there present his credentials. And so our merchant friend will have done his part. When he asks if there be any wrong, for that so, he can telegraph and have inquiry made at Varna. We say, no, for what is to be done is not for police or of the customs. It must be done by us alone, and in our own way." When Dr. Van Helsing had done speaking, I asked him if he were certain that the Count had remained on board the ship. He replied, "'We have the best proof of that, 
your own evidence, when in the hypnotic trance this morning." I asked him again if it were really necessary that they should pursue the Count. For, oh, I dread Jonathan leaving me, and I know that he would surely go if the others went. He answered in growing passion, at first quietly. As he went on, however, he grew more angry and forceful, till in the end we could not but see wherein was at least some of that personal dominance which made him so long a master amongst men. "'Yes, it is necessary, 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 for your sake in the first, and then for the sake of humanity. This monster has done much harm already, in the narrow scope where he find himself, and in the short time when as yet he was only as a body groping his so small measure in darkness and not knowing. All this have I told these others. You, my dear Madam Mina, will learn it in the phonograph of my friend John, or in that of your husband. I have told them how the measure of leaving his own barren land, barren of peoples, and coming to a new land, where life of man teems till they are like the multitudes of standing corn, was the work of centuries. Were another of the undead, like him, to try to do what he has done, perhaps not all the centuries of the world that have been, or that will be, could aid him. With this one, all the forces of nature that are occult and deep and strong must have worked together in some wondrous way. The very place, where he have been alive, undead, for all these centuries, is full of strangeness of the geologic and chemical world. There are deep caverns and fissures that reach none know whither. There have been volcanoes, some of whose openings still send out waters of strange properties, and gases that kill or make to vivify. Doubtless there is something magnetic or electric in some of these combinations of occult forces which work for physical life in strange way, and in himself were from the first some great qualities. In a hard and warlike time he was celebrate that he have more iron nerve, more subtle brain, more braver heart than any man. In him some vital principle have in strange way found their utmost. And as his body keep strong and grow and thrive, so his brain grow too. All this without that diabolic aid which is surely to him. For it have to yield to the powers that come from, and are symbolic of good. And now this is what he is to us. He have infect you. Oh, forgive me, my dear, that I must say such, but it is for good of you that I speak. He infect you in such wise, that even if he do no more, you have only to live, to live in your own old sweet way, and so in time, death, which is of man's common lot, and with God's sanction, shall make you like to him. This must not be. We have sworn together that it must not. Thus are we ministers of God's own wish. That the world, and men for whom his son die, will not be given over to monsters, whose very existence would defame him. He have allowed us to redeem one soul already, and we go out as the old knights of the cross to redeem more. Like them we shall travel towards the sunrise, and like them, if we fall, we fall in good cause." He paused. And I said, But will not the Count take his rebuff wisely? Since he has been driven from England, will he not avoid it, as a tiger does the village from which he has been hunted? Aha! he said. Your simile of the tiger good, for me, and I shall adopt him. Your man-eater, as they of India call the tiger who has once tasted blood of the human, care no more for the other prey but prowl unceasing till he get him. This that we hunt from our village is a tiger too, a man-eater, and he shall never cease to prowl. Nay, in himself he is not one to retire and stay afar. In his life, his living life, he go over the Turkey frontier and attack his enemy on his own ground. He be beaten back, but did he stay? No, he come again, and again, and again. Look at his persistence and endurance. With the child brain that was to him, he have long since conceived the idea of coming to a great city. What does he do? He find out all the place of the world, most of promise for him. Then he deliberately set himself down to prepare for the task. He find in patience just how is his strength, and what are his powers. He study new tongues. He learn new social life, new environment of old ways, the politics, the law, the finance, the science, the habit of a new land and a new people who have come to be since he was. His glimpse that he have had wet his appetite only, and in keen his desire. Nay, it help him to grow as to his brain. 
for it all proved to him how right he was at the first in his surmises. He hath done this alone, all alone, from a ruined tomb in a forgotten land. What more may he not do when the greater world of thought is open to him? He that can smile at death, as we know him, who can flourish in the midst of diseases that kill off whole peoples? Oh, if such a one was to come from God, and not the devil, what a force for good might not he be in this old world of ours! But we are pledged to set the world free. Our toil must be in silence, and our efforts all in secret. For in this enlightened age, when men believe not even what they see, the doubting of wise men would be his greatest strength. It would be at once his sheath and his armour, and his weapons to destroy us, his enemies, who are willing to peril even our own souls for the safety of one we love, for the good of mankind, and for the honour and glory of God." After a general discussion, it was determined that for to-night nothing be definitely settled, that we should all sleep on the facts, and try to think out the proper conclusions. To-morrow at breakfast we are to meet again and after making our conclusions known to one another, we shall decide on some definite cause of action. I feel a wonderful peace and rest to-night. It is as if some haunting presence were removed from me. Perhaps— My surmise was not finished, could not be, for I caught sight in the mirror of the red mark upon my forehead, and I knew that I was still unclean. Dr. Seward's Diary 5 October We all arose early, and I think that sleep did much for each and all of us. When we met at early breakfast, there was more general cheerfulness than any of us had ever expected to experience again. It is really wonderful how much resilience there is in human nature. Let any obstructing cause, no matter what, be removed in any way, even by death, and we fly back to first principles of hope and enjoyment. More than once, as we sat around the table, my eyes opened in wonder whether the whole of the past days had not been a dream. It was only when I caught sight of the red blotch on Mrs. Harker's forehead that I was brought back to reality. Even now, when I am gravely revolving the matter, it is almost impossible to realize that the cause of all our trouble is still existent. Even Mrs. Harker seems to lose sight of her trouble for whole spells. It is only now and again when something recalls it to her mind that she thinks of her terrible scar. We are to meet here in my study in half an hour and decide on our course of action. I see only one immediate difficulty. I know it by instinct rather than reason. We shall all have to speak frankly and yet I fear that, in some mysterious way, poor Mrs. Harker's tongue is tied. I know that she forms conclusions of her own, and from all that has been, I can guess how brilliant and how true they must be. But she will not, or cannot, give them utterance. I have mentioned this to Van Helsing, and he and I are to talk it over when we are alone. I suppose it is some of that horrid poison, which has got into her veins, beginning to work. The Count had his own purposes when he gave her what Van Helsing called the vampire's baptism of blood. Well, there may be a poison that distills itself out of good things. In an age when the existence of Tomains is a mystery, we should not wonder at anything. One thing I know, that if my instinct be true regarding poor Mrs. Harker's silences, then there is a terrible difficulty, an unknown danger in the work before us. The same power that compels her silence may compel her speech. I dare not think further, for so I should in my thoughts dishonor a noble woman. Later, when the professor came in, we talked over the state of things. I could see that he had something on his mind, which he wanted to say, but felt some hesitancy about broaching the subject. After beating about the bush a little, he said, Friend John, there is something that you and I must talk of alone. 
just at the first at any rate later we may have to take the others into our confidence then he stopped so i waited he went on madam mina our poor dear madam mina is changing a cold shiver ran through me to find my worst fears thus endorsed van helsing continued with the sad experience of miss lucy we must this time be warned before things go too far our task is now in reality more difficult than ever and this new trouble makes every hour of the direst importance i can see the characteristics of the vampire coming in her face it is now but very very slight but it is to be seen if we have eyes to notice without prejudge her teeth are sharper and at times her eyes are more hard but these are not all there is heard the silence now often as so it was with miss lucy she did not speak even when she wrote that which she wished to be known later now my fear is this if it be that she can by our hypnotic trance tell what the count see and hear is it not more true that he who have hypnotized her first and who have drink of her very blood, and make her drink of his, should, if he will, compel her mind to disclose to him that which she know. I nodded acquiescence. He went on. Then what we must do is to prevent this. We must keep her ignorant of our intent, and so she cannot tell what she know not. This is a painful task. Oh, so painful that it heartbreak me to think of it, but it must be. When today we meet, I must tell her that for reason which we will not to speak, she must not more be of our counsel, but be simply guarded by us. He wiped his forehead which had broken out in profuse perspiration at the thought of the pain which he might have to inflict upon the poor soul already so tortured. I knew that it would be some sort of comfort to him if I told him that I also had come to the same conclusion, for, at any rate, it would take away the pain of doubt. I told him, and the effect was as I expected. It is now close to the time of our general gathering. Van Helsing has gone away to prepare for the meeting, and his painful part of it. I really believe his purpose is to be able to pray alone. Later, at the very outset of our meeting, a great personal relief was experienced by both Van Helsing and myself. Mrs. Harker had sent a message by her husband to say that she would not join us at present, as she thought it better that we should be free to discuss our movements without her presence to embarrass us. The professor and I looked at each other for an instant, and somehow we both seemed relieved. For my part, I thought that if Mrs. Harker realized the danger herself, it was much pain as well as much danger averted under the circumstances we agreed by a questioning look and answer with finger on lip to preserve in silence our suspicions until we should have been able to confer alone again we went at once into our plan of campaign van helsing roughly put the facts before us the Tsarina Catherine left the Thames yesterday morning. It will take her, at the quickest speed she has ever made, at least three weeks to reach Varna. But we can travel overland to the same place in three days. Now, if we allow for two days less for the ship's voyage, owing to such weather influences as we know that the Count may bring to bear, and if we allow a whole day and night for any delays which may occur to us, 
then we have a margin of nearly two weeks. Thus, in order to be quite safe, we must leave here on 17th at latest. Then we shall, at any rate, be in Varna a day before the ship arrives, and able to make such preparations as may be necessary. Of course, we shall all go armed, armed against evil things, spiritual as well as physical. Here Quincy Morris added, I understand that the Count comes from a wolf country, and it may be that he shall get there before us. I propose that we add Winchesters to our armament. I have a kind of belief in a Winchester, when there is any trouble of that sort around. Do you remember, Art, when we had the pack after us at Tobolsk? What wouldn't we have given then for a repeater apiece? Good, said Van Helsing. Winchester's it shall be. Quincy's head is level at times, but most so when there is to hunt. Metaphor be more dishonour to science than wolves be of danger to man. In the meantime, we can do nothing here. And as I think that Varna is not familiar to any of us, why not go there more soon? It is as long to wait here as there. Tonight and tomorrow we can get ready, and then, if all be well, we four can set out on our journey. We four? said Harker interrogatively, looking from one to another of us. Of course, answered the professor quickly, you must remain to take care of your so sweet wife. Harker was silent for a while, and then said in a hollow voice, Let us talk of that part of it in the morning. I want to consult with Mina. I thought that now was the time for Van Helsing to warn him, not to disclose our plan to her, but he took no notice. I looked at him significantly, and coughed. For answer, he put his finger to his lips, and turned away. Jonathan Harker's Journal 5 October, Afternoon For some time after our meeting this morning I could not think. The new phases of things leave my mind in a state of wonder which allows no room for active thought. Mina's determination not to take any part in the discussion set me thinking, and as I could not argue the matter with her, I could only guess. I am as far as ever from a solution now. The way the others received it, too, puzzled me. The last time we talked of the subject, we agreed that there was to be no more concealment of anything amongst us. Mina is sleeping now, calmly and sweetly like a little child. Her lips are curved, and her face beams with happiness. Thank God, there are such moments still for her. Later. How strange it all is! I sat watching Mina's happy sleep, and I came as near to being happy myself as I suppose I shall ever be. As the evening drew on, and the earth took its shadows from the sun sinking lower, the silence of the room grew more and more solemn to me. All at once Mina opened her eyes, and looking at me tenderly, said, Jonathan, I want you to promise me something, on your word of honour, a promise made to me, but made holily, in God's hearing, and not to be broken, though I should go down on my knees and implore you with bitter tears. Quick, you must make it to me at once. Mina, I said, a promise like that I cannot make at once. I may have no right to make it. But, dear one, she said, with such spiritual intensity that her eyes were like pole stars, it is I who wish it, and it is not for myself. You can ask Dr. Van Helsing if I am not right. If he disagrees, you may do as you will. Nay, more, if you all agree. Later you are absolved from the promise. I promise, I said, and for a moment she looked supremely happy. 
though to me all happiness for her was denied by the red scar on her forehead. She said, Promise me that you will not tell me anything of the plans formed for the campaign against the Count, not by word or inference or implication, not at any time whilst this remains to me. And she solemnly pointed to the scar. I saw that she was in earnest, and said solemnly, I promise. And as I said it, I felt that, from that instant, a door had been shut between us. Later, midnight. Mina has been bright and cheerful all the evening, so much so that all the rest seem to take courage, as if infected somewhat with her gaiety. As a result, even I myself felt as if the pall of gloom which weighs us down were somewhat lifted. We all retired early. Mina is now sleeping like a little child. It is a wonderful thing that her faculty of sleep remains to her in the midst of her terrible trouble. Thank God for it, for then, at least, she can forget her care. Perhaps her example may affect me, as her gaiety did to-night. I shall try it. Oh, for a dreamless sleep! 6 October, morning. Another surprise. Mina woke me early, about the same time as yesterday, and asked me to bring Dr. Van Helsing. I thought that it was another occasion for hypnotism, and without question went for the professor. He had evidently expected some such call, for I found him dressed in his room. His door was ajar, so that he could hear the opening of the door of our room. He came at once. As he passed into the room, he asked Mina if the others might come too. No, she said quite simply, it will not be necessary. You can tell them just as well. I must go with you on your journey. Dr. Van Helsing was as startled as I was. After a moment's pause he asked, But why? You must take me with you. I am safer with you, and you shall be safer too. But why, dear Madame Mina? You know that your safety is our solemnest duty. We go into danger to which you are, or may be, more liable than any of us from, from circumstances, things that have been. He paused, embarrassed. As she replied, she raised her finger and pointed to her forehead. I know. This is why I must go. I can tell you now, whilst the sun is coming up, I may not be able again. I know that when the Count wills me, I must go. I know that if he tells me to come, in secret, I must, by a while, by any device to hoodwink, even Jonathan. God saw the look that she turned on me as she spoke, and if there be indeed a recording angel, that look is noted to her everlasting honour. I could only clasp her hand. I could not speak. My emotion was too great for even the relief of tears. She went on. You men are brave and strong. You are strong in your numbers for you can defy that which would break down the human endurance of one who had to guard alone. Besides, I may be of service, since you can hypnotize me and so learn that which even I myself do not know. Dr. Van Helsing said gravely, Madam Mina, you are, as always, most wise. You shall with us come, and together we shall do that which we go forth to achieve. When he had spoken, Mina's long spell of silence made me look at her. She had fallen back on her pillow, asleep. She did not even wake when I had pulled up the blind and let in the sunlight which flooded the room. Van Helsing motioned me to come with him quietly. We went to his room, and within a minute Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris were with us also. He told them what Mina had said, and went on. In the morning we shall leave for Varna. We have now to deal with a new factor, Madame Mina. Oh, but her soul is true. It is to her an agony to tell us so much as she has done. But it is most right, and we are warned in time. 
there must be no chance lost, and in Varna we must be ready to act the instant when that ship arrives. "'What shall we do, exactly?' asked Mr. Morris, laconically. The professor paused before replying. "'We shall at the first board that ship. Then, when we have identified the box, we shall place a branch of the wild rose on it. This we shall fasten, for when it is there none can emerge, so that at least says the superstition. And to the superstition we must trust at the first. It was man's faith in the early, and it have its root in faith still. Then, when we get the opportunity that we seek, when none are near to see it, we shall open the box, and, and all will be well. I shall not wait for any opportunity, said Morris. When I see the box, I shall open it and destroy the monster, though there were a thousand men looking on, and if I am to be wiped out for it the next moment. I grasped his hand instinctively, and found it as firm as a piece of steel. I think he understood my look. I hope he did. Good boy, said Dr. Van Helsing. Brave boy. Quincy is all man. God bless him for it. My child, Believe me, none of us shall lag behind, or pause from any fear. I do but say what we may do, what we must do, but indeed, indeed, we cannot say what we may do. There are so many things which may happen, and their ways and their ends are so various, that until the moment we may not say. We shall be armed in all ways, and when the time for the end has come, our effort shall not be lack. Now let us to-day put all our affairs in order. Let all things which touch on others dear to us, and who on us depend, be complete. For none of us can tell what, or when, or how, the end may be. As for me, my own affairs are regulate, and as I have nothing else to do, I shall go make arrangements for the travel. I shall have all tickets and so forth for our journey. There was nothing further to be said, and we parted. I shall now settle up all my affairs of earth, and be ready for whatever may come. Later. It is done. My will is made, and all complete. Mina, if she survive, is my sole heir. If it should not be so, then the others who have been so good to us shall have remainder. It is now drawing towards the sunset. Mina's uneasiness calls my attention to it. I am sure that there is something on her mind which the time of exact sunset will reveal. These occasions are becoming harrowing times for us all, for each sunrise and sunset opens up some new danger, some new pain, which, however, may in God's will be means to a good end. I will write all these things in the diary, since my darling must not hear them now. But if it may be that she can see them again, they shall be ready. She is calling to me. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter Twenty Five. Read by Dennis Sayers. M.B. Nazine Cartbray. Dr. Seward's Diary. 11 October, evening. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs. Harker a little before the time of sunset. We have of late come to understand that sunrise and sunset are, to her, times of peculiar freedom when her own self can be manifest without any controlling force subduing or restraining her, or inciting her to action. This mood or condition 
begins some half hour or more before actual sunrise or sunset and lasts till either the sun is high or whilst the clouds are still aglow with the rays streaming above the horizon at first there is a sort of negative condition as if some tie were loosened and then the absolute freedom quickly follows when however the freedom ceases the change back or relapse comes quickly preceded only by a spell of warning silence tonight when we met she was somewhat constrained and bore all the signs of an internal struggle i put it down myself to her making a violent effort at the earliest instant she could do so a very few minutes however gave her complete control of herself then motioning her husband to sit beside her on the sofa where she was half reclining she made the rest of us bring chairs up close taking her husband's hand in hers she began we are all here together in freedom for perhaps the last time i know that you will always be with me to the end this was to her husband whose hand had as we could see tightened upon her in the morning we go out upon our task and god only knows what may be in store for any of us you are going to be so good to me to take me with you i know that all that brave earnest men can do for a poor weak woman whose soul perhaps is lost no no not yet but is at any rate at stake you will do but you must remember that i am not as you are there is a poison in my blood in my soul which may destroy me which must destroy me unless some relief comes to us oh my friends you know as well as i do that my soul is at stake and though i know there is one way out for me you must not and i must not take it she looked appealingly to us all in turn beginning and ending with her husband what is that way asked van helsing in a hoarse voice what is that way which we must not may not take that i may die now either by my own hand or that of another before the greater evil is entirely wrought i know and you know that were i once dead you could and would set free my immortal spirit even as you did my poor lucy's were death or the fear of death the only thing that stood in the way i would not shrink to die here now amidst the friends who loved me but death is not all i cannot believe that to die in such a case when there is hope before us and a bitter task to be done is god's will therefore i on my part give up here the certainty of eternal rest and go out into the dark where may be the blackest things that the world or the nether world holds we were all silent for we knew instinctively that this was only a prelude the faces of the others were set and harker's grew ashen gray perhaps he guessed better than any of us what was coming she continued this is what i can give into the hotch-pot i could not but note the quaint legal phrase which she used in such a place with all seriousness what will each of you give she went on quickly that is easy for brave men your lives are god's and you can give them back to him but what will you give to me she looked again questioningly but this time avoided her husband's face quincey seemed to understand he nodded and her face lit up then i shall tell you plainly what i want for there must be no doubtful matter in this connection between us now you must promise me one and all even you my beloved husband that should the time come 
you will kill me. What is that time? The voice was Quincy's, but it was low and strained. When you shall be convinced that I am so changed, that it is better that I die that I may live. When I am thus dead in the flesh, then you will, without a moment's delay, drive a stake through me and cut off my head, or do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest. Quincy was the first to rise after the pause. He knelt down before her, and taking her hand in his, said solemnly, I'm only a rough fellow, who hasn't, perhaps, lived as a man should to win such a distinction. But I swear to you by all that I hold sacred and dear that, should the time ever come, I shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us. And I promise you, too, that I shall make all certain, for if I am only doubtful, I shall take it that the time has come my true friend was all she could say amid her fast-falling tears as bending over she kissed his hand i swear the same my dear madam mina said van helsing and i said lord galdamin each of them in turn kneeling to her to take the oath i followed myself then her husband turned to her, wan-eyed and with the greenish pallor which subdued the snowy whiteness of his hair, and asked, And I must too make such a promise, O oh, my wife. You too, my dearest, she said with infinite yearning of pity in her eyes and voice. You must not shrink. You are nearest and dearest in all the world to me. Our souls are knit into one, for all life and all time. Think, dear, that there have been times when brave men have killed their wives and their womenkind to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. Their hands did not falter any more, because those that they loved implored them to slay them. It is men's duty towards those whom they love in such times of sore trial. And, oh, my dear, if it is to be that I must meet death at any hand, let it be at the hand of him that loves me best. Dr. Van Helsing, I have not forgotten your mercy in poor Lucy's case to him who loved. She stopped with a flying blush, and changed her phrase to him who had best right to give her peace. If that time shall come again, I look to you to make it a happy memory of my husband's life, that it was his loving hand which set me free from the awful thrall upon me. Again, I swear, came the professor's resonant voice. Mrs. Harker smiled, positively smiled, as with a sigh of relief. She leaned back and said, And now... One word of warning, a warning which you must never forget. This time, if it ever come, may come quickly and unexpectedly, and in such case you must lose no time in using your opportunity. At such a time I myself might be, nay, if the time ever come, shall be leagued with your enemy against you. One more request. She became very solemn as she said this. It is not vital and necessary like the other, but I want you to do one thing for me, if you will. We all acquiesced, but no one spoke. There was no need to speak. I want you to read the burial service. She was interrupted by a deep groan from her husband. Taking his hand in hers, she held it over her heart, and continued, You must read it over me some day, whatever may be the issue of all this fearful state of things. It will be a sweet thought to all, 
or some of us. You, my dearest, will I hope read it, for then it will be your voice in my memory for ever, come what may. But, oh, my dear one, he pleaded, death is afar from you. Nay, she said, holding up a warning hand, I am deeper in death at this moment than if the weight of an earthly grave lay heavy upon me. Oh, my wife, must I read it, he said, before he began. It would comfort me, my husband, was all she said, and he began to read when she had got the book ready. How can I, how could any one, tell of that strange scene, its solemnity, its gloom, its sadness, its horror, and, withal, its sweetness? Even a skeptic, who can see nothing but a travesty of bitter truth in anything holy or emotional, would have been melted to the heart had he seen that little group of loving and devoted friends kneeling round that stricken and sorrowing lady, or heard the tender passion of her husband's voice, as in tones so broken and emotional that often he had to pause, he read the simple and beautiful service from the burial of the dead. I cannot go on. Words and voices fail me. She was right in her instinct. Strange as it was, bizarre as it may here afterwards seem, even to us who had felt its potent influence at the time, it comforted us much, and the silence which showed Mrs. Harker's coming relapse from her freedom of soul did not seem so full of despair to any of us as we had dreaded. Jonathan Harker's Journal 15 October, Varna We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Lord Godalming went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to this hotel, the Odessus. The journey may have had incidents. I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God, Mina is well, and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal. Throughout the journey, she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert, and it has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotise her at such times. At first, some effort was needed, and he had to make many passes. But now she seems to yield at once, as if by habit, and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power, at these particular moments, to simply will, and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, Nothing, all is dark. And to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship, and the water rushing by. Canvas and cordage strain, and masts and yards creak. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds, and the bow throws back the foam. It is evident that the Tsarina Catherine is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Godalming has just returned. He had four telegrams one each day since we started, and all to the same effect, that the Tsarina Catherine had not been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agent should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message even if she were not reported, so that he might be sure that there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner and went to bed early. 
Tomorrow we are to see the vice-consul, and to arrange, if we can, about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Helsing says that our chance will be to get on the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, cannot cross the running water of his own volition, and so cannot leave the ship. As he dare not change to man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid, he must remain in the box. If, then, we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy, for we can open the box and make sure of him, as we did of poor Lucy, before he wakes. What mercy he shall get from us all will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with officials or the seamen. Thank God! This is the country where bribery can do anything, and we are well supplied with money. We have only to make sure that the ship cannot come into port between sunset and sunrise without our being warned, and we shall be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16. October. Mina's report, still the same. Lapping waves and rushing water, darkness and favouring winds. We are evidently in good time, and when we hear of the Tsarina Catherine, we shall be ready. As she must pass the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17. October. Everything is pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Godalming told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent aboard might contain something stolen from a friend of his, and got a half-consent that he might open it at his own risk. The owner gave him a paper telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose on board the ship, and also a similar authorization to his agent at Varna. We have seen the agent, who was much impressed with Godalming's kindly manner to him, and we are all satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We have already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count is there, Van Helsing and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. Morris and Godalming and I shall prevent interference, even if we have to use the arms which we shall have ready. The professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon after fall into dust. In such case there would be no evidence against us, in case any suspicion of murder were aroused. But even if it were not, we should stand or fall by our act, and perhaps some day this very script may be evidence to come between some of us and a rope. For myself, I should take the chance only too thankfully if it were to come. We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent. We have arranged with certain officials that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we are to be informed by a special messenger. 24. October. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story. Not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking masts. Telegram, October 24th, Rufus Smith, Lloyd's, London, to Lord Godalming, care of H.P.A.M. Vice Council, Varna. Sarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. Dr. Seward's Diary 25 October How I miss my phonograph! To write a diary with a pen is irksome to me, but Van Helsing says I must. We were all wild with excitement yesterday when Galdaming got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now how men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. Mrs. Harker alone of our party did not show any signs of emotion. After all, it is not strange that she did not, for we took special care not to let her know anything about it, and we all tried, 
not to show any excitement when we were in her presence. In old days she would, I am sure, have noticed, no matter how we might have tried to conceal it. But in this way she is greatly changed during the past three weeks. The lethargy grows upon her, and though she seems strong and well, and is getting back some of her colour, Van Helsing and I are not satisfied. We talk of her often. We have not, however, said a word to the others. It would break poor Harker's heart, certainly his nerve, if he knew that we had even a suspicion on the subject. Van Helsing examines, he tells me, her teeth very carefully, whilst she is in the hypnotic condition, for he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger of a change in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it be to contemplate. Euthanasia is an excellent and a comforting word. I am grateful to whoever invented it. It is only about twenty-four hours' sail from the Dardanelles to here, at the rate the Zarzina Catherine has come from London. She should, therefore, arrive some time in the morning, but as she cannot possibly get in before noon, we are all about to retire early. We shall get up at one o'clock, so as to be ready. 25 October, noon. No news yet of the ship's arrival. Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report this morning was the same as usual, so it is possible that we may get news at any moment. We men are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker, who is calm. His hands are cold as ice, and an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gorka knife, which he now always carries with him. It will be a bad lookout for the Count if the edge of that kukri ever touches his throat, driven by that stern, ice-cold hand. Van Helsing and I were a little alarmed about Mrs. Harker today. About noon she got into a sort of lethargy, which he did not like. Although he kept silence to the others, we were neither of us happy about it. She had been restless all the morning, so that we were at first glad to know that she was sleeping. When, however, her husband mentioned casually that she was sleeping so soundly that he could not wake her, we went to her room to see for ourselves. She was breathing naturally, and looked so well and peaceful, that we agreed that the sleep was better for her than anything else. Poor girl, she has so much to forget, that it is no wonder that sleep, if it brings oblivion to her, does her good. Later. Our opinion was justified, for when, after a refreshing sleep of some hours, she woke up, she seemed brighter and better than she had been for days. At sunset she made the usual hypnotic report. Wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his destination. To his doom, I trust. 26 October Another day and no tidings of the Tsarina Catherine. She ought to be here by now. That she is still journeying somewhere is apparent, for Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. It is possible that the vessel may be lying by, at times, for fog. Some of the steamers, which came in last evening, reported patches of fog both to the north and south of the port. We must continue our watching, as the ship may now be signalled at any moment. 27 October Noon Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported last night and this morning as usual. Lapping waves and rushing water. 
though she had added that the waves were very faint. The telegrams from London have been the same. No further report. Van Helsing is terribly anxious, and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. He added significantly, I did not like that lethargy of Madame Mina's. Souls and memories can do strange things during trance. I was about to ask him more, but Harker just then came in, and he held up a warning hand. We must try tonight at sunset to make her speak more fully when in her hypnotic state. 28 October Telegram Rufus Smith London, to Lord Godalming, care HBM Vice-Council, Varna. Sarina Catherine reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's Diary, 28 October. When the telegram came announcing the arrival in Galatz, I do not think it was such a shock to any of us as might have been expected. True, we did not know whence or how or when the bolt would come. But I think we all expected that something strange would happen. The day of arrival at Varna made us individually satisfied that things would not be just as we had expected. We only waited to learn where the change would occur. Nonetheless, however, it was a surprise. I suppose that nature works on such a hopeful basis that we believe against ourselves that things will be set as they ought to be, not as we should know that they will be. Transcendentalism is a beacon to the angels, even if it be a will o' the wisp to man. Van Helsing raised his hand over his head for a moment, as though in remonstrance with the Almighty. But he said not a word, and, in a few seconds, stood up with his face sternly set. Lord Godalming grew very pale, and sat breathing heavily. I was myself half stunned, and looked in wonder at one after another. Quincy Morris tightened his belt with that quick movement which I knew so well. In our old wandering days it meant action. Mrs. Harker grew ghastly white, so that the scar on her forehead seemed to burn, but she folded her hands meekly and looked up in prayer. Harker smiled, actually smiled, the dark, bitter smile of one who is without hope. But at the same time his action belied his words, for his hands instinctively sought the hilt of the great Kukri knife, and rested there. "'When does the next train start for Galatz?' said Van Helsing to us generally. "'At six-thirty to-morrow morning.' We all started, for the answer came from Mrs. Harker. "'How on earth do you know?' said Art. "'You forget, or perhaps you do not know, though Jonathan does, and so does Dr. Van Helsing, that I am a train fiend. At home in Exeter I always used to make up the timetables so as to be helpful to my husband. I found it so useful sometimes that I always make a study of the timetables now. I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, we should go by Galatz, or, at any rate, through Bucharest, so I learned the times very carefully. Unhappily, there are not many to learn, as the only train tomorrow leaves, as I say. Wonderful woman, murmured the professor. Can't we get a special? asked Lord Godalming. Van Helsing shook his head. I fear not. This land is very different from yours or mine. Even if we did have a special, it would probably not arrive as soon as our regular train. Moreover, we have something to prepare. We must think. Now, let us organize. You, friend Arthur, Go to the train and get the tickets and arrange that all be ready for us to go in the morning. Do you, friend Jonathan, 
go to the agent of the ship and get from him letters to the agent in galatz with authority to make a search of the ship just as it was here quincy morris you see the vice consul and get his aid with his fellow in galatz and all he can do to make our way smooth so that no times be lost when over the danube john will stay with madame mina and me and we shall consult for so if time be long you may be delayed and it will not matter when the sun set since i am here with madame to make report and i said mrs harker brightly and more like her old self than she had been for many a long day shall try to be of use in all ways and i shall think and write for you as i used to something is shifting from me in some strange way and i feel freer than i have been of late the three younger men looked happier at the moment as they seemed to realize the significance of her words but van helsing and i turning to each other met each a grave and troubled glance we said nothing at the time however when the three men had gone out to their tasks van helsing asked mrs harker to look up the copy of the diaries and find him the part of harker's journal at the castle she went away to get it when the door was shut upon her he said to me we mean the same speak out here is some change it is a hope that makes me sick for it may deceive us quite so do you know why i asked her to get the manuscript no said i unless it was an opportunity of seeing me alone you are in part right friend john but only in part i want to tell you something and oh my friend i'm taking a great terrible risk but i believe it is right in the moment when madame mina said those words that arrest both our understanding an inspiration came to me in the trance of three days ago the count sent her to his spirit to read her mind or more like he took her to see him in his earth box in the ship with water rushing just as it go free at rise and set of sun he learned then that we are here for she had more to tell in her open life with eyes to see ears to hear than he shut as he is in his coffin box now he make his most effort to escape us at present he want her not he is sure with his so great knowledge that she will come at his call but he cut her off take her as he can do out of his brain power that so she come not to him ah there i have hope that our man's brains that have been of man so long and that have not lost the grace of god will come higher than his child brain that lie in his tomb for centuries that grow not yet to our stature and that do not work selfish and therefore small here comes madame mina not a word to her of her trance she knows it not and it would overwhelm her and make despair just when we want all her hope all her courage when most we want all her great brain that is trained like man's brain but is of sweet woman and have a special power which the count give her and which he may not take away altogether though he thinks so hush let me speak and you shall learn oh john my friend we are in awful straits i fear as i never feared before we can only trust the good god silence here she comes i thought that the professor was going to break down and have hysterics just as he had when lucy died but with a great effort he controlled himself and was at perfect nervous poise 
when Mrs. Harker tripped into the room, bright and happy-looking, and, in the doing of work, seemingly forgetful of her misery. As she came in, she handed a number of sheets of typewriting to Van Helsing. He looked over them, gravely, his face brightening up as he read. Then, holding the pages between his finger and thumb, he said, "'Friend John, do you, with so much experience already, and you too, dear Madame Mina, that are young, here is a lesson. Do not fear ever to think. A half-thought has been buzzing often in my brain, but I fear to let him lose his wings. Here now, with more knowledge, I go back to where that half-thought come from, and I find that he be no half-thought at all, that be a whole thought, though so young that he is not yet strong to use his little wings. Nay, like the ugly duck of my friend Hans Anderson, he be no duck-thought at all, but a big swan-thought that sail nobly on big wings when the time come for him to try them. See, I read here what Jonathan have written. That other of his race, who, in a later age, again and again, brought his forces over the great river into Turkey-land, who, when he was beaten back, came again, and again, and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field, where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. What does this tell us? Not much? No. The Count's child thought see nothing, therefore he speaks so free. Your man thought see nothing. My man thought see nothing till just now. No, but there comes another word from someone who speak without thought, because she, too, know not what it mean, what it might mean. Just as there are elements which rest, yet when in nature's course they move on their way, and they touch the poof, and there comes a flash of light, heaven-wide, that blind and kill and destroy some, but they show up all the earth below for leagues and leagues. Is it not so? Well, I shall explain. To begin, have you ever studied the philosophy of crime? Yes and no. You, John, yes, for it is a study of insanity. You, no, Madame Mina, for crime touch you not, not but once. Still, your mind works true, and argues not a particulari ad universali. There is this peculiarity in criminals, it is so constant in all countries and at all times, that even police, who know not much from philosophy, come to know it empirically, that is. That is to be empiric, the criminal always work at one crime. That is the true criminal, who seems predestinate to crime, and who will of none other. This criminal has not full man-brain. He is clever and cunning and resourceful, but he be not of man's stature as to brain. He be of child-brain in much. Now, this criminal of ours is predestinate to crime also. He too have child brain, and it is of the child to do what he have done. The little bird, the little fish, the little animal learn not by principle, but empirically. And when he learn to do, then there is to him the ground to start from to do more. Dos posto said Archimedes, give me a fulcrum, and I shall move the world. To do once is the fulcrum whereby child-brain become man-brain, and until he have the purpose to do more, he continue to do the same thing, again, every time, just as he have done before. 
Oh, my dear, I see that your eyes are opened, and that to you the lightning flash show all the leagues. For Mrs. Harker began to clap her hands, and her eyes sparkled. He went on. Now you shall speak. Tell us two dry men of science what you see with those so bright eyes. He took her hand and held it whilst he spoke. His finger and thumb closed on her pulse, as I thought instinctively and unconsciously, as she spoke. The Count is a criminal and of criminal type. Nordau and Lombroso would so classify him, and qua criminal he is of an imperfectly formed mind. Thus in a difficulty he has to seek resource and habit. His past is a clue, and the one page of it that we know, and that from his own lips, tells that once before, when in what Mr. Morris would call a tight place, he went back to his country from the land he had tried to invade, and thence, without losing purpose, prepared himself for a new effort. He came again better equipped for his work, and won. So he came to London to invade a new land. He was beaten, and when all hope of success was lost, and his existence in danger, he fled back over the sea, to his home, just as formerly he had fled back over the Danube from Turkey land. "'Good, good, you oh-so-clever lady,' said Van Helsing, enthusiastically, as he stooped and kissed her hand. A moment later he said to me, as calmly as though he had been having a sick-room consultation, seventy-two only, and in all this excitement I have hope.' Turning to her again, he said with keen expectation, "'But go on, go on.' There is more to tell, if you will. Be not afraid. John and I know. I do, in any case, and shall tell you, if you are right. Speak without fear. I will try to, but you will forgive me if I seem too egotistical. Nay, fear not. You must be egotist, for it is of you that we think. Then, as he is criminal, he is selfish, and as his intellect is small and his action is based on selfishness, he confines himself to one purpose. That purpose is remorseless. As he fled back over the Danube, leaving his forces to be cut to pieces, so now he is intent on being safe, careless of all. So his own selfishness frees my soul somewhat from the terrible power which he acquired over me, on that dreadful night. I felt it. Oh, I felt it. Thank God for his great mercy. My soul is freer than it has been since that awful hour, and all that haunts me is a fear lest in some trance or dream he may have used my knowledge for his ends. The professor stood up. He has so used your mind, and by it he has left us here in Varna, whilst the ship that carried him rushed through an enveloping fog up to Galatz, where, doubtless, he had made preparation for escaping from us. But his child mind only saw so far, and it may be that, as ever is in God's providence, the very thing that the evil doer most reckoned on for his selfish good turns out to be his chiefest harm. The hunter is taken in his own snare, as the great psalmist says, for now that he think he is free from every trace of us all, and that he has escaped us with so many hours to him, then his selfish child brain will whisper him to sleep. He think, too, that as he cut himself off from knowing your mind, there can be no knowledge of him to you. There is where he fail. 
that terrible baptism of blood which he give you makes you free to go to him in spirit as you have as yet done in your times of freedom when the sun rise and set at such times you go by my volition and not by his and this power to good of you and others you have won from your suffering at his hands this is now all the more precious that he know it not and to guard himself have even cut himself off from his knowledge of our where we however are not selfish and we believe that god is with us through all this blackness and these many dark hours we shall follow him and we shall not flinch even if we peril ourselves that we become like him friend john this has been a great hour and it have done much to advance us on our way you must prescribe and write him all down so that when the others return from their work you can give it to them then they shall know as we do and so i have written it whilst we await their return and mrs harker has written with the typewriter all since she brought the manuscript to us end of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six of Dracula》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Dracula》by Bram Stoker《Chapter Twenty Six》Read by Dennis Sayers Elizabeth Clett M.B. Dr. Seward's Diary 29 October. This is written in the train from Varna to Galatz. Last night we all assembled a little before the time of sunset. Each of us had done his work as well as he could, so far as thought and endeavor and opportunity go. We are prepared for the whole of our journey, and for our work when we get to Galatz. When the usual time came round, mrs harker prepared herself for her hypnotic effort and after a longer and more serious effort on the part of van helsing than has been usually necessary she sank into the trance usually she speaks on a hint but this time the professor had to ask her questions and to ask them pretty resolutely before he could learn anything at last her answer came i can see nothing we are still there are no waves lapping but only a steady swirl of water softly running against the hawser i can hear men's voices calling near and far and the roll and creak of oars in the rowlocks a gun is fired somewhere the echo of it seems far away there is tramping of feet overhead and ropes and chains are dragged along what is this there is a gleam of light i can feel the air blowing upon me here she stopped she had risen as if impulsively from where she lay on the sofa and raised both her hands palms upwards as if lifting a weight van helsing and i looked at each other with understanding Quincy raised his eyebrows slightly, and looked at her intently, whilst Harker's hand instinctively closed round the hilt of his kukri. There was a long pause. We all knew that the time when she could speak was passing, but we felt that it was useless to say anything. Suddenly she sat up, and as she opened her eyes, said sweetly, would none of you like a cup of tea you must i'll be so tired we could only make her happy and so acquiesced she bustled off to get tea when she had gone van helsing said you see my friends he is close to land 
he has left his earth chest, but he has yet to get on shore. In the night he may lie hidden somewhere, but if he be not carried on shore, or if the ship do not touch it, he cannot achieve the land. In such case he can, if it be in the night, change his form and jump or fly on shore. Then, unless he be carried, he cannot escape. And if he be carried, then the customs men may discover what the box contain. Thus, in fine, if he escape not on shore to-night or before dawn, there will be the whole day lost to him. We may then arrive in time, for if he escape not at night, we shall come on him in daytime, boxed up and at our mercy, for he dare not to be his true self, awake and visible, lest he be discovered. There was no more to be said, so we waited in patience until the dawn, at which time we might learn more from Mrs. Harker. Early this morning we listened with breathless anxiety for her response in her trance. The hypnotic state was even longer in coming than before, and when it came the time remaining until full sunrise was so short that we began to despair. Van Helsing seemed to throw his whole soul into the effort. At last, in obedience to his will, she made reply. All is dark. I hear lapping water level with me, and some creaking as of wood on wood. She paused, and the red sun shot up. We must wait till to-night. And so it is that we are travelling towards Galatz, in an agony of expectation. We are due to arrive between two and three in the morning, but already at Bucharest we are three hours late, so we cannot possibly get in till well after sun-up. Thus we shall have two more hypnotic messages from Mrs. Harker. Either or both may possibly throw more light on what is happening. Later, sunset has come and gone. Fortunately, it came at a time when there was no distraction, for had it occurred whilst we were at a station, we might not have secured the necessary calm and isolation. Mrs. Harker yielded to the hypnotic influence even less readily than this morning. I am in fear that her power of reading the Count's sensations may die away, just when we want it most. It seems to me that her imagination is beginning to work. Whilst she has been in the trance hitherto, she has confined herself to the simplest of facts. If this goes on, it may ultimately mislead us. If I thought that the Count's power over her would die away equally with her power of knowledge, it would be a happy thought. But I am afraid that it may not be so. When she did speak, her words were enigmatical. Something is going out. I can feel it pass me like a cold wind. I can hear, far off, confused sounds, as of men talking in strange tongues, fierce, falling water, and the howling of wolves. She stopped, and a shudder ran through her, increasing in intensity for a few seconds, till, at the end, she shook as though in a palsy. She said no more even in answer to the professor's imperative questioning. When she woke from the trance, she was cold and exhausted and languid, but her mind was all alert. She could not remember anything, but asked what she had said. When she was told, she pondered over it deeply for a long time, and in silence. 30 October, 7 a.m. We are near Galatz now, and I may not have time to write later. Sunrise this morning was anxiously looked for by us all. 
Knowing of the increasing difficulty of procuring the hypnotic trance, Van Helsing began his passes earlier than usual. They produced no effect, however, until the regular time, when she yielded with still a greater difficulty. Only a minute before the sun rose, the professor lost no time in his questioning. Her answer came with equal quickness. All is dark. I hear water swirling by, level with my ears, and the creaking of wood on wood. Cattle low, far off. There is another sound, a, a queer one, like... She stopped and grew white, and whiter still. Go on, go on, speak, I command you, said Van Helsing in an agonized voice. At the same time, there was despair in his eyes, for the risen sun was reddening even Mrs. Harker's pale face. She opened her eyes, and we all started, as she said, sweetly and seemingly with the utmost concern. Oh, Professor, why ask me to do what you know I can't? I don't remember anything. Then, seeing the look of amazement on our faces, she said, turning from one to the other with a troubled look, uh, What have I said? What have I done? I know nothing, only that I was lying here, half asleep, and heard you say, Go on, speak, I command you. It seemed so funny to hear you order me about, as if I were a bad child. Oh, Madam Mina, he said sadly, it is proof, if proof be needed, of how I love and honor you when a word for your good, spoken more earnest than ever, can seem so strange, because it is to order her who I am proud to obey. The whistles are sounding. We are nearing Galatz. We are on fire with anxiety and eagerness. Mina Harker's Journal 30th October. Mr. Morris took me to the hotel where our rooms had been ordered by telegraph, he being the one who could best be spared, since he does not speak any foreign language. The forces were distributed much as they had been at Varna, except that Lord Godalming went to the vice-consul, as his rank might serve as an immediate guarantee of some sort to the official, we being in extreme hurry. Jonathan and the two doctors went to the shipping agent, to learn particulars of the arrival of the Tsarina Catherine. Later. Lord Godalming has returned. The consul is away, and the vice-consul sick. So the routine work has been attended to by a clerk. He was very obliging, and offered to do anything in his power. Jonathan Harker's Journal 30. October At nine o'clock, Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward, and I called on Messrs. Mackenzie and Steinkoff, the agents of the London firm of Hapgood. They had received a wire from London in answer to Lord Godalming's telegraphed request, asking them to show us any civility in their power. They were more than kind and courteous, and took us at once on board the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor out in the river harbour. There we saw the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage. He said that in all his life he had never had so favourable a run. Man, he said, but it made us afeard, for we expect that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of luck, so as to keep up the average. It's no canny to run from London to the Black Sea with the wind at you, as though the dale himself were blown on your sail for his own purpose, and at the time we couldn't spare a thing. Gin we were nigh a ship or a port or a headland, a fog fell on us and travelled wi' us, till when after it had lifted and we looked out. The deal of thing we could see. We ran by Gibraltar without being able to signal, and till we came to the Dardanelles and had to wait to get our permit to pass, we never were within hail or aught. At first I was inclined to slack off sail and beat a boot till the fog was lifted, but whilst I thought that if the Dale was minded to get us into the Black Sea quick, 
He was like to do it whether we would or no. If we had a quick voyage, it would have been no to our miscredit with the owners, or no hurt to our traffic, and the old man who had served his own purpose would be decently grateful to us for not hindering him. This mixture of simplicity and cunning, of superstition and commercial reasoning, aroused Van Helsing, who said, Mine friend, that devil is more clever than he is thought by some, and he know when he meet his match. The skipper was not displeased with the compliment, and went on. When we got past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble. Some of them, the Romanians, came and asked me to heave overboard a big box, which had been put on board by a queer-looking old man, just before we had started for London. I had seen them spear at the fellow and put out their twelve fingers when they saw him, to guard against the evil eye. Man, but the superstition of foreigners is perfectly ridiculous. I sent them about their business pretty quick. But as just after a fog closed in on us, I felt a wee bit as they did on it something, though I wouldn't say it was again the big box. Well, on we went, and as the fog didn't let up for five days, I just let the wind carry us, for if the day I wanted to get somewhere, well, he would fetch it up all right, and if he didn't, well, we'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure enough, we had a fair way in deep water all the time. And two days ago, when the modern sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just in the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild and wanted me right or wrong to take out the box and fling it in the river. I had to argue with him about it with a handspike. And then when the last of them rose off the deck with his head in his hand, I had convinced them that evil eye or no evil eye, the property and the trust of my owners was better in my hands than in the river Danube. They had, mind ye, taken the box on the deck ready to fling in. And as it was marked Galatz via Varna, I thought I'd let it lie till we discharged in the port and get rid of it altogether. We didn't do much clearing up that day, and I had to return the nick to anchor. But in the morning, praying early, an hour before sun up, a man came aboard, we in order, written to him from England, to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Sure enough, the matter was one easy to his hand. He had his papers or eat, and glad I was to get rid of the damn thing, for I was beginning myself to feel uneasy at it. If the Dale did have any luggage aboard the ship, I'm thinking it was nane other than that same. What was the name of the man who took it? asked Dr. Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. I'll be telling you quick, he answered, and stepping down to his cabin, produced a receipt signed Emanuel Hildesheim. Bürgenstrasse 16 was the address. We found out that this was all the captain knew, so with thanks we came away. We found Hildesheim in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adelphi theatre type, with a nose like a sheep and a fez. His arguments were pointed with specie, but we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargaining, he told us what he knew. This turned out to be simple but important. He had received a letter from a Mr. Deville of London, telling him to receive, if possible, before sunrise, so as to avoid customs, a box which would arrive at Galatz in the Tsarina Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks who traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for his work by an English banknote, which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Skinsky had come to him, he had taken him to the ship and handed over the box so as to save porterage. That was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but we were unable to find him. One of his neighbors, who did not seem to bear him any affection, said he had gone away two days before no one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house, together with the rent due, in English money. This had been between ten and eleven o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. 
those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror the women crying out this is the work of a slovak we hurried away lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair and so detained as we came home we could arrive at no definite conclusion we were all convinced that the box was on its way by water to somewhere, but where that might be we would have to discover. With heavy hearts we came home to the hotel, to Mina. When we met together the first thing was to consult as to taking Mina again into our confidence. Things are getting desperate, and it is at least a chance, though a hazardous one. As a preliminary step, I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal 30th October, evening. They were so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they had had some rest, so I asked them all to lie down for half an hour whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the traveller's typewriter, and to Mr. Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray doing the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done. Poor dear, dear Jonathan! What he must have suffered, what he must be suffering now! He lies on the sofa, hardly seeming to breathe, and his whole body appears in collapse. His brows are knit, his face is drawn with pain. Poor fellow! Maybe he is thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh, if I could only help at all! I shall do what I can. I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over all carefully, and perhaps I may arrive at some conclusion. I shall try to follow the Professor's example, and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that under God's providence I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready so I shall get our party together and read it. They can judge it. It is well to be accurate, and every minute is precious." Mina Harker's Memorandum, entered in her journal. Ground of inquiry. Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. A. He must be brought back by some one. This is evident. For had he power to move himself as he wished, he could go either as man or wolf or bat in some other way. He evidently fears discovery or interference, in the state of helplessness in which he must be, confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box. b. How is he to be taken? Here a process of exclusions may help us. By road, by rail, by water. 1. By road. There are endless difficulties especially in leaving the city. X. There are people, and people are curious and investigate. A hint, a surmise, a doubt as to what might be in the box, would destroy him. There are, or there may be, customs and octroi offices to pass. Z. His pursuers might follow. This is his highest fear. And in order to prevent his being betrayed, he has repelled, so far as he can, even his victim, me. 2. By rail. There is no one in charge of the box. It would have to take its chance of being delayed, and delay would be fatal with enemies on the track. True, he might escape at night, but what would he be if left in a strange place with no refuge that he could fly to? This is not what he intends, and he does not mean to risk it. 3. By water. Here is the safest way, in one respect, but with most danger in another. On the water he is powerless except at night. Even then he can only summon fog and storm and snow, and his wolves. But were he wrecked, the living water would engulf him, helpless, and he would indeed be lost. He could have the vessel drive to land, but if it were unfriendly land, wherein he was not free to move, his position would still be desperate. We know from the record that he was on the water, so what we have to do is to ascertain what water. The first thing is to realise exactly what he has done as yet. We may then get a light on what his task is to be. Firstly, we must differentiate between what he did in London as part of his general plan of action, when he was pressed for moments and had to arrange as best he could. Secondly, 
we must see, as well as we can surmise it from the facts we know of, what he has done here. As to the first, he evidently intended to arrive at Galatz, and sent invoice to Varna, to deceive us, lest we should ascertain his means of exit from England. His immediate and sole purpose, then, was to escape. The proof of this is the letter of instruction sent to Emanuel Hildsheim, to clear and take away the box before sunrise. There is also the instruction to Petrov Skinsky. These we must only guess at, but there must have been some letter or message, since Skinsky came to Hildsheim. That so far his plans were successful, we know. The Tsarina Catherine made a phenomenally quick journey, so much so that Captain Donelson's suspicions were aroused. But his superstition, united with his canniness, played the Count's game for him, and he ran with his favouring wind through fogs, and all till he brought up blindfold at Galatz. That the Count's arrangements were well made, has been proved. Hildsheim cleared the box, took it off, and gave it to Skinsky. Skinsky took it, and here we lose the trail. We only know that the box is somewhere on the water, moving along. The customs and the octroi, if there be any, have been avoided. Now we come to what the Count must have done after his arrival on land at Galatz. The box was given to Skinsky before sunrise. At sunrise the Count could appear in his own form. Here we ask why Skinsky was chosen at all to aid in the work. In my husband's diary, Skinsky is mentioned as dealing with the Slovaks who trade down the river to the port and the man's remark that the murder was the work of a Slovak, showed the general feeling against his class. The Count wanted isolation. My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water, as the most safe and secret way. He was brought from the castle by Zgani, and probably they delivered their cargo to Slovaks who took the boxes to Varna, for there they were shipped to London. Thus the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange this service. When the box was on land, before sunrise or after sunset, he came out from his box, met Skinsky, and instructed him what to do as to arranging the carriage of the box up some river. When this was done, and he knew that all was in train, he blotted out his traces, as he thought, by murdering his agent. I have examined the map, and find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to have ascended is either the Pruth or the Sereth. I read in the typescript that in my trance I heard cows low and water swirling level with my ears, and the creaking of wood. The Count in his box, then, was on a river in an open boat, propelled probably either by oars or poles, for the banks are near, and it is working against stream. There would be no such if floating downstream. Of course, it may not be either the Sereth or the Pruth, but we may possibly investigate further. Now of these two the Pruth is the more easily navigated, but the Sereth is, at Fundu, joined by the Bistritza, which runs up round the Borgo Pass. The loop it makes is manifestly as close to Dracula's castle as can be got by water. Mina Harker's Journal Continued When I had done reading, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, "'Our dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher. Her eyes have been where we were blinded. Now we are on the track once again, and this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless. And if we can come on him by day, on the water, our task will be over. He has a start, but he is powerless to hasten, as he may not leave this box, lest those who carry him may suspect. For them to suspect would be to prompt them to throw him in the stream where he perish. This he knows, and will not. Now, men, to our council of war, for here and now we must plan what each and all shall do." "'I shall get a steam-launch and follow him,' said Lord Godalming. "'And I, horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land,' said Mr. Morris. "'Good,' said the Professor. "'Both good. But neither must go alone. There must be force to overcome force, if need be. The Slovak is strong and rough, and he carries rude arms." All the men smiled, for amongst them they carried a small arsenal. Said Mr. Morris, "'I have brought some Winchesters. They are pretty handy in a crowd, and there may be wolves. The Count, if you remember, took some other precautions. He made some requisitions on others that Mrs. Harker could not quite hear or understand. We must be ready at all points." Dr. Seward said, 
I think I had better go with Quincy. We have been accustomed to hunt together, and we two, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. You must not be alone, Art. It may be necessary to fight the Slovaks, and a chance thrust, for I don't suppose those fellows carry guns, would undo all our plans. There must be no chances this time. We shall not rest until the Count's head and body have been separated, and we are sure that he cannot reincarnate." He looked at Jonathan as he spoke, and Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor dear was torn about in his mind. Of course he wanted to be with me. But then the boat service would most likely be the one which would destroy the—the the vampire. Why did I hesitate to write the word? He was silent a while, and during his silence Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friend Jonathan, this is to you for twice reasons. First, because you are young and brave and can fight, and all energies may be needed at the last. And again, that it is your right to destroy him, that which has wrought such woe to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madame Mina. She will be my care, if I may. I am old, my legs are not so quick to run as once, and I am not used to ride so long or to pursue as need be, or to fight with lethal weapons. But I can be of other service. I can fight another way. And I can die if need be as well as younger men. Now let me say that what I would is this. While you, my Lord Godalming, and friend Jonathan, go in your so swift little steamboat up the river, and whilst John and Quincy guard the bank where perchance he might be landed, I will take Madame Mina right into the heart of the enemy's country. Whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream whence he cannot escape to land, where he dares not raise the lid of his coffin-box, lest his slow-back carriers should in fear leave him to perish, we shall go in the track where Jonathan went, for Mistritz over the Borgo, and find our way to the castle of Dracula. Here Madame Mina's hypnotic power will surely help, and we shall find our way, all dark and unknown otherwise, after the first sunrise when we are near that fateful place. There is much to be done, and other places to be made sanctify, so that the nest of vipers be obliterated." Here Jonathan interrupted him hotly. "'Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case, and tainted as she is with that devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death-trap? Not for the world, not for heaven or hell!' He became almost speechless for a minute, and then went on. "'Do you know what the place is? Have you seen that awful den of hellish infamy, with the very moonlight alive with grisly shapes and every speck of dust that whirls in the wind a devouring monster and embryo? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat?" Here he turned to me, and as his eyes lit on my forehead, he threw up his arms with a cry, "'Oh, my God! What have we done to have this terror upon us?' And he sank down on the sofa in a collapse of misery. The professor's voice, as he spoke in clear sweet tones, which seemed to vibrate in the air, calmed us all. Oh, my friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina from that awful place that I would go. God forbid that I should take her into that place. There is work, wild work, to be done before that place can be purified. Remember that we are in terrible straits. If the Count escape us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to sleep him for a century and then in time our dear one he took my hand would come to him to keep him company and would be as those others that you jonathan saw you have told us of their gloating lips you heard their ribald laugh as they clutched the moving bag that the count threw to them you shudder and well may it be forgive me that i make you so much pain but it is necessary my friend is it not a dire need for that which i am giving possibly my life if it were that any one went into that place to stay, it is I who would have to go to keep them company." "'Do as you will,' said Jonathan, with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God." Later. Oh, it did me good to see the way that these brave men worked. How can women help loving men when they are so earnest, and so true, and so brave? And too it made me think of the wonderful power of money. What can it not do when basely used? I felt so thankful that Lord Godalming is rich, and both he and Mr. Morris, who also has plenty of money, are willing to spend it so freely. For if they did not, our expedition could not start, either so promptly or so well equipped, as it will within another hour. It is not three hours since it was arranged what part each of us was to do. And now Lord Godalming and Jonathan have a lovely steam-launch, with steam up ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris have half a dozen good horses well appointed, 
We have all the maps and appliances of various kinds that can be had. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave by the 11.40 train to-night for Veresti, where we are to get a carriage to drive to the Borgo Pass. We are bringing a good deal of ready money, as we are to buy a carriage and horses. We shall drive ourselves, for we have no one whom we can trust in the matter. The Professor knows something of a great many languages, so we shall get on all right. We have all got arms, even for me a large bore revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest. Alas! I cannot carry one arm that the rest do. The scar on my forehead forbids that. Dear Dr. Van Helsing comforts me by telling me that I am fully armed as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour, and there are snow flurries which come and go as warnings. Later. It took all my courage to say good-bye to my darling. We may never meet again. Courage, Mina. The Professor is looking at you keenly. His look is a warning. There must be no tears now, unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness. Jonathan Harker's Journal 30. October. Night. I am writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Lord Godalming is firing up. He is an experienced hand at the work, as he has had for years a launch of his own on the Thames, and another on the Norfolk Broads. Regarding our plans, we finally decided that Mina's guess was correct, and that if any waterway was chosen for the Count's escape back to his castle, the Serith and then the Bistritza at its junction would be the one. We took it that somewhere about the forty-seventh degree, north latitude, would be the place chosen for crossing the country between the river and the Carpathians. We have no fear in running at good speed up the river at night. There is plenty of water, and the banks are wide enough apart to make steaming, even in the dark, easy enough. Lord Godalming tells me to sleep for a while, as it is enough for the present for one to be on watch. But I cannot sleep. How can I with the terrible danger hanging over my darling, and her going out into that awful place? My only comfort is that we are in the hands of God. Only for that faith it would be easier to die than to live, and so be quit of all the trouble. Dr. Morris and Dr. Seward were off on their long ride before we started. They are to keep up the right bank far enough to get on higher lands where they can see a good stretch of river, and avoid the following of its curves. They have, for the first stages, two men to ride and lead their spare horses, four in all, so as not to excite curiosity. When they dismiss the men, which shall be shortly, they shall themselves look after the horses. It may be necessary for us to join forces. If so, they can mount our whole party. One of the saddles has a removable horn, and can be easily adapted for Mina, if required. It is a wild adventure we are on. Here, as we are rushing along through the darkness with the cold from the river, seeming to rise up and strike us, with all the mysterious voices of the night around us, it all comes home. We seem to be drifting into unknown places and unknown ways into a whole world of dark and dreadful things. Godalming is shutting the furnace door. 31. October. Still hurrying along. The day has come and Godalming is sleeping. I am on watch. The morning is bitterly cold. The furnace heat is grateful, though we have heavy fur coats. As yet we have passed only a few open boats but none of them had on board any box or package of anything like the size of the one we seek. The men were scared every time we turned our electric lamp on them, and fell on their knees and prayed. 1. November. Evening. No news all day. We have found nothing of the kind we seek. We have now passed into the Bistritza, and if we are wrong in our surmise our chance is gone. We have overhauled every boat, big and little. Early this morning, one crew took us for a government boat, and treated us accordingly. We saw in this a way of smoothing matters, so at Fundu, where the Bistritza runs into the Sereth, 
we got a Romanian flag which we now fly conspicuously. With every boat we have overhauled since then this trick has succeeded. We have had every deference shown to us, and not once any objection to whatever we chose to ask or do. Some of the Slovaks tell us that a big boat passed them, going at more than usual speed as she had a double crew on board. This was before they came to Fundu, so they could not tell us whether the boat had turned into the Bistritza or continued on up the Sarath. At Fundu we could not hear of any such boat, so she must have passed there in the night. I am feeling very sleepy. The cold is perhaps beginning to tell on me, and nature must have rest some time. Godalming insists that he shall keep the first watch. God bless him for all his goodness to poor dear Mina and me. 2 November, morning. It is broad daylight. That good fellow would not wake me. He says it would have been a sin to, for I slept peacefully and was forgetting my trouble. It seems brutally selfish to me to have slept so long and let him watch all night, but he was quite right. I am a new man this morning, and as I sit here and watch him sleeping, I can do all that is necessary both as to minding the engine, steering, and keeping watch. I can feel that my strength and energy are coming back to me. I wonder where Mina is now, and Van Helsing. They should have got to Veresti about noon on Wednesday. It would take them some time to get the carriage and horses. So if they had started and travelled hard, they would be about now at the Borgo Pass. God guide and help them. I am afraid to think what may happen. If we could only go faster— but we cannot. The engines are throbbing and doing their utmost. I wonder how Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris are getting on. There seem to be endless streams running down the mountains into this river, but as none of them are very large at present, at all events, though they are doubtless terrible in winter, and when the snow melts, the horsemen may not have met much obstruction. I hope that before we get to Strasbourg we may see them. For if by that time we have not overtaken the Count, it may be necessary to take counsel together what to do next. Dr. Seward's Diary 2 November Three days on the road. No news and no time to write it, if there had been, for every moment is precious. We have had only the rest needful for the horses, but we are both bearing it wonderfully. Those adventurous days of ours are turning up useful. We must push on. We shall never feel happy till we get the launch in sight again. 3. November We heard at Fundu that the launch had gone up the Bistritza. I wish it wasn't so cold. There are signs of snow coming. And if it falls heavy, it will stop us. In such case we must get a sledge, and go on Russian fashion. 4. November Today we heard of the launch having been detained by an accident when trying to force a way up the rapids. The Slovak boats get up all right, by aid of a rope and steering with knowledge. Some went up only a few hours before. Godalmin is an amateur fitter himself and evidently it was he who put the launch in trim again. Finally, they got up the rapids all right, with local help, and are off on the chase afresh. I fear that the boat is not any better for the accident. The peasantry tells us that after she got upon smooth water again, she kept stopping every now and again, so long as she was in sight. We must push on harder, than ever. Our help may be wanted soon. Mina Harker's Journal 31st October. Arrived at Veresti at noon. The professor tells me that this morning at dawn he could hardly hypnotize me at all, and that all I could say was, dark and quiet. He is off now buying a carriage and horses. He says that he will later on try to buy additional horses, so that we may be able to change them on the way. 
We have something more than seventy miles before us. The country is lovely and most interesting. If only we were under different conditions, how delightful it would be to see it all! If Jonathan and I were driving through it alone, what a pleasure it would be! To stop and see people, and learn something of their life, and to fill our minds and memories with all the colour and picturesqueness of the whole wild, beautiful country, and the quaint people! But alas! Later. Dr. Van Helsing has returned. He has got the carriage and horses. We are to have some dinner, and to start in an hour. The landlady is putting us up a huge basket of provisions. It seems enough for a company of soldiers. The professor encourages her, and whispers to me that it may be a week before we can get any food again. He has been shopping, too, and has sent home such a wonderful lot of fur coats and wraps, and all sorts of warm things. There will not be any chance of our being cold. We shall soon be off. I am afraid to think what may happen to us. We are truly in the hands of God. He alone knows what may be, and I pray Him, with all the strength of my sad and humble soul, that He will watch over my beloved husband, that whatever may happen, Jonathan may know that I loved him, and honoured him more than I can say, and that my latest and truest thought will be always for him. End of chapter 26 Chapter Twenty Seven of Dracula. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter Twenty Seven. Read by Elizabeth Clett. Robert Smith. M. B. Dennis Sayers. Mina Harker's Journal. First November. All day long we have travelled, and at a good speed. The horses seem to know that they are being kindly treated, for they go willingly their full stage at best speed. We have now had so many changes, and find the same thing so constantly, that we are encouraged to think that the journey will be an easy one. Dr. Van Helsing is laconic. He tells the farmers that he is hurrying to Bistritz, and pays them well to make the exchange of horses. We get hot soup, or coffee, or tea, and off we go. It is a lovely country, full of beauties of all imaginable kinds, and the people are brave and strong and simple, and seem full of nice qualities. They are very, very superstitious. In the first house where we stopped, when the woman who served us saw the scar on my forehead, she crossed herself and put out two fingers towards me, to keep off the evil eye. I believe they went to the trouble of putting an extra amount of garlic into our food, and I can't abide garlic. Ever since then I have taken care not to take off my hat or veil, and so have escaped their suspicions. We are travelling fast, and as we have no driver with us to carry tales, we go ahead of scandal. But I dare say that fear of the evil eye will follow hard behind us all the way. The professor seems tireless. All day he would not take any rest, though he made me sleep for a long spell. At sunset time he hypnotised me, and he says I answered as usual, darkness, lapping water, and creaking wood. So our enemy is still on the river. I am afraid to think of Jonathan, but somehow I have now no fear for him, or for myself. I write this whilst we wait in a farmhouse for the horses to be ready. Dr. Van Helsing is sleeping. Poor dear, he looks very tired and old and grey, but his mouth is set as firmly as a conqueror's. Even in his sleep he is intense with resolution. When we have well started, I must make him rest whilst I drive. I shall tell him that we have days before us, and he must not break down when most of all his strength will be needed. All is ready. We are off shortly. 2nd November, morning. I was successful, and we took turns driving all night. Now the day is on us, bright though cold. There is a strange heaviness in the air. I say heaviness for want of a better word. I mean that it oppresses us both. It is very cold, and only our warm furs keep us comfortable. At dawn, Van Helsing hypnotised me. He says I answered, Darkness, creaking wood, and roaring water. So the river is changing as they ascend. I do hope that my darling will not run any chance of danger more than need be, but we are in God's hands. 2nd November, night. All day long driving. 
The country gets wilder as we go, and the great spurs of the Carpathians, which at Veresti seemed so far from us and so low on the horizon, now seem to gather round us and tower in front. We both seem in good spirits. I think we make an effort each to cheer the other. In the doing so, we cheer ourselves. Dr. Van Helsing says that by morning we shall reach the Borgo Pass. The houses are very few here now, and the professor says that the last horse we got will have to go on with us, as we may not be able to change. He got two in addition to the two we changed, so that now we have a rude four in hand. The dear horses are patient and good, and they give us no trouble. We are not worried with other travellers, and so even I can drive. We shall get to the pass in daylight. We do not want to arrive before. So we take it easy, and have each a long rest in turn. Oh, what will to-morrow bring to us? We go to seek the place where my poor darling suffered so much. God grant that we may be guided aright, and that he will deign to watch over my husband and those dear to us both, and who are in such deadly peril. As for me, I am not worthy in his sight. Alas! I am unclean to his eyes, and shall be until he may deign to let me stand forth in his sight as one of those who have not incurred his wrath. Memorandum by Abraham van Helsing 4. November This to my old and true friend John Seward, M.D., of Perfleet, London. In case I may not see him, it may explain. It is morning, and I write by a fire which all the night I have kept alive, Madam Mina aiding me. It is cold, cold, so cold that the grey heavy sky is full of snow, which when it falls will settle for all winter, as the ground is hardening to receive it. It seemed to have affected Madam Mina. She has been so heavy of head all day that she was not like herself. She sleeps and sleeps and sleeps. She, who is usual so alert, have done literally nothing all the day. She even have lost her appetite. She make no entry into her little diary. She, who writes so faithful at every pause. Something whispered to me that all is not well. However, tonight she is more viv. Her long sleep all day may have refreshed and restored her, for now she is all sweet and bright as ever. At sunset I try to hypnotize her, but alas, with no effect. The power has grown less and less with each day, and tonight it failed me altogether. Well, God's will be done, whatever it may be, and whithersoever it may lead. Now to the historical. For as Madamina write not in her stenography, I must, in my cumbrous old fashion, that so each day of us may not go unrecorded. We got to the Borgo Pass just after sunrise yesterday morning. When I saw the signs of the dawn, I got ready for the hypnotism. We stopped our carriage, and I got down so that there might be no disturbance. I made a couch with furs, and Madame Mina, lying down, yielded herself as usual, but more slow and more short time than ever to the hypnotic sleep. As before came the answer, darkness and the swirling of water. When she woke, bright and radiant, and we go on our way, and soon reach the pass. At this time and place she become all on fire with zeal. Some new guiding power in her manifested, for she point to a road and say, This is the way. How you know it? I ask. Of course I know it, she answer, and with a pause add, Have not my Jonathan travelled it, and wrote of his travel? At first I think somewhat strange, but soon I see that there be only one such by-road. It is used but little, and very different from the coach road from the Bokovina to Bistritz, which is more wide and hard and more of use. So we came down this road. When we meet other ways, not always were we sure that they were roads at all, for they be neglect and light snow have fallen, the horses know, and they only. I give rein to them, and they go on so patient. By and by we find all things which Jonathan have note in that wonderful diary of him. Then we go on for long, long hours and hours. At the first I tell Madame Mina to sleep. She try and she succeed. She sleep all the time till at the last I feel myself too suspicious grow and attempt to wake her. But she sleep on, and I may not wake her though I try. I do not wish to try too hard lest I harm her, for I know that she have suffer much and sleep at times be all in all to her. 
I think I drowse myself, for all of a sudden I feel guilt, as though I have done something. I find myself bolt up, with the reins in my hands, and the good horses go along jog-jog, just as ever. I look down and find Madame Mina still asleep. It is now not far off sunset time, and over the snow the light of the sun flow in big yellow flood, so that we throw great long shadow on where the mountain rise so steep. For we are going up and up, and all is all so wild and rocky, as though it were the end of the world. Then I rouse Madame Mina. This time she wake with not much trouble, and then I try to put her to hypnotic sleep. But she sleep not, being as though I were not. Still I try and try, till all at once I find her and myself in dark. So I look around and find that the sun have gone down. Madame Mina laugh, and I turn and look at her. She is now quite awake, and looks so well as I never saw her since that night at Carfax, when she first entered the Count's house. I am amazed and not at ease then, but she is so bright and tender and thoughtful for me that I forget all fear. I light a fire, for we have brought supply of wood with us, and she prepare food while I undo the horses and set them tethered in shelter to feed. Then when I return to the fire, she have my supper ready. I go to help her, but she smile and tell me she have eat already, that she was so hungry that she would not wait. I like it not. I have grave doubts. But I fear to affright her, so I am silent of it. She help me, and I eat alone, and then we wrap in fur and lie beside the fire, and I tell her to sleep while I watch. But presently I forget all of watching, and when I suddenly remember that I watch, I find her lying quiet but awake and looking at me with so bright eyes. Once, twice more the same occur, and I get much sleep till before morning. When I wake, I try to hypnotize her, but alas! Though she shut her eyes obedient, she may not sleep. The sun rise up and up and up, and then sleep come to her too late, but so heavy that she will not wake. I have to lift her up and place her sleeping in the carriage when I have harnessed the horses and made all ready. Madam, still sleep, and she look in her sleep more healthy and more redder than before, and I like it not. I am afraid, afraid, afraid. I am afraid of all things, even to think, but I must go on my way. The stake we play for is life and death, or more than these, and we must not flinch. 5 November Morning Let me be accurate in everything, for though you and I have seen some strange things together, you may at first think that I, Van Helsing, am mad, that the many horrors and the so long strain on nerves has at last turned my brain. All yesterday we travel, always getting closer to the mountains, and moving into a more and more wild and desert land. There are great frowning precipices, and much falling water, and nature seemed to have held some time her carnival. Madame Mina still sleep and sleep, and though I did have hunger and appeased it, I could not waken her, even for food. I began to fear that the fatal spell of the place was upon her, tainted as she is with that vampire baptism. Well, I said to myself, if it be that she sleep all the day, it shall also be that I do not sleep at night. As we travel on the rough road, for a road of an ancient and imperfect kind there was, I held down my head and slept. Again I waked with a sense of guilt and of time past, and found Madame Mina still sleeping, the sun low down, but all was indeed changed. The frowning mountains seemed further away, and we were near the top of a steep rising hill, on summit of which was such a castle as Jonathan tell of in his diary. At once I exult and fear, for now, for good or ill, the end was near. I woke Madame Mina and tried again to hypnotize her, but alas, unavailing till too late. Then ere the great dark came upon us, for even after down sun, the heavens reflected the gone sun on the snow, and all was for a time a great twilight. I took out the horses and fed them in what shelter I could. Then I make a fire, and near it I make Madame Mina, now awake and more charming than ever, sit comfortable amid her rugs. I got ready food, but she would not eat, simply saying that she had not hunger. I did not press her, knowing her unavailingness. But I myself eat, for I must needs now be strong for all. Then, with the fear on me of what might be, I drew a ring so big for her comfort around where Madame Mina sat, and over the ring I passed some of the wafer, 
and I broke it fine so that all was well guarded. She sat still all the time, so still as one dead, and she grew whiter and even whiter till the snow was not more pale. In no word she said, but when I drew near she clung to me, and I could know that the poor soul shook her from head to feet with a tremor that was pain to feel. I said to her presently, when she had grown more quiet, Will you not come over to the fire? For I wished to make test of what she could. She rose obedient, but when she had made a step she stopped, and stood as one stricken. Why not go on? I asked. She shook her head, and coming back, sat down in her place. Then, looking at me with open eyes, as of one waked from sleep, she said simply, I cannot. It remained silent. I rejoiced, for I knew that what she could not, none of those that we dreaded could. Though there might be danger to her body, yet her soul was safe. Presently the horses began to scream, and tore at their tethers, till I came to them and quieted them. When they did feel my hands on them, they whinnied low as in joy, and licked at my hands, and were quiet for a time. Many times, though, through the night did I come to them, till it arrived to the cold hour when all nature is at its lowest, and every time my coming was with quiet of them, and in the cold hour the fire began to die, and I was about stepping forth to replenish it, for now the snow came in flying sweeps, and with it a chill mist. Even in the dark there was a light of some kind, as there ever is over snow, and it seemed as though the snow flurries and the wreaths of mist took shape as of women with trailing garments. All was in dead, grim silence, only that the horses whinnied and cowered, as if in terror of the worst. I began to fear horrible fears, but then came to me the sense of safety in that ring wherein I stood. I began, too, to think that my imaginings were of the night and the gloom and the unrest that I have gone through, and all the terrible anxiety. It was as though my memories of all Jonathan's horrid experience were befooling me. For the snowflakes in the mist began to wheel and circle round, till I could get as though a shadowy glimpse of those women that would have kissed him. And then the horses cowered lower and lower, and moaned in terror as men do in pain. Even the madness of fright was not to them, so that they could break away. I fear for my dear Madam Mina, when these weird figures drew near and circled around. I looked at her, but she sat calm and smiled at me. When I would have stepped to the fire to replenish it, she caught me and held me back, and whispered, like a voice that one hears in a dream, so low it was, No, no, do not go without. Here you are safe. I turned to her, and looking into her eyes, said, But you, it is for you that I fear. Whereat she laughed, a laugh low and unreal, and said, Fear for me? Why fear for me? None safer in all the world from them than I am. And as I wonder at the meaning of her words, a puff of wind make the flame leap up, and I see the red scar on her forehead. Then, alas, I knew. Did I not, I would soon have learned, for the wheeling figures of mist and snow came closer, but keeping ever without the holy circle. Then they began to materialize till, if God have not taken away my reason, for I saw it through my eyes, there were before me in actual flesh the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room when they would have kissed his throat. I knew the swaying round forms, the bright hard eyes, the white teeth, the ruddy color, the voluptuous lips. They smiled ever at poor Madame Mina, and as their laugh came through the silence of the night, they twined their arms and pointed to her, and said in those so sweet tingling tones, that Jonathan said were of the intolerable sweetness of the water-glasses. Come, sister, come to us, come. In fear I turned to my poor Madame Mina, and my heart with gladness leapt like flame. For, oh, the terror in her sweet eyes, the repulsion, the horror, told a story to my heart that was all of hope. God be thanked, she was not yet of them. I seized some of the firewood which was by me, and holding out some of the wafer, advanced on them towards the fire. They drew back before me, and laughed their low, horrid laugh. I fed the fire, and feared them not, for I knew that we were safe within the ring, which she could not leave no more than they could enter. The horses had ceased to moan, and lay still on the ground, 
the snow fell on them softly, and they grew whiter. I knew that there was for the poor beasts no more of terror. And so we remained till the red of the dawn began to fall through the snow gloom. I was desolate and afraid, and full of woe and terror, but when that beautiful sun began to climb the horizon, life was to me again. At the first coming of the dawn, the horrid figures melted in the whirling mist and snow. The wreaths of transparent gloom moved away towards the castle and were lost. Instinctively, with the dawn coming, I turned to Madame Mina, intending to hypnotize her, but she lay in a deep and sudden sleep, from which I could not wake her. I tried to hypnotize her through her sleep, but she made no response, none at all, and the day broke. I fear yet to stir. I have made my fire and have seen the horses. They are all dead. Today I have much to do here, and I keep waiting till the sun is up high, for there may be places where I must go, where that sunlight, though snow and mist obscure it, will be to me a safety. I will strengthen me with breakfast, and then I will do my terrible work. Madame Mina still sleeps, and God be thanked. She is calm in her sleep. Jonathan Harker's Journal 4. November. Evening. The accident to the launch has been a terrible thing for us. Only for it we should have overtaken the boat long ago, and by now my dear Mina would have been free. I fear to think of her, off on the worlds near that horrid place. We have got horses, and we follow on the track. I note this whilst Godalming is getting ready. We have our arms. The Sagani must look out if they mean to fight. Oh, if only Morris and Seward were with us. We must only hope. If I write no more, good-bye, Mina. God bless and keep you. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5 November. With the dawn we saw the body of Shkani before us, dashing away from the river with their liter wagon. They surrounded it in a cluster, and hurried along as though beset. The snow is falling lightly, and there is a strange excitement in the air. It may be our own feelings, but the depression is strange. Far off I hear the howling of wolves. The snow brings them down from the mountains, and there are dangers to all of us, and from all sides. The horses are nearly ready, and we are soon off. We ride to death of someone. God alone knows who, or where, or what, or when, or how it may be. Dr. Van Helsing's Memorandum 5. November Afternoon I am at least sane. Thank God for that mercy at all events, though the proving has been dreadful. When I left Madame Mina sleeping within the holy circle, I took my way to the castle. The blacksmith hammer which I took in the carriage from Beersity was useful. Though the doors were all open, I broke them off the rusty hinges, lest some ill intent or ill chance should close them, so that, being entered, I might not get out. Jonathan's bitter experience served me here. By memory of his diary, I found my way to the old chapel, for I knew that here my work lay. The air was oppressive. It seemed as if there were some sulphurous fume, which at times made me dizzy. Either there was a roaring in my ears, or I heard afar off the howl of wolves. Then I bethought me of my dear Madame Mina, and I was in terrible plight. The dilemma had me between his horns. Her I had not dared to take into this place, but left safe from the vampire in that holy circle. And yet even there would be the wolf. I resolved me that my work lay here, and that as to the wolves we must submit, if it were God's will. At any rate it was only death and freedom beyond, so I did choose for her. Had it been but for myself the choice had been easy. The maw of the wolf were better to rest in than the grave of the vampire. So I make my choice and go on with my work. I knew that there were at least three graves to find, graves that are in habit. So I search and search, and I find one of them. She lay in her vampire sleep, so full of life and voluptuous beauty, that I shudder as though I have come to do murder. Ah, I doubt not that in old time, when such things were, 
Many a man who set forth to do such a task as mine found at the last his heart fail him, and then his nerve. So he delay and delay and delay till the mere beauty and the fascination of the wanton undead have hypnotized him, and he remain on and on till sunset come and the vampire sleep be over. Then the beautiful eyes of the fair woman open and look love and the voluptuous mouth present to a kiss and the man is weak and there remain one more victim in the vampire fold one more to swell the grim and grisly ranks of the undead there is some fascination surely when i am moved by the mere presence of such an one even lying as she lay in a tomb fetid with age and heavy with dust of centuries though there be that horrid odour such as the layers of the count have had yes i was moved i ben helsing with all my purpose and with my motive for hate i was moved to a yearning for delay which seemed to paralyze my faculties and to clog my very soul it may have been that the need of natural sleep and the strange oppression of the air were beginning to overcome me certain it was that i was lapsing into sleep the open-eyed sleep of one who yields to a sweet fascination when there came through the snow-stilled air a long low wail so full of woe and pity that it woke me like the sound of a clarion for it was the voice of my dear madam mina that i heard then i braced myself again to my horrid task and found by wrenching away tomb tops one other of the sisters the other dark one i dared not pause to look on her as i had on her sister lest once more i should begin to be in thrall but i go on searching until presently i find in a high great tomb as if made to one much beloved that other fair sister which like jonathan i had seen to gather herself out of the atoms of the mist she was so fair to look on so radiantly beautiful so exquisitely voluptuous that the very instinct of man in me which calls some of my sex to love and to protect one of hers made my head whirl with new emotion but god be thanked that sole wail of my dear madam mina had not died out of my ears and before the spell could be wrought further upon me i had nerved myself to my wild work by this time i had searched all the tombs in the chapel so far as i could tell and as there had been only three of these undead phantoms around us in the night i took it that there were no more of active undead existent there was one great tomb more lordly than the rest huge it was and nobly proportioned on it was but one word dracula this then was the undead home of the king vampire to whom so many more were due its emptiness spoke eloquent to make certain what i knew before i began to restore these women to their dead selves through my awful work i laid in dracula's tomb some of the wafer and so banished him from it undead for ever then began my terrible task and i dreaded it had it been but one it had been easy comparative but three to begin twice more after i had been through a deed of horror for it was terrible with the sweet miss lucy what would it not be with these strange ones who had survived through centuries and who had been strengthened by the passing of the years who would if they could have fought for their foul lives oh my friend john but it was butcher work had i not been nerved by my thoughts of other dead and of the living over whom hung such a pall of fear i could not have gone on i tremble and tremble even yet though till all was over god be thanked my nerve did stand had i not seen the repose in the first place and the gladness that stole over it just ere the final disillusion came as realization that the soul had been won i could not have gone further with my butchery i could not have endured the horrid screeching as the stake drove home the plunging of writhing form the lips of bloody foam i should have fled in terror and left my work undone but it is over and the poor souls i can pity them now and weep as i think of them placid each in their full sleep of death for a short moment ere fading for friend john hardly had my knife severed the head of each before the whole body 
began to melt away and crumble into its native dust, as though the death that should have come centuries ago had at last asserted himself, and say at once and loud, I am here. Before I left the castle, I so fixed its entrances that never more can the Count enter there undead. When I stepped into the circle where Madame Mina slept, she woke from her sleep, and seeing me, cried out in pain that I had endured too much. Come, she said, come away from this awful place. Let us go to meet my husband, who is, I know, coming towards us. She was looking thin and pale and weak, but her eyes were pure and glowed with fervor. I was glad to see her paleness and her illness, for my mind was full of the fresh horror of that ruddy vampire sleep. And so, with trust and hope, and yet full of fear, we go eastward to meet our friends and him, whom Madame Mina tell me that she know are coming to meet us. Mina Harker's Journal 6th November It was late in the afternoon when the Professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. We did not go fast, though the way was steeply downhill, for we had to take heavy rugs and wraps with us. We dared not face the possibility of being left without warmth in the cold and the snow. We had to take some of our provisions, too, for we were in a perfect desolation, and so far as we could see through the snowfall, there was not even the sign of habitation. When we had gone about a mile, I was tired with the heavy walking, and sat down to rest. Then we looked back, and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky for we were so deep under the hill whereon it was set, that the angle of perspective of the Carpathian mountains was far below it. We saw it in all its grandeur, perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice, and with seemingly a great gap between it and the steep of the adjacent mountain on any side. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. We could hear the distant howling of wolves. They were far off, but the sound, even though coming muffled through the deadening snowfall, was full of terror. I knew from the way Dr. Van Helsing was searching about, that he was trying to seek some strategic point, where we would be less exposed in case of attack. The rough roadway still led downwards. We could trace it through the drifted snow. In a little while the Professor signalled to me, so I got up and joined him. He had found a wonderful spot, a sort of natural hollow in a rock, with an entrance like a doorway between two boulders. He took me by the hand and drew me in. See, he said, here you will be in shelter, and if the wolves do come, I can meet them one by one. He brought in our furs, and made a snug nest for me, and got out some provisions and forced them upon me. But I could not eat. To even try to do so was repulsive to me, and much as I would have liked to please him, I could not bring myself to the attempt. He looked very sad, but did not reproach me. Taking his field-glasses from the case, he stood on the top of the rock, and began to search the horizon. Suddenly he called out, "'Look! Madame Mina, look! Look!' I sprang up and stood beside him on the rock. He handed me his glasses and pointed. The snow was now falling more heavily, and swirled about fiercely, for a high wind was beginning to blow. However, there were times when there were pauses between the snow-flurries, and I could see a long way round. From the height where we were it was possible to see a great distance and far off, beyond the white waste of snow, I could see the river lying like a black ribbon in kinks and curls as it wound its way. Straight in front of us, and not far off, in fact so near that I wondered we had not noticed before, came a group of mounted men hurrying along. In the midst of them was a cart, a long lighter wagon which swept from side to side, like a dog's tail wagging, with each stern inequality of the road. Outlined against the snow as they were, I could see from the men's clothes that they were peasants or gypsies of some kind. On the cart was a great square chest. My heart leapt as I saw it, for I could feel that the end was coming. The evening was now drawing close, and well I knew that at sunset the thing, which was till then imprisoned there, would take new freedom, and could in any of the many forms elude pursuit. In fear I turned to the Professor. To my consternation, however, he was not there. An instant later I saw him below me. Round the rock he had drawn a circle, such as we had found shelter in last night. When he had completed it, he stood beside me again, saying, "'At least here you shall be safe from him.' He took the glasses from me, and at the next lull of the snow, swept the whole space below us. "'See,' he said, "'they come quickly. They are flogging the horses, and galloping as hard as they can.' He paused, 
and went on in a hollow voice. "'They are racing for the sunset. We may be too late. God's will be done.' Down came another blinding rush of driving snow, and the whole landscape was blotted out. It soon passed, however, and once more his glasses were fixed on the plain. Then came a sudden cry. "'Look! Look! Look! See! Two horsemen follow fast, coming up from the south. It must be Quincy and John. Take the glass. Look before the snow blots it all out.' I took it and looked. The two men might be Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris. I knew at all events that neither of them was Jonathan. At the same time I knew that Jonathan was not far off. Looking around, I saw on the north side of the coming party two other men, riding at breakneck speed. One of them I knew was Jonathan, and the other I took, of course, to be Lord Godalming. They, too, were pursuing the party with the cart. When I told the professor, he shouted in glee like a schoolboy, and after looking intently till the snowfall made sight impossible, he laid his Winchester rifle ready for use against the boulder at the opening of our shelter. "'They are all converging,' he said. "'When the time comes, we shall have gypsies on all sides.' I got out my revolver ready to hand, for whilst we were speaking, the howling of wolves came louder and closer. When the snow-storm abated a moment, we looked again. It was strange to see the snow falling in such heavy flakes close to us, and beyond, the sun shining more and more brightly as it sank down towards the far mountain-tops. Sweeping the glass all around us, I could see here and there dots moving singly, and in twos and threes in larger numbers. The wolves were gathering for their prey. Every instant seemed an age whilst we waited. The wind came now in fierce bursts, and the snow was driven with fury as it swept upon us in circling eddies. At times we could not see an arm's length before us, but at others, as the hollow-sounding wind swept by us, it seemed to clear the air-space around us, so that we could see afar off. We had of late been so accustomed to watch for sunrise and sunset, that we knew with fair accuracy when it would be, and we knew that before long the sun would set. It was hard to believe that by our watches it was less than an hour that we waited in that rocky shelter, before the various bodies began to converge close upon us. The wind came now with fiercer and more bitter sweeps, and more steadily from the north. It seemingly had driven the snow-clouds from us, for with only occasional bursts the snow fell. We could distinguish clearly the individuals of each party, the pursued and the pursuers. Strangely enough, those pursued did not seem to realise, or at least to care, that they were pursued. They seemed, however, to hasten with redoubled speed as the sun dropped lower and lower on the mountain-tops. Closer and closer they drew. The professor and I crouched down behind our rock, and held our weapons ready. I could see that he was determined that they should not pass. One and all were quite unaware of our presence. All at once, two voices shouted out to HALT! One was my Jonathan's, raised in a high key of passion. The other, Mr. Morris's strong, resolute tone of quiet command. The gypsies may not have known the language, but there was no mistaking the tone, in whatever tongue the words were spoken. Instinctively they reined in, and at the instant Lord Godalming and Jonathan dashed up at one side, and Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris on the other. The leader of the gypsies, a splendid-looking fellow who sat his horse like a centaur, waved them back, and in a fierce voice gave to his companion some word to proceed. They lashed the horses which sprang forward. But the four men raised their Winchester rifles, and in an unmistakable way commanded them to stop. At the same moment, Dr. Van Helsing and I rose behind the rock, and pointed our weapons at them. Seeing that they were surrounded, the men tightened their reins, and drew up. The leader turned to them, and gave a word at which every man of the gypsy party drew what weapon he carried, knife or pistol, and held himself in readiness to attack. Issue was joined in an instant. The leader, with a quick movement of his rein, threw his horse out in front, and pointed first to the sun, now close down on the hilltops, and then to the castle, said something which I did not understand. For answer, all four men of our party threw themselves from their horses, and dashed towards the cart. I should have felt terrible fear at seeing Jonathan in such danger, but that the ardour of battle must have been upon me as well as upon the rest of them. I felt no fear, but only a wild, surging desire to do something. Seeing the quick movement of our parties, the leader of the gypsies gave a command. His men instantly formed round the cart in a sort of undisciplined endeavour, each one shouldering and pushing the other in his eagerness to carry out the order. In the midst of this I could see that Jonathan on one side of the ring of men, and Quincy on the other, were forcing away to the cart. It was evident that they were bent on finishing their task before the sun should set. Nothing seemed to stop, or even to hinder them. 
Neither the levelled weapons, nor the flashing knives of the gipsies in front, nor the howling of the wolves behind, appeared to even attract their attention. Jonathan's impetuosity, and the manifest singleness of his purpose, seemed to overawe those in front of him. Instinctively they cowered aside and let him pass. In an instant he had jumped upon the cart, and with a strength which seemed incredible, raised the great box, and flung it over the wheel to the ground. In the meantime, Mr. Morris had had to use force to pass through his side of the ring of Zagney. All the time I had been breathlessly watching Jonathan, I had, with the tail of my eye, seen him pressing desperately forward, and had seen the knives of the gipsies flash as he won away through them, and they cut at him. He had parried with his great bowie knife, and at first I thought that he too had come through in safety. But as he sprang beside Jonathan, who had by now jumped from the cart, I could see that with his left hand he was clutching at his side, and that the blood was spurting through his fingers. He did not delay, notwithstanding this, for as Jonathan, with desperate energy, attacked one end of the chest, attempting to prise off the lid with his great cookery knife, he attacked the other frantically with his bowie. Under the efforts of both men the lid began to yield, the nails drew with a screeching sound, and the top of the box was thrown back. By this time the gipsies, seeing themselves covered by the Winchesters, and at the mercy of Lord Godalming and Dr. Seward, had given in and made no further resistance. The sun was almost down on the mountain-tops, and the shadows of the whole group fell upon the snow. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth, some of which the rude falling from the cart had scattered over him. He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image, and the red eyes glared with the horrible vindictive look which I knew so well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it shear through the throat, whilst at the same moment Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle, but before our very eyes, and almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust, and passed from our sight. I shall be glad, as long as I live, that even in that moment of final dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace, such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. The castle of Dracula now stood out against the red sky, and every stone of its broken battlements was articulated against the light of the setting sun. The gipsies, taking us as in some way the cause of the extraordinary disappearance of the dead man, turned without a word, and rode away as if for their lives. Those who were unmounted jumped upon the lighter wagon, and shouted to the horsemen not to desert them. The wolves, which had withdrawn to a safe distance, followed in their wake, leaving us alone. Mr. Morris, who had sunk to the ground, leaned on his elbow, holding his hand pressed to his side. The blood still gushed through his fingers. I flew to him, for the holy circle did not now keep me back, so did the two doctors. Jonathan knelt behind him, and the wounded man laid back his head on his shoulder. With a sigh he took, with a feeble effort, my hand in that of his own, which was unstained. He must have seen the anguish of my heart in his face, for he smiled at me and said, "'I am only too happy to have been of service.' "'Oh, God!' he cried suddenly, struggling to a sitting posture and pointing to me. "'It was worth for this to die. Look! Look!' The sun was now right down upon the mountain-top, and the red gleams fell upon my face, so that it was bathed in rosy light. With one impulse the men sank on their knees, and a deep and earnest, Amen, broke from all as their eyes followed the pointing of his finger. The dying man spoke. Now God be thanked that all has not been in vain. See! The snow is not more stainless in her forehead. The curse has passed away. And, to our bitter grief, with a smile and in silence, he died, a gallant gentleman. Note. Seven years ago we all went through the flames, and the happiness of some of us since then is, we think, well worth the pain we endured. It is an added joy to Mina and to me that our boy's birthday is the same day as that on which Quincy Morris died. His mother holds, I know, the secret belief that some of our brave friend's spirit has passed into him. His bundle of names links all our little band of men together, but we call him Quincy. In the summer of this year we made a journey to Transylvania, and went over the old ground which was, and is, to us, so full of vivid and terrible memories. 
it was almost impossible to believe that the things which we had seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears were living truths each trace of all that had been was blotted out the castle stood as before reared high above a waste of desolation when we got home we were talking of the old time which we could all look back on without despair for godalming and seward are both happily married i took the papers from the safe where they had been ever since our return so long ago we were struck with the fact that in all the mass of material of which the record is composed there is hardly one authentic document nothing but a mass of typewriting except the later notebooks of mina and seward and myself and van helsing's memorandum we could hardly ask any one even did we wish to to accept these as proofs of so wild a story van helsing summed it all up as he said with our boy on his knee we want no proofs we ask none to believe us this boy will some day know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is already he knows her sweetness and loving care later on he will understand how some men so loved her that they did dare much for her sake jonathan harker end of chapter 27 end of dracula by bram stoker